landscapes that surround them. Starting with a community vote to purchase land at the base of the Flatirons in 1898, to instituting the United States' first municipal tax for open space acquisitions in 1967. The city of Boulder has a long legacy of community-driven stewardship and innovation. Today, the City of Boulder's Open Space and Mountain Parks Department, our city partners, and generous volunteers from our community work to preserve and continue our shared legacy of open space conservation. While you're out on the trail and enjoying the incredible vistas, you may not see the hard work our community and open space and mountain parks do to manage, conserve, and improve Boulder's open space for our community and for future generations. Here are some of the highlights of what Open Space and Mountain Parks employees, volunteers, and our community accomplished in 2015. We completed a new 1.9 mile trail that provides our visitors access to Joda Ranch, which is a beautiful stretch of open space north of Boulder. We also made significant progress in developing the North Trail Study Area Plan. This plan will help improve visitor experiences on open space north of Boulder while also conserving the land's natural, agricultural, and cultural resources. In 2015, Open Space and Mountain Parks prioritized the rebuilding of infrastructure that was damaged during the devastating 2013 floods. We rebuilt and improved the heavily damaged Sanitas Valley Trail. We built a new bridge over South Boulder Creek. We finished the rebuilding of the Gregory Canyon Access Road and its damaged trailhead. We repaired and rerouted many flood damaged trails. With the help of volunteers and our community, we've completed more than 100 flood recovery projects. One of those was planned and led by a local teenager and won a prestigious award from the Environmental Protection Agency. While we have made significant headway in our flood recovery efforts, we have more work to do. Open Space and Mountain Parks is planning to design and complete more than a dozen projects in 2016. That flood recovery work will help make our open space infrastructure more resilient and sustainable for the future. Every year, Open Space and Mountain Parks is inspired by the amazing generosity of our community, and 2015 was no different. Volunteers gave back to their land by providing more than 20,000 hours of service these projects maintain the city's trail system and help improve visitor experiences. They also help improve agricultural areas and safeguard sensitive wildlife and plant habitats. In addition to creating volunteer opportunities, Open Space and Mountain Parks outreach and education staff, along with numerous volunteers, helped visitors connect with our community's open space. In 2015, they provided more than 630 guided hikes and educational presentations to at least 15,000 people. That outreach work sought to engage the community through an inclusive approach that inspires appreciation, connection, and a legacy of stewardship. In 2015, Open Space and Mountain Parks also worked to protect, sustain, and restore the land's important natural resources. We thinned 146 acres of forest growth and helped to conduct a large prescribed fire. This work will help to improve the health of our open space forest ecosystems and reduce wildfire risks for Boulder neighborhoods. Seasonal wildlife closures also help local raptor species, such as peregrine falcons, golden eagles, and bald eagles, to raise dozens of baby birds in 2015. Our community's efforts to protect local birds of prey would not be possible without the Volunteer Raptor Monitoring Program, which celebrated its 30th anniversary in 2015. That volunteer program has helped to make City of Boulder open space, especially the Flatirons, one of the prime areas in Colorado for nesting birds of prey. In 2015, Open Space and Mountain Parks ecologists also collaborated with the department's agricultural staff to help conserve our native grasslands, some of which are globally rare. This work included partnering with local ranchers on prescribed grazing to reduce invasive weed species near the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Open Space and Mountain Parks agricultural staff, 
which works to preserve the area's agricultural traditions, also worked to increase local food production in 2015. They converted 12 acres of land where open space lessees can now grow vegetables and other foods. In 2015, Open Space and Mountain Parks and our community worked hard to provide more opportunities to enjoy the land, while also ensuring that the diverse resources found on our shared land are conserved too. But as stewards of the city's open space, we couldn't have done any of it without the guidance of our open space board and the incredible generosity of our community. So, thank you. Ah, beautiful Boulder, Colorado. The majestic Flatirons, the bounty of hills and mountains of trash that could have been recycled or composted. Turns out 90% of what we throw away could have been recycled or composted. Let's change that. Boulder's taking action to become a zero waste community. Zero waste means that instead of using something once and then burying it into the ground, you send it to the right spot so it can be made into something new. Think of it as a loop instead of a one-way street. So let's talk about how to properly sort your trash into three categories. It really matters what you throw where since the contents of each bin go to three completely separate facilities. Let's sort it out, starting with recyclables. There are a lot of familiar items that can go into the recycling bin. We're going to give you a second to take that all in. Many people know that styrofoam is a recycling no-no, but so are plastic bags, plastic wrap, plastic utensils, and gloves. The number one thing to know? Numbers on plastics and the recycling symbols don't matter. What matters more is the shape of the object. These bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars are all recyclable. The numbers are for manufacturers. Something is only recyclable if it can be made into something new. Think a plastic bag sent to the wrong spot is no big deal? Think again. At least twice a day, jam bags have to be removed from the recycling center equipment. The second biggest problem item? Coffee cups and lids. These cannot be recycled. Other confusing items include plastic lids. Be sure to leave them on. Berry containers, wax-coated drink boxes, bound notebooks, and staples are all okay. Give your food containers a rinse and ball up foil, but resist the urge to crush cans and other items, which confuse the sorting machines. We like to say that if it was alive in your lifetime, it can be composted, so that means all food waste, including meat, bones, and dairy. The heat at our compost site has the power to break down a pile of baby back rib bones and the mass of dirty napkins that piled up while you ate them. But plastic is another story. Keep anything plastic lined, like to-go boxes, out of the compost. Don't be conned by these faux compost items labeled biodegradable, organic, or natural. Your item must say BPI certified compostable. When in doubt, look for the BPI logo. Any contaminated paper products with food on them that would normally be recycled, like last night's pizza box, now should be composted. Last and we hope least filled, landfill. Landfills are designed to keep out air, water, and sunlight while trash sits there without breaking down for a long, long time. Only a fraction of what you throw out should end up in this dark, sad mountain of methane-releasing waste. For chip bags, squeeze tubes, styrofoam, anything plastic lined, dog poop, and candy wrappers, these all go in the landfill. The recycling bin is for paper and containers, but keep out plastic bags, plastic coated paper, like to go boxes, and coffee cups. Things like paper towels and tissues can join your food and yard waste in the compost, but again, keep plastics out. Visit zerowastebolder.com for a full list of items and where they belong. Together, we can help Boulder become a zero waste community.
flourishes, brings us together, and adds flavor to life. That's why it's important to wash hands, surfaces, and fresh produce. Keep raw meat, poultry, and seafood separate from ready-to-eat foods like fruits and vegetables. And cook to proper temperatures using a food thermometer. Enjoy! And refrigerate leftovers within two hours. For more tips on safely preparing foods, visit homefoodsafety.org.
All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Boulder City Council meeting of December 18th, 2018. Lynette, will you call the roll? Council Member Brockett. Present. Carlisle. Here. Grano. Jones. Here. Morzell. Nagel. Here. Weaver. Here. Yates. Happy to be here. Young. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Excellent. Quorum. And since it's our last meeting before the holiday, we thought we'd have a, a big one. Big one. A big one. A, a couple of announcements to get uh, before we get going here. And that is we have an information packet this week, uh, which you can find on the web, and it addresses the electric an update on the electric utility, human services strategy implementation update, and as well as an update on the use table and standards land use code change project, which we'll be touching on a bit tonight. And with that, we're gonna jump right into open comment. Uh, just a reminder, you're free to talk to us about anything except for the four items that we're going to be talking about at our public hearing, because you can sign up separately to speak at those. And those topics are Two annexations, one for 2140 Tamarack and one for 1240 Upland, and then the BC1 and BC2 zones, and then finally opportunity zones. If you want to speak to those, sign up separately and we'll be dealing with those later. And with that, we're going to start with Carolyn Beninsky. If you could start with your name and address, that would be great. And you have two minutes. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Carolyn Beninsky, and I am with uh, Colorado Climate Engineering Watch, and our main concern at the present time is the danger of solar radiation management, or SRM. I've got some papers coming around for you. I've spoken to you about this issue twice before this year. I know other people have talked to you also. Just to remind you, solar radiation management is a form of climate engineering that involves spraying highly toxic metal aerosols, including aluminum from airplanes into the atmosphere. Although SRM is supposed to mitigate climate change, it actually fuels overall warming because uh, the metal oxides create clouds that trap more heat than they reflect out. Um, and you've probably seen some of this happening over the skies of Boulder. The federal government tells the public that we're seeing water vapor coming out of the uh, jet engines of the airplanes. If you're walking on a cold winter day, can you turn around and see a trail of water vapor from your breathing going miles back? That's what we're being told by the government is happening with these planes. Uh, for, for decades, the U.S. government has denied that solar radiation management is occurring despite massive evidence to the contrary. In other words, they've been lying to the public. Recently, a Harvard research team announced plans to perform tests of solar radiation management over the skies of Arizona in early 2019. So they're coming out of the closet. They say their purpose is to mitigate climate change. Yes, it's a very serious problem, as we all know, climate change is, but spraying highly toxic metals into the atmosphere isn't the solution. Uh, so uh, solar radiation management has numerous environmental and health consequences. Is that my time? So I just urge the council to uh, study this issue and to take action against it now that the government is admitting that it's doing it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Leslie, and after Leslie, we have David Hartzell. Good evening, Council. Leslie Glustrom, uh, Boulder. I uh, appreciate this opportunity, and um, it looks like the PowerPoint slides didn't get through, so I don't have to fumble around this week. Um, Excel's rates really did go up. You got an email saying, oh, maybe it's just transmission rates. No, that was wrong. They really did go up 9% for residential customers during this last quarter, driven in large part, in at least in part, by the Rush Creek Wind Farm, which is about twice as expensive as it should be. So I decided to check on their profits, something that we've been doing here in Boulder for a while, and you, they're coming around. We only have 20 2018 up through the third quarter. But we can see that in Colorado, Public Service Company of Colorado had $463 million of after-tax net income in Colorado in 2018. 
Uh, this is about twice as much as they had for the entire year in 2006. So their profits are going up about 6% a year. So Patrick's going to get up and talk to you about the utility occupation tax and what a shame it is that you're following what the voters told you to do. But remember that Excel's taking 20 million plus a year in after-tax net income out of our community. If we don't find an uh, alternative, that's going on forever, and they don't intend to keep it flat. They intend to grow it at a 6% at a, a year. It doesn't quite double in a decade, but close. So, so that's a, a really significant thing for us to think about. And of course, the legal expenses continue to go on and on because you have to stay in the Excel PUC system and you have to pay for the attorneys in perpetuity. The exciting thing is we think there's some options coming along. Um, I think you know, and it may be in this packet that the mayor just mentioned, the staff of the city went out for a request for indicative pricing. They went out looking on the market, could people bring us wind and solar? What might it cost? at our scale, at a boulder size scale, and I'm pretty sure in that packet, which I haven't seen, you'll see that the lowest cost portfolio was 89% renewable energy. We'll pick up here in 2019. That means there's lots of options for doing this and for getting it financed. So thank you. Thank you, Leslie. David. And then Kimberly Murphy. Hi, thank you, council members. So my name is Dave Hartzell. I'm an owner at the Uptown uh, Broadway Condominium Association, North Boulder. Um, I'm a board member as well, but I am not here representing the board. Um, I'm coming to you uh, as an individual. So I'm here to express my concern over the North Boulder Library Project. Uh, as we currently understand it, this project is under development and is evaluating the property between 13th and 14th Street along Left Hand Canyon Creek. Uh, my concerns are with the lack of road access being developed to support this library. Uh, the city should develop 14th Street from Rosewood Avenue to Violet Avenue um, for library access. Infrastructure really needs to be put into place to support the library and the residential population. I do not believe any other Boulder library facility has this sort of through neighborhood access, which is going to force patrons to go through residential streets. So in addition to traffic, we're also concerned about the homeless and transient population in North Boulder. There are several shelters nearby on Lee Hill Road and North Broadway. We currently deal with vandalism, loitering, breaking and entering, littering, uh, and police reports will reflect this fact. So it's my hope that the security planning for the library will actually go into place and that there will be patrol and access policies so that the library does not become a daytime shelter for the transient population. So if this facility is meant to be uh, service for the public for the next 30, 40, or 50 years, it's really in everyone's best interest to ensure that the library is properly planned and supported, and I think road infrastructures are the way to do this. So we hope to have this dialogue with you and the Library Council for the next few months as this evolves, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Kimberly? Is Kimberly here? Okay, how about Asa? Okay, Leo Scott. And after Leo, we have Patrick Murphy. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Leo Scott. And what I want to speak on has to do with December 10th of 1948. President Truman, along with 48 countries, signed the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in that, Article 25 says, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, and other luck of, or lack of likelihood in circumstances beyond his control. And as you know, we do have quite a homeless problem here in Boulder. I am homeless myself. And this kind of has to be taken care of because under this, there's also Article 24, which states everyone has the right to rest. And they're again given these tickets, um, not making it to access for the shelters, I was told I was homeless too long and that at the Boulder Shelter. And this kind of stuff, then you guys had Benjamin Harvey die last Christmas. 
and things like this, this can't happen. Other things in this also goes that no one shall be obtrusively deprived of his property. When the homeless are arrested, their property is left behind for people to steal. That's obtrusively removing a person's property. Article one says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Article two, everyone is entitled to all rights and freedoms. And there's a few more, all I ask is, I would like the city council to actually look up on the United Nations page, we signed this, 1948, the United Nations Declaration of Universal Human Rights. And we need to change things. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Patrick. My name is Patrick Murphy, I live in Boulder. When it comes to the Muni, it is hard to be led by you. Here comes that list. Perhaps you'll need to hear it twice. We're gonna find out. Here's that growing list. The longer it goes, the worse it gets. Rejecting the conversion of all streetlights to LEDs when all the towns around us have already accepted them. Is the Muni making us stupid? District Court, PUC, and FERC have ruled against Boulder on all key issues, and Boulder pretends they were all great successes. All of Boulder's early Muni assumptions I listed at the public hearing were wrong. And Boulder still assumes it can get all cost estimated by 2020, but it never will. Boulder still assumes that stranded costs will be zero, and all the wonderful financial predictions based on that assumption are corrupt. Past performance is the best indicator of future performance. April 2017, City Council rejected putting Excel settlement offers on the ballot, thus de-democratizing the Muni by preventing a vote on a partnership settlement to help Boulder achieve its environmental goals or a negotiated buyout process in which Boulder would acquire the Boulder Electric Distribution System. Excel estimated the buyout at 550 to 750 million. Boulder estimated the cost up to 900 million just to reject this option. Boulder conducted a bad faith negotiation. June 2018, the Colorado Supreme Court ruled to preserve Excel's right to challenge Boulder's compliance with its own muni creation criteria. So now we are stuck with no vote or exit ramp on a muni for two years, thus highlighting the de-democratization of the muni. This is the muni past and future. Thank you, Patrick. Corwin. Um, I've been to the police uh, to report a stolen vehicle from a man that took his own life from a woman, and I got no response. I've called a detective to investigate. I got no response. I've spoken to the DA about multiple things about the um, homeless being victimized by a particular woman and another man. And uh, I, I'd really want to talk to somebody about this. And they abuse um, elderly people. And, um, it's, and a dozen condos have been remodeled without a permit, without inspections by <coughs> homeless people that have meth, cocaine, and heroin problems. And they have no recourse when they're not paid. And uh, th the friend of hers goes in and okays for people to live in there. And I just like to speak to someone and I can bring testimony from a half a dozen different people that have been victimized by this particular person and the man that helps her. And I'd ask the city council to set me up with somebody. I can give them some info. I'll give them names. I'll get testimonies. and. You know, these privileged people that do this, it doesn't help the homeless. I mean, it certainly doesn't help me. I'd be in Florida with my kids if I'd been paid for the work I did, but uh, I didn't. So here I am to try to make uh, things right for the people that have been victimized by this couple and uh, the elderly that are abused through Meals on Wheels and property. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a deep, it's a big thing. 
and I just want to talk to somebody and have somebody help me uh, do the right thing by bringing somebody to justice for the criminal activities that's going on right here in Boulder. And it victimizes the homeless people and puts them in a worse position than they were before. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have laryngitis tonight. Mr. Sampson, if you would go to the city clerk over there and leave your name yeah. and how we can contact you, um, either someone from the city manager's office or the police department Thank will you. contact you about this. I've, uh, in the two and a half weeks, I've called the building department twice and have a recording and no one's called me back. Okay, so we'll, we'll handle that. Work. But we just need your information to give to the city okay. clerk. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, and Mr. Sam, so we do have ordinances in place to prevent wage theft. So I'm sure the city staff will follow up and make sure that. I did that down here for your a guy. I went in and talked to him, gave him all the information. She came in and talked to him. I called him up, see what our, was going our on. Our attention is on it. We'll make sure and follow up. So if you leave and your he laughed at me. We'll look for well, reports on how that goes. And thank you. Um, <clears throat> Gary Erling. Hello. I just wanted to talk to you about how lucky we are that we now have all three branches of the Colorado government under democratic control, which gives you guys the ability to ask for some things that you've said that you want for a long time, like giving the city the ability to set its own minimum wage, not requiring cities to live by the minimum wage that the state defines. You say you want that. There is a person in the legislature who's pushing this bill. I see no one from Boulder there supporting her. We need to do that. I'd also like to bring up the fact that we, what we're missing here most, Boulder continually talks about 50K commuters every day coming to Boulder yet we have no control over a light rail or a mass transit system that I can actually bring those people who may or may not want to live in Boulder. We have a legislature, we have a governor that believes in transit. Why are we not talking to him? We have a light rail that goes to the School of Mines in Golden. We don't have one that goes to the state university. That's a problem. I'd also like to talk to you about the state needing to have some oversight over the University of Colorado. I'm sure there's a couple of you that have talked about CU students living in their cars, CU students who can't afford food, employees of the university that can't afford food. If you look at the statistics on the CU, you will see that they do not take care of their students, they do not take care of their, their employees. And the average student coming out of CU, 50K a year. The average student from Mines, 80K. That makes a huge difference. Thank you. Mary? So, uh, Mr. Erling, yes. I just wanna let you know that last Friday, the council had their state legislative breakfast. Yes. And one of the issues that we brought up that is in our state and federal legislative agenda is um, the minimum wage issue, just as you mentioned. And it we did important. ask for it, and we do support it, and um, hopefully it will happen. Have the CU, session. are the Boulder people's representatives put their name? And, and they have. Okay, thank you. And, and, and just, football. just. Lynn. Just to follow up, Mr. Erling, one more thing is another priority that we added at the end was uh, RTD governance reform, because <clears throat> one of the issues with the way things have evolved over time is with the RTD governance structure. So Aaron presented that to our state legislators as a request. I might suggest that you go on the bouldercolorado.gov website and Google legislative agenda, because okay. it's, it's got our priorities that we, both the top priorities and then kind of all the federal priorities as well. Yeah, this, this, came, this meeting came up quickly, so I didn't really have time to do much reading. Well, thank you. But I'll also tell you that, that the highest level of, of poverty in the city of Boulder is the 18 to 24 year olds. That 50 percent of them, and who is that population? See you, Mr. Early. Do you want a copy? I have an extra one. 
I'm sorry. Do you want a copy of our legislative agenda? I have an extra one. Here, we'll bring it down. <laughs> okay, Mark Gulban, and then Lynn Siegel. Uh, Mark Gilban, 505 College Avenue. After living in Boulder, fortunately, for nearly 30 years now, it's not diff or it's diff it's become increasingly difficult to not feel a deep sense of resentment about the growing gap between purported community values and reality. Whether it's homelessness, diversity and inclusivity, alternative transportation, green energy and the environment, or affordable housing, Boulder keeps talking a great game and failing. Over my 30 years here, I've watched a community not deal with homelessness and produce not one, but two 10-year plans to end homelessness. I've watched the community become less economically, culturally, and ethnically diverse. I've watched 60,000 a day in commuters in single occupancy vehicles and no train come through Boulder. And I've watched housing skyrocket and watched council after council pass increasingly um, harsh policies for har housing scarcity. A common thread in all of these failures has been 40 plus years of manifest suburbia housing scarcity policies. As you consider everything tonight and into the future, and as you consider your good fortune in the new year and during this holiday season, I'd like to ask you, when you pass policy, who benefits and who loses? How much? How much longer can our policies favor 1% single family homeowners over community and the issues that we've failed at for 40 years? Thank you, Mark. Lynn? Lynn Siegel, um, do I have to say anything of my address? It's helpful just to know your neighborhood. Just We know where your neighborhood is. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, it's Mountain Heights, technically, um, which is kind of nice. Um, I wanted to bring up, um, I just found out today that um, I was pulled over by the um, Boulder City cop for Airbnb for too many listings on my property, and that is not in the code, and I just found out that today. Um, so the city of Boulder has lost out on the money that I already think they're stealing from me, which is the tax to Airbnb people. The city of Boulder has lost out on that income, and I have lost out on that income because I'm not allowed to advertise for more than two listings. Or if I have, like I've had um, couples stay at my place, so the couples can't come anymore because you can only have one guest. That counts as a listing. So I have three bedrooms. I can have one room with a guest or I can have two listings, two out of my three bedrooms um, listed. And I just found out that's against the law and that the city of Boulder supported this through their enforcement officer. And I went to court on it, and so I'm kind of upset. But the city should be upset too because they list out, missed out on all that money for two years. So. Maybe you ought to do something about, you know, like I thought from the start, this doesn't sound right. They can pull me over for over-occupancy, but they can't pull me over for advertising. That's like <laughs> not possible. And I've written to you numerous times, and I've written to David, and I've written to everyone here about this problem, and no one's ever alerted me that this might not be actually in the code. So no one even looked. I had to find out myself. Thank you, Lynn. Elizabeth Hondor. Elizabeth Hondor of 2724. Um, I back up Lynn. I helped her today research that. It's ridiculous. There is nothing in the code about <coughs> how many listings. It's asked, actually, I think it's against the Interstate uh, Commerce Act. 
to tell somebody they can only advertise two rooms. It's like fishing, you know, you throw out three lines, but you only take two fish. You know, it doesn't matter what bait you use. You can use a crab or you can, you know, spill blood in the water and get the shark, it doesn't matter. You people gave us only two people allowed plus the owner in the house. So, you know, how can you make money if you can't advertise? I think it's illegal and you need to research it immediately. Y you know, uh, the guy that owns Facebook, he can advertise whatever he wants. So anyway, that's the, the second issue I wanted to talk to you about was, we spoke about it before about the uh, particulate study that needs to be done for 311 Mapleton. I'm a resident in the neighborhood. It's pretty much been proven there will be 20,000 trucks, probably more. It's been uh, cited by Lawyer Dunn in a letter to you, and Mr. Gare read that there will be a particulate, particulate problem. It's the same thing as Rocky Flats, and we'd like to use the same people that I hope you do get to do the particulate study for Rocket Flats before you unleash children across that. Um, I, need to, I need to prepare. I need to know, is my house gonna fall down? Am I gonna have dangerous dust? Do I need to move? I'm elderly, do I need to have my tenants move? And you haven't followed up. And Mr. Yates said he would have a transportation study. Well, I don't see that the particulate study is in that, and I'd like some follow-up on all the work we've done. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. The group's called Environmental Lynn. Analytics. Stephen. Lynn Siegel. Quit speaking out or you're gonna have to go. <laughs> Stephen, it's Stephen's turn. Good evening, Council. So, I think that Lisa and Cindy probably remember, I'm not sure how many other folks were here for this, but who remembers the people's parking lot where the St. Julian Hotel was, right? I used it often. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, this, uh, I've been reading up a little bit on the diagonal issue. Um, and I know that that's a topic for later this evening. I think that, um, that the city has to do what we've done with Horizon West and with the senior citizens building across the street uh, uh, adjacent to Alfalfas. We have to pick places and go above 55 feet, have to. It, it, it's one of the solutions for the housing issue. There's places in the city that is not gonna affect people's view. Horizon West is a fantastic building. You know, I went from being homeless and finally quitting drinking, and I needed to quit drinking. And one of my friends got me, uh, he signed a year's lease for the penthouse apartment in Horizon West. So I literally went from camping outside and spending a lot of money on booze to the penthouse apartment at Horizon West, paid for. Um, and that helped my sobriety enormously. That's a beautiful building. And I think that we need a couple of dozen of those buildings, quite frankly, and put it in areas of the city, then it's not gonna affect people's view. We have areas in the city we can do that. That's gonna help with, with housing. You know, there's a, I've been busy with Ukraine. There's a, a Ukrainian out, a company that has started a factory in Reno, Nevada called Passive Dome. They're building homes in a day. Lisa got a, a copy of it. I'll bring some more over tomorrow. Um, I just drove in five hours to come to this meeting. And my main, and thank you, for, are we done? Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Soils and carbon soaking, thank you. Yeah. Sarah Silver. If it's okay, we're gonna speak together. Use four minutes instead of two sets of two. Are you Chris Nelson? This is Chris Nelson. Hey. <laughs> okay, just checking, right. sure. Uh, you got this electronically, but uh, I wanna get these in your hands as well. It's just a copy of our agreement. 1440 pine. So I'll start before we uh, run out of time with handing out documents. I'm Chris Nelson from Attention Homes. And I'm Sarah Silver from the Whittier neighborhood. We're here today to present uh, to you a good neighbor agreement and the good neighbor statement of operations for the 1440 Pine Street Attention Homes Apartments project. These documents are the result of over a year long process catalyzed and supported by the city of Boulder following a deeply contentious public debate about the project. 
Um, 12 people participated in the process, six neighbors, four of whom have decades of experience as therapists, social workers, or foster parents working directly with the age group to be homed at 1440 Pine Street. They agreed to participate based on the belief that a successful project at 1440 Pine Street would also be a success for the neighborhood. I'd actually like to thank personally the neighbors who freely gave their time, expertise, and careful consideration to the process. Mark Grassman, Judy Nog, uh, Bill Spencer, Jill Vitas Davis, Kara Luna, and, and me. And I'd like to go on record um, thanking the six individuals from the par Projects Partnership who also freely gave their time, expertise, and careful considerations. Brooke Aikens from Ross Property Management, Connie Takamini from First United Methodist Church of Boulder, Macon Coles, a neighbor, uh, Claire Clerman and Claire Cronin, both former staff of Attention Homes, uh, and myself. So thanks to that crew for supporting this process as well. Um, and we also owe a deep debt of gratitude to Ron and Sue Kurtz, Kurtzner from Choice Point Consulting who helped us through the process and whose presence was supported by the city. Thank you all very much. So our intent moving forward is to create transparency, to share information with the neighborhood and the community, to receive feedback and to answer questions the broader public may have regarding this good neighbor agreement that we've developed. We'd like the city's help uh, to develop and implement a strategy to distribute the document, to engage uh, further neighborhood participation and create opportunities for feedback on the document. Perhaps this project, this is a project the neighborhood liaison office and the housing department could coordinate on with us. We welcome your recommendation on next steps. Uh, the GNA establishes an advisory group for the project that will include neighbors of 1440 Pine Street, of the apartments themselves, law enforcement, parking representation, <coughs> the project partnership uh, neighbors, and a to be identified representative from the city of Boulder. Uh, we welcome your recommendations on who that city, uh, who the representative should be. And the responsibility of the advisory, responsibilities of the advisory group are actually laid out in the GNA. And uh, in addition, the last thing uh, that's important to attention homes is that we create an informational portal so that um, we can share with the community the operations of 1440 Pine Attention Homes apartments and create a conduit for common understanding of communications processes moving forward as the project goes into operations. So the contentious debate that led to the necessity of a facilitated dialogue is behind us. Um, it's our goal that the GNA the statement of operations, the advisory group, and the information portal are an effective framework for ongoing, productive, and positive relations between the neighborhood, attention homes, and its partners. And we are happy to be here and to answer any questions now or in the future. Indeed. Wow. Well, I'll, I'll just start out by saying this is outstanding that we have come to this place. Uh, and I haven't read it. I don't know if anybody else has yet, but I, I yeah. I guess I just want to say kudos to you all for engaging in this and getting to such a great place. I'm sure the city will have thoughts on how best to help um, moving forward once we have a look at this. I don't know if anybody's seen it yet. I, I don't know if anybody else wants. Yeah, questions. I mean, I just want to say that this is probably the best of all possible worlds in the sense of it came from a place that was <laughs> difficult and it sounds like it's in a place where um, we have guiding principles that everybody can point to and look to and, um, you know, make make this building function as best it can and serve the youth that it was intended for. So, good job. Yeah, and I, I just want to thank you for getting together and working together to um, come up with this document and giving some confidence to how we go forward um, for both sides of the issue, and I'm glad you were able to come together and work so well. So I just really thank you for that. Aaron? I just echo that I'm just so appreciative that you all came together and worked together so constructively, and it's a real pleasure to see you up here tag teaming, you know, after <laughs> yeah. such a difficult process, and so kudos and thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bob? You know, uh, the 1440 Pine Project was not the first contentious project in this town, and it won't be the last. <clears throat> but I think you guys have really um, established a, um, a model for um, collaboration, cooperation. Once a project is approved, you move on and you figure out how we're all going to live together. So I, I think we'll be able to, for the next several years, point to what you guys have pulled together as a way for um, the community to come back together and heal um, when we have those challenges. Well, and, and can you remind us um, when you're shooting to open? Oh, uh, summer 2019, so uh, maybe August. Okay. 
most likely uh, in the fall. We look forward to the invitation. I mean, you know, construction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In yeah. Boulder. We look forward to the invitation. Yeah, oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah, and thanks for all the support. And just one more thing. I want to thank you as well and just add that I really appreciate what you've done <clears throat> and for setting an example about how things can um, work in this day and age when um, everything seems to be so divisive. If we could just actually respond, we were talking about that downstairs, and uh, I think we both have thoughts about the different stages and where there are improvements that could be made, and we're very happy separately and together to talk about that with anyone in the city who would like to hear about it. Well, and the Housing Advisory Board would probably be that place. One of the things that we um, talked about them working on is um, to look at CHAFA and um, site review alignment and how that can work and how that whole process could be improved to um, be proactive in preventing the kind of divisiveness that we saw in this project. But thankfully, it has come together quite nicely. Yeah, and we still, I mean, I, I don't, let's not get confused. We still have work to do, yeah. um, but we have come a long way. And the city's support and Sarah's hard work and all the people who participated in this are committed to continuing that work. And so more lessons to come. And um, I think we're. We have coffee once in a while. I think we're ready. We yeah. yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so thanks. And thanks for giving us this space tonight. Really? Thank you. So, any other staff comment on open comment? No. Council, anything else? Aaron? I said be interested in some information, follow up on uh, Lynn Siegel's point about uh, not being able, allowed to advertise uh, multiple. So, I don't know what the details are, but. Uh, certainly, there are occupancy <coughs> limits, but I don't know about advertising limits. So, and when we get well, to the um, consent agenda, I'm going to speak about the short-term rentals and some of the policies there. Okay, I could do it now, or I could wait um, till we get there. Hold that thought. Let's. Get, did you have something yeah. on that? Point? Just one quick. There, there is an advertising standard for short-term rentals, and the standard provides that no person shall advertise a short-term rental unless the advertisement includes the license number and the maximum unrelated occupancy permitted in the unit. Right. And it's, I know about that, but it's different from not allowing multiple listings, So, I, which was what she was asserting. She was told she couldn't do so. Right. We'll, we'll look into her concerns and talk with her and let council know what's going on. Great. Thank you very right. much. Anything else? Okay. okay. Next is your Thank consent you. agenda. You have four items tonight. <clears throat> okay. Cindy. Okay. So this is um, the D. 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 Thank you. This is D. And one of the things that in in reading through this, I was concerned about the sort of the punitive nature of our, and I do not mean our staff people, but I mean the policy that the council put into place at some point earlier, and 2015, 2016, that um, as I read through this, it's like a, almost like a police state kind of thing with someone overlooking these people where it used to be complaint-based. Now it's our city staff who is doing this. And I just wondered if we might not want to be a little kinder and gentler to, towards our folks out there and be more complaint-based again, rather than doing this oversight of how many people rent out where, when, who, why, what, et cetera. It really is uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable for me to read it. I thought this is approaching, from my perspective, sort of gulag state. Um, one of the things one of the complaints was that most platforms encourage or require hosts to be vague about their property's location, and that has to do with security. So, you know, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's looked at as something that the city needs to be really concerned about. So moving forward, I would like to see whether or not we might think about changing our policy somewhat. I'm in agreement with and I voted for having the owners um, assert that they're on property, it's their main residence on an annual basis, nothing's wrong with that, but all of this other stuff that goes with it, 
really gets to be kind of mucky from my perspective. So I would ask that we, as I said, look, look at being a little kinder going forward. For what it's worth, I'll just put out there for context that one of the reasons why it's set up for staff enforcement was we heard a lot from the community about the fact that we don't enforce our existing laws, and if we were going to allow for more ADUs, that we needed to step up enforcement. So those two things were sort of done in tandem, which doesn't mean we can't revisit it, but that's why we were there. It was in response to concerns. If you're going to relax anything around occupancy or having more people stay, then we want to know that you're going to enforce what's there. And so that's why we got there, for better or worse. So, so in, in whether it's complaint-based or whether or not we have this aggressive policy, I did speak to the city attorney, who is not here tonight, um, and he said that it used to be there were lots of complaints. And I don't know the background on this and stand to be corrected, but he said that those have really dropped off in terms of people within the community registering complaints. So again, I don't want us to be the bad guys in this and going out and doing a lot of enforcement action like that we were we heard of this evening. I mean, it seems over the top again. And because it's our policy and not the code enforcement persons, I think we need to really be clear on what it is that we hope to have coming out of this. So, I mean, just another piece of context for the discussion that we had was that <clears throat> this is a business and similar to hotels and other things with life safety requirements, um, it was <clears throat> the, the community, more or less, as Ann said, was asking that we have a way to <clears throat> watch this to make sure that we understand the scope of how, because there was a lot of speculation about how widespread um, short-term rentals would turn out to be. And the community was saying, we, we, the community, don't want to be the bad guys required to call in our neighbors, and we would rather have the city staff, because these are advertised, watch the advertisements much like rental advertisements. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, go ahead. Um, I wonder, it, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen a shift in the, like, like no one purchases properties anymore in, in, with the intent of illegally renting the Airbnb in them, or at least I don't experience that, whereas it used to kind of, there was this energy around, oh, let's create this kind of business. And and I think the city has done a good job over the last couple of years of like, maybe what you're talking about has actually been very effective. And now that we've got this yearly renewal to make sure that you live there and all of that, you know, it, maybe it's under control and now it can loosen up. It's just one thought that, um, like, I think the policy worked really well, but I, I kinda, I'm kind of with you at this point. Okay, so this is first reading. So it could be that on second reading we can have a bigger discussion or maybe at the retreat. Um, and I guess I might encourage you to, if you want to propose something, Cindy, for us to consider that you get more specific. Reading code and whether you get a warm feeling from it is I rarely get a warm feeling from reading our code. <laughs> yes. So um, I'm not sure that's the concern, but if there are specifics, it may be that we want to talk about it in terms of the work plan if you want to see if there's a not a five um, at the retreat. And, and let me just say, for one of the things that I'm referencing specifically are pages 29 and it's the enforcement, 29 and 30 in our packet. I mean, again, just reading through this, the, the different steps and sort of how uh, into everything it is, perhaps unnecessarily. <clears throat> but I'll do that. I'll follow up. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on consent? I have a couple, just, just a couple hmm? questions. After Mary. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just one thing. Um, item 3C, the um, towing ordinance. Um, you have on the dice a blue sheet that um, just added a timeline to the time um, that the towing company has to call the police. And I think it was a, an oversight, and so it's in there now. Good catch. Yeah, thank you. And this, this 30 minutes comes from? The state law. State law. Excellent, okay. So, <laughs> so this is yet another change, so we're going to fourth reading? Or, yep. 
Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay, Lisa. So on item 3B, um, consideration of a motion to authorize the city manager dispose of a permanently affordable uh, property. My only question has to do, I know where it is and it's in the HOA, um, and uh, have they been brought up to speed on the HOA? Are they aware of the HOA fees and, and um, can they afford it? <laughs> I just thought I'd ask. Good question. Uh, Kurt Fernhaber, Director of Housing and Human Services. So um, uh, over the last um, couple of years at least, um, and in fact I, I went into the website to try applying for an affordable home. Um, you can't go through the process without going through the training. Yeah. You can't go to, from step A to step B. Um, and that is part of the, um, the orientation. Um, however, we have identified <coughs> that um, many people in their excitement to often buy their first home mm -hmm. um, don't necessarily take everything in the way they should. Um, so we're also looking at ways to, you know, uh, um, better educate them, um, possibly more before, but also after they move in um, to their home. No, that's great. I'm, yeah. And I'm glad that somebody's being able to own a, a new home. Yep. So that's great. Um, and then I had... Um, Oh, I think that's it. Oh, I did have a question on the call up on um, 1750 14th Street. So it's, can I ask the question? Just let us get through consent and then we'll do it. All right. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, one other thing, it's not on consent, but I was assumed that we were going to hear about it. Um, I'll just say that at our retreat, Maybe I would like to talk about the incident related to um, the RV parking or, or for uh, the homeless RV parking, oh. and in particular, if there aren't some solutions around that sort of situation that we'd want to explore. Um, I know we have a really full meeting. Um, I, uh, I didn't really feel very good about how that went down and want to see if maybe there aren't some other options that we might want to explore together. So maybe I'll just put that on the, the list. I know there's been some conversations about that um, on a, a parking lot for us to think about mm -hmm. in the future. So to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. A motion for the consent agenda? So moved. So moved. Second. Um, okay. As amended. With as amended. <laughs> Any more discussion? It's a show of hands up. All those in favor? It's unanimous. You have two call-ups tonight, a site review for 1102 Pearl Street and a site review extension for 1750 14th Street. Lisa. So my question is about the site review extension on 1750 um, 14th Street. And what I, and I'm fine with the project and all of that, but what I don't understand is that it's been, it was approved and it just sat there for, I don't know how long, but uh, uh, in, it seemed like a long period of time. How does that happen? And how do we not try to nudge once, once they've, um, and do we have a right to once they have um, um, gotten their entitlement and their project has been approved and everything, why does this, why is this extension for so long? I, I assume we got new property owners or something? Yes, um, so Elaine McLaughlin, I'm case manager on the application and uh, it was, the property was sold and my understanding is the original um, property owner couldn't make it pencil out mm -hmm. and some of it had to do with whether or not they were going to do it as rental or condos and mm -hmm. of course the state law for condos has changed. Uh, but in this particular case, the property owner is the same person who is um, running the business tax guard from the former James Travel Building. And presumably he wasn't a developer. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. He probably realized that it was quickly going to expire, but he did apply for technical document review and expended some funds to prepare some pretty detailed construction plans. So it has been moving forward. 
Okay, and how long was it since the original plan was submitted and now? It was in, tw well, 2014. Well, yeah. yeah. And it's a three-year um, rule, so mm -hmm. to speak. That's okay. what our three-year rule is. And they're granted two six-month staff level extensions. And after they exhaust that, it's a planning board decision. And then, of course, it's subject to council call-up. Okay, no, I'm not interested in calling it up. I just was curious about the extension. And I had followed it carefully and was hopeful kind of for it. And then it kind of died. And I had talked with the developer. But anyway, I understand. Okay. Thank you. I have a Thank question. Yep. So, um, I read through the concerns of two of the persons who are neighboring property owners about the parking. Could you address that a little bit? I realized there was a parking reduction, but then, and then they said there was an active towing um, piece of the property, someone who was close by. So it's, it sounds like they're, they're concerns about how all of this parking is going to shake out at this point. So my understanding about the concern was a little different. It had to do with access um, and the ability to access the awesome. lot one and lot two. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about your concern about parking? It was about the numbers. The, the two persons who wrote in, one was they were both on site talking about the usage that's there now and then with the addition of these others that it's just sort of dreaming for the city to be thinking that people are just not going to drive or they're not going to have cars in that particular place. So I was so going back to the site review approval at the time the parking reduction was approved with a pretty robust transportation demand management plan a TDM and among the considerations were the fact that it was a centrally located site adjacent to a number of and diversity of uses that would be uh, amenable to people walking or biking. Um, another consideration was the fact that they did extend the, the multi-use path adjacent to the site. That was part of the plan. And so a number of considerations fall out of that. Um, and the assumption is that it would be folks who would want to have a central location, want to be able to walk and bike places. And then, of course, there's the regional bus facility across the street and a major bus line both on Arapahoe and Canyon. So I think all those combined demonstrated was a pretty robust TDM. I, I just wondered, I recently spoke to, um, well, I was down at McGuckin's trying to get in there, and a friend of mine had tried to get in there earlier. And apparently the new hotel down there is people are rather than paying to park at the hotel or using the external parking there. So it seems to me this doesn't have to do with that, except that parking is a reality. It's difficult to get in there. An 80-year-old neighbor of mine said she drove around for 10 minutes looking for a place to park and couldn't find one. So I asked, and apparently there's some real issues there. And I'm just wondering, and this is just general, if we're not short selling. Um, the needs here if we don't do a more robust, I understand the word, but something that actually has teeth in it so that there's some application of what it is that we ask in terms of transportation demand management. Because it was also noted in one of the letters that the, the parking structure across the street is not going to be open or have openings for people to use for some time into the future. So it's an issue. Yeah. Question. I know in the original proposal, Elaine, there was um, a connector um, that right. went um, east-west mm -hmm. um, on the side of the building that is key to connecting up the rest. Is that still in there? It is. Right. It, it's on the tech docs. Any other comments on this? I mean, just to highlight for the public where these are, one is the current old Chicago facility uh, <clears throat> restaurant, which is closed, and so that will be a change at the end of our mall, um, and there will be construction there, so that always will garner attention. And the other one is where the James Travel Building is to the west of Liquor Mart on 15th Street. <clears throat> and should this go forward, I think it will be a great thing to get the housing downtown, but it will also be, you know, centrally located. So. Okay, thank you very much. 
Your first public hearing is second reading of Ordinance 8301, an annexation of 2140 to 2150 Tamarack Avenue. Thank you and good evening everyone. Elaine McLaughlin, I'm case manager on the application. And um, in this particular um, annexation, um, we have a fairly brief staff presentation just to go over um, context. We'll talk a little bit about um, the proposed annexation. And um, there's three key issues for consideration that planning board also discussed. Little, um, we'll talk a little bit about public notification and the comment letters that have come in, um, and then we'll provide a recommendation. So just to ground everybody on where we're at, um, the 1.29 acre property is located in the Crestview East neighborhood, <coughs> and it's just uh, east of 19th Street on Tamarack, which in this location you can see is actually not a through street. and. As a result, there is, there does tend to be a rather rural um, appearance to the street. We need to... Does that monitor not work? It was working. Um. I'll continue on while we're looking at that. So this does illustrate that the property is an enclave and uh, the most recent surrounding annexations have occurred in the last couple of decades and uh, its designation of low density residential is defined as predominantly a single family detached units with a density of two to 60 use per acre. And there is a small sliver of open space other that's in the southwest corner, you can kind of barely see there that follows the nearby Four Mile Canyon Creek. So you can see that the proximity of the creek um, makes the site encumbered by the 100 year flood zone and uh, the, the high hazard zone um, along with a small sliver of conveyance. So as part of the annexation, the applicant is actually um, conveying a flood control um, and drainage easement over that area. And this is just an excerpt from what's in your packet. The county enclave property is surrounded by residential estate zoning and that's defined as single family detached at low to very low residential densities and that's the existing condition. And in keeping with the BVCP land use and um, zoning designations, the built context of the site is, um, as you can see, pretty much a low density um, setting. And as you'll note, along the portion of Tamarack, there tends to be um, lots that are larger in size and a number of newer homes that then compares with those that are across Tamarack and to the north at front on Upland that tend to have smaller lots and smaller homes. And so that also bears out in the property rec records as this illustrates that top graphic shows the average size of homes and lots surrounding the site is about 3,900 square feet um, with the smaller lots and homes to the north at front on Upland. And then larger lots and homes along this section of Tamarack. So you can kind of get a sense of how it's been built out over time. The annexation for, uh, um, the application um, rather for annexation meets the state statutes and in brief, a petition was filed. Um, there's community interest in annexing the enclave and being an enclave, the property meets the 1-6 contiguity requirements. Um, and in particular, this is one of the other key issues that we talked about at planning board. Um, the application was found to be consistent with a number of policies and that includes adapting to physical um, limits on expansion, can't go up and we can't go out. Um, others include um, some of the annexation policies that we'll talk about, channeling development areas with adequate infrastructure, and then of course our compact development pattern. So with regard to policy um, 1.16b, it states that the city will actively pursue annexation of enclaves, and of course that's the case here. Policy 1e, 
states that annexations that have additional development potential must demonstrate community benefit that's commensurate with the impacts. And so in this case, um, the annexation will allow connection to city water and sewer, of course. And then um, for residential development, emphasis is placed on provision of permanently affordable housing. And in this case, the applicant has agreed to pay two times the cash in lieu amount for any new residential unit that's built on the site. So uh, just uh, moving forward for key issue three, we looked at the appropriateness of the zoning. And in this case, um, it's helpful to take a look at the North Boulder subcommunity plan land use map for this Crestview East area. And um, in that regard, there's essentially a gradient of density that starts at Violet, as you can see on the north. And um, there's higher densities along Violet that essentially transitions down towards Four Mile Canyon Creek to where we're at with the very low densities. Um, this is then consistent with the comp plan, of course, that establishes that gradient, which then in turn helps to establish uh, the residential estate where one uh, DU per 15,000 square feet of lot area is permitted. So under the residential estate zoning, redevelopment will be subject to the Title IX regulations, of course, and that includes form and bulk and intensity and other development standards. Um, and then also co uh, compatible development <coughs> applies in this case, and that includes regulating side yard, bulk plane, wall articulation, building coverage, and then there's floor area requirements as well for the RE zone. So based on the standards and given the high hazard flood constraints, the approximately 5,600 square foot lot could be subdivided into essentially two half acre or so size lots. Um, and that translates out to about a maximum of 7,000 square feet of floor area on each lot and about 5,600 square feet of uh, building coverage each. And as it's stated in the memo, if um, in the future the site is removed from high hazard, theoretically you could get three lots on here. One of them would probably be a flag lot, uh, but that's only if it gets removed from the flood zone. So essentially we're looking at two lots in this context. And then for the terms of annexation, the applicant has to pay those plant investment fees and then all the applicable utility connection inspection fees before connection. And then also, as was noted, uh, payment will be due prior to building permit issuance for that two times the cash in lieu per dwelling unit. And then um, in recommending approval to council, the planning board added a couple other conditions. And um, the first permits up to two ADUs on the property, and the second condition um, slightly amends the North Boulder subcommunity plan guidelines, which state that uh, principal entrances for, um, or rather primary entrances for principal structures should face the street. And they're agreeing with that, but what they're suggesting is that ADU entrances don't need to face the street. And that gives a little bit more adaptability and ability to create those additional ADUs on the site. Uh, with that, public notification was sent to property owners within 600 feet and a notice was posted on the property. There was a letter received um, earlier on that's included in your packet that uh, commented on wanting to retain that rural one half and <coughs> one acre um, character. A second comment letter was received yesterday and that indicated concerns about uh, the condition to add the second ADU to any of the lots on the property. So in your packet staff does have a suggested motion language for adoption of ordinance 8301 and I will take any questions. I have a question. Just to clarify, um, planning board said up to two ADUs per lot. Correct. And the square footage of all the buildings on the lot doesn't change. It would just mean that instead of having a large house, you would have a you could have a slightly smaller house and two ADUs. I'm just clarifying for the public that it doesn't change the max square footage. That's right. But could allow for some, yeah. Okay. Any other questions before we go to the public hearing? So I had that same question, so that's great. And I'm excited about the two ADUs. Um, so I'm very excited about that. So here's some questions I have. When in your presentation, Elaine, and thank you for your presentation, um, 
um, you showed um, average size and lot size, and I walk that street very often. And um, it's, I would say, in a period of change. <coughs> maybe we want that change, maybe we don't. But um, the averages of those houses, as you showed, there's a huge range. Mm -hmm. And so there's a brand new, like, 72, 7,300 square foot house. And at the same time, you have a, much small, a lot of much smaller houses, which is what that neighborhood normally was for. So I, it's more a comment than a question, but I think those averages are somewhat deceptive. Be not talking, uh, they're just deceptive because you're taking really small, um, or let's, they're not really small, they're maybe 1,500 to 2,000, or I don't know, there's some smaller ones, and then you have these giant ones. And so, anyway, it's more a comment than, than anything. Um, I, I'm curious about the high hazard uh, flood floodplain and about um, the ability to build your way out of it. And I'm not sure in that if that would require additional soil or whatever to be put into where that high hazard flood zone is, would, would that be required? And then when that happens, what happens to people downstream because you're reconfiguring, you're reconfiguring the channel a little bit. And I think that is more an issue if it were done comprehensively. In other words, the ability to remove it out of high hazard would be dependent on remapping the entire floodplain and um, stretch of Four Mile Canyon Creek. So it couldn't be just done individually and pulled out of the high hazard. It's as if it were a comprehensive part okay. of a a larger study here. Okay, no. so we're, we're, we have that covered. And then is there, I didn't notice, but is there anywhere in there um, um, discussion about fencing and how wild, because that's a very active wildlife corridor, yeah. how, how the wildlife is supposed to continue down that corridor without being um, There aren't obstruct. specifics in the annexation agreement about fencing today. But would it not be true that um, people normally would not be able to build a fence? You'd have to get a fence permit, right? Sure. And you would not be able to build a fence or a permanent fence in a high hazard floodplain, is that correct? You could get a floodplain development permit to build a fence in the floodplain, but it, yes, it would be subject to call up. Okay, so we could call that up if that came through? By planning board. Okay, and then um, I, I was going to ask if this would be included, since now it's RE, would it be included also in the large lot, large house um, study? I, I believe that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and on the flag lots, if I recall right, in the North Boulder sub-community plan, flag lots are highly discouraged. Mm -hmm. That's correct. We don't want those. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so... I would hope we don't do flag lots. Um, if they want to do smaller houses, I'm fine with that. Um, and then I'm thrilled about the two ADUs, so done. Any other questions from council? Okay, in terms of our public hearing. Yeah, would you be giving time for the applicant to speak? Why yes. Apologies. I Thank you, folks. Don Ash with Scott Cox and Associates. We're representing the applicant. Okay. Um, I have a quick presentation. I'll keep it brief. Um, I'd like to thank staff, Charles, Elaine, Shannon Muller, Hella, for really working with us over the years. These guys did a really good job. I think uh, Elaine did a really good uh, presentation to kind of go into the details. I'll try not to reiterate anything, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective from the ownership and how our thought process has kind of evolved here. So, um, you know, when we started this process back in 2015, we were looking at strictly a use by right project. So with RE zoning, we're talking 15,000 square feet. Um, you know, we were thinking about three 18,000 square foot lots, kind of arranged in this uh, 
kind of linear fashion. Um, this is what we submitted with the annexation feasibility study in 2017. Um, we got some comments back at that point from some of the neighbors that were concerned about um, the floodplain, which goes through the south side of the site. They were also concerned about additional traffic on the dead end street. Um, there was some concerns about the um, buildings being pushed towards Tamarack too much. Um, you know, so some of those comments that came back about preserving um, the rural character, we really took to heart when we kind of came back with our subsequent proposal. So um, after that, um, we, you know, we're still kind of exploring this three lot option. Um, the three lots tends to um, complicate the site from a technical standpoint. There's detention that's required at that point. Um, there's the flood control easement, which is that big green line that cuts down the south third of the site. So um, with that plan, the three lots seemed um, less of an option at that point. So we went back to sort of this two lot split concept. Um, where we had um, two equal size lots, um, no detention, we're still maintaining that flood control easement. Um, at the time, we were trying to balance the current zoning regulations, which of course are, you know, the RE zoning, um, the sub-community plan, along with staff and neighbor concerns. So this is kind of the plan we came up with initially. Um, and then flash forward 12 months, we're having this you know, broad community discussion about large lots and how it affects the um, neighborhood. The ADU, ADU ordinance is passed, um, should be in effect at this point, maybe a few weeks. Um, Vine Avenue is almost done. Um, so we're gonna have um, a lot of good um, uh, progress in that RM2, the RL1, and that RE zone district. So. Um, I think you're gonna see a, a real shift in dynamics here in this Crestview East, Crestview East neighborhood, um, which is you know part and part with what we're talking about with the, the large lots here um, to come in this next year. So when we got to planning board in October, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the potential. Um, there was discussion about this pocket neighborhood, um, something like, you know, we've always talked about the Poplar Project. Um, better street frontage, a looping fire road, um, front porches, uh, shared open space. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about ADUs. Um, do we make them bigger? Do we increase the occupancy? Um, and in the end, I think planning board kind of focused on um, the current ADU regs. They liked the sizes that were in the regulations. They liked the saturation limits. Um, but they did up the ADUs to two ADUs per lot, which I think is great. Um, so we came out of that hearing really energized um, with sort of a renewed enthusiasm towards this project. Um, and then in the light of um, recent council hearings, you know, we would really be in favor of um, the changes that we're talking about in this RR and RE zone district. Um, I'm hoping these regulations would really help homeowners to subdivide, subdivide their properties um, and then reduce, you know, minimum lot areas, reduce setbacks, <laughs> eliminate some of the street fringe requirements. Um, in general, we're, we're hopeful that these regs as they come into the, down the pike would um, help sort of create smaller lots and create some uh, more affordable housing in this neighborhood. So we're, we're super excited about bringing this project um, back um, into a subdivision next year. So with that, um, that's my presentation. And I am available to answer questions if you have anything regarding the flood. Thank you. Lisa, of course. Um, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Dan, for your presentation. Thank you. And I'm really excited that you've taken this up. And and um, I, I really am intrigued with the um, Poplar idea going on here. And I know in the planning board disposition, it says that the front doors of all the houses have to face the street, and I'm fine with the ADUs not. But would there be flexibility, I think, at this point to, if if the property owner wanted to, to maybe take what your total square footage is, divide it by X, and come out with a poplar type project, and in that case, the front doors might not 
face the street? Yeah, they might have not have to face the street, but um, you know, if the regs come down next year and there's an opportunity to combine that square footage into separate units, I think we'd be all for that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's a combination of houses and ADUs or straight ADUs or a mix of housing um, like Poplar. Right. Um, I think Poplar has 14 or 16 units. 14. 14, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that the regs would allow something like that that, you know, come 2019, mm -hmm. but I don't... Me too. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Um, okay. Of course, there's always a site review, and I think we could, for five units or more, do a site review on this project to um, create a little more diversity in that No, it's great. That mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. I just want to click, aren't there minimum size requirements for a site review? Can you do one on a the size of a lot? <laughs> Can you repeat your question? Uh, whether you can do a site review on this size lot, I thought it was... Well, it's five DUs or more could be built on this site, and in the case of ADUs, it's um, a dwelling unit is defined as a single-family dwelling unit mm -hmm. um, in this case, so ADUs probably wouldn't be incorporated into that five DUs. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. But I didn't quite get an answer. Would you be able to apply for a site review no, on this? Not in that under, case, no. But, but if I mean, it, no. Yeah, and I just I just wanted to clarify that. I'm also hopeful that we can change the regs and you could bring back an interesting project. But yeah, I, I, I think I in the future, I'm so. sorry if I was confusing you guys, but in the future, if it required a site review, that might be something that's on the table. Yeah. And I'll just add a real quick comment. Um, we're also looking at the site review criteria, mm -hmm. so the criteria could also change. Yeah, but this is great. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Floodplain issues, do you want to? Yeah, you can answer the floodplain. So I, I just, I so, know about So there that. is a flood control easement. We can't do any grading in that easement. Mm -hmm. um, I will say there is some anomalies in the floodplain here. Um, we did some preliminary studies. I'm not too sure if that conveyance zone is actually there. It might be a little further south. So there might be a remapping process that we could enter. Um, that we can go through. Um, any remapping of the floodway needs to go through FEMA for a letter of map revision. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a costly endeavor, um, which is why we're kind of putting it on the back burner right now. So the idea is to kind of preserve that open space, right. uh, maintain the creek, and um, just kind of uh, let nature be nature through there. I love it, thank you. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Other folks signed up for public comment? Maybe you can just call them up. Dennis Beck. And Dennis, you have three minutes, and if you want to give us your address, that would be great. Thank you. I'm 2156 Tamarack. Uh, I'm the uh, author of the uh, second letter that was referenced. Um, I am not as savvy as perhaps everyone in the uh, room around the uh, ADU regulations and such, but uh, I, I will tell you that I, we're supportive as a neighborhood of the uh, two lots uh, that are going to be developed on the property. Uh, the uh, possibility of two ADUs per dwelling seems very inconsistent with the, the, the low density uh, the, the principle behind the low density zoning. Um, most of us who live here appreciate the, in that neighborhood, appreciate the rural character of the neighborhood. As was previously mentioned, it's a, uh, uh, a dead end street. There is insufficient parking for, uh, for six potential dwelling units uh, on that street given the, uh, the frontage that that lot has, and it would have uh, a very adverse uh, impact on the nature of that neighborhood. Now, I don't know if the, uh, if the neighborhood has any um, say in, in a matter such as this, but uh, the general consensus of, of our neighbors is that uh, the six units would almost equal the number of houses that are currently on Tamarack now. So it would really have a profound impact uh, on, on our neighborhood. And, uh, I don't have a, uh, a, a regulatory or, or, or legal ground to stand on, but I, I'm just here to tell you the way uh, the neighbors feel in that, in that area. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Lynn. Lynn Siegel, Mountain Heights. Yeah, um, you know, 
it's kind of a question of who's going to take up the slack in Boulder, and folks that move up to a rural estate kind of area where Dennis is talking about, um, there, there's a number of ways to deal with these situations. Um, but I don't know how well they're being dealt with right now as far as the 15-minute neighborhood and as far as less transportation demand by the type of urban design that you do. Um, and, you know, like, I bought into downtown, which is really expensive, because I wanted to be near to what I already knew, all the, you know, 15-minute neighborhood deals going on. So we missed out, luckily, I think, on that biggest safe way in the United States, <laughs> practically, to go in at North Broadway, and I'm glad it didn't, but as it stands, um, we're not how are we handling base mar you know like the folks the, the college students can't even get to get out to get food that's if you call whole foods cheap you know um, but um, so there's all of those things to consider then there's also the size of the houses and bigger houses like you know Sam are more efficient up to a point maybe maybe it's 5,000 feet, 4,000 feet, then you've got to have two whole furnace systems, two, you know, multiple hot water heaters, what have you. But if you stay within a certain range, I think, of smallness um, within the larger home scenario, then, and you allow more people to utilize the space, um, you know, and I understand the issue of the 7,000, the 10,000 square foot, Dan Caruso's place, 16,000 square feet, you know, two people, the kids are already gone, you know, like this is a lot of really um, prime real estate that they could have had a whole village in. So those things need to be traded off as far as ADUs, how big the ADUs are, you know, um, and the 15-minute neighborhood for transportation. Um, so the energy efficiency of building a small ADU is actually expensive. You know, mine happened to be on my property, so I can't change it. If I could, I'd stick it onto my house and just have more people in my main house. Um, but just thoughts. I know I'm s probably s uh, s stating the obvious, but it's just things to think about. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, with that, we're gonna close the public hearing and I turn back to Council Lisa. So I'd like to make a motion to adopt Ordinance 8301, annexing a 1.29 acre enclave property located at 2140, 2150 Tamarack Avenue with an initial zoning designation of residential estate and allowing for the provisions that we've discussed tonight. Second. Specifically the two ADUs? Mm-hmm. Well, like and also an allowance for them to look at more units. Would you like to speak to that or are we good? Yeah, I'll speak to it. I mean, um, this is my neighborhood or in my neighborhood and um, <coughs> I've lived here for 30 some years and the neighborhood has transformed dramatically and I get it, you know, um, um, change happens, evolution happens, but the scale of the houses that have happened and the character change in the neighborhood it has been dramatic. And so I think what the property owner is proposing is very welcomed, at least from my perspective, and I'm very excited about this potential. And. Um, I think we can do better than build giant houses, and I think that's what this developer is trying to do. So I'm very excited about it. Okay. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to the planning board, who I think did a very careful and thoughtful job of reviewing this proposal, and I think both of their amendments were uh, really well done. I think it makes our job really easy, so I appreciate that. And then I'll, I'll just say to the neighbor about the concern about the ADUs, I understand the concerns, but do keep in mind that the buildings could not be any bigger. So you have the same size building at most, um, just with some 
maybe a separate entrance. It also doesn't change the occupancy. So um, you're actually not allowed to have more unrelated people in the building either. So it gives some different housing options within the same building size, which I think we're trying to encourage in, in town right now. <laughs> On the occupancy, we did discuss in the ADUs oh, we that, didn't we? that um, it, it that has changed as well. And so if there is a family or, you know, you have your mother or somebody, they are included in that ADU as well. Or father. I think that's <laughs> what we passed. Right. Well, yeah, I think because it's, it's that you can have no more than three unrelated people right. where dependents don't count. Right. So that's the difference is right. that the dependents in an ADU don't right. count right. towards the total yeah. maximum. And with respect to the whole car thing, um, there is a planned um, underpass at 19th Street that will go through along um, Two Mile Canyon Creek, I mean Four Mile Canyon Creek, and uh, right now you can walk through there, although somebody has a road close sign there that should be removed, so the city should go out and check that out, because that's a right-of-way for people to walk to school. But, um, and right at 19th Street, you can get on a bus. So we would hope that people would um, leave their cars at home or choose not to have cars, but the fact is that in this neighborhood, you can easily get around without a car using bus or minimize use of car using bus and uh, bikeways and, and pass, so. Okay, anything else needs to be said? That's a roll call vote. We start with Council Member Brockett. Aye. Carlisle. Aye. Grano. Aye. Jones. Aye. Morsell. Aye. Nagel. Aye. Weaver. Aye. Yates. Aye. Young. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Your second public hearing is a post annexation agreement for 1204 Upland Avenue and a second reading of Ordinance 8305 regarding rezoning. Thank you. Yep. Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, is there a way that we could get it on that TV? Great. Thank you. Good evening, members of council. I'm Charles Farrow with the Planning Department. Um, this evening, council is asked to consider uh, the proposed post annexation agreement for the roughly 33,000 square foot property located at 1204 Upland, as well as second reading of a rezoning of the property from residential rural one to residential low two. Before we jump into background and analysis, I wanted to note that all public notice requirements, requirements have been met for the property, including the mailed notice to surrounding property owners within 600 feet of the property. There's always been a posting sign in the property since the time of application, um, and the hearings have also been advertised in the daily camera. Uh, to date, staff has received five correspondences from neighbors. Uh, two were in support of limiting single-family detached homes only on the property, while three were um, in support of additional density, um, duplexes, townhomes, things like that. Um, Planning Board reviewed the proposal on November 1st and recommended that Council approve the post-annexation agreement as well as the rezoning. And then on December 4th, Council approved first reading of the rezoning on the consent agenda. Um, so just quickly with regard to context for those who may be unfamiliar with the area, the Crestview West neighborhood is considered the area between roughly Violet to the north, Tamarack to the south, Broadway to the west, and 19th to the east. Uh, more specifically, the subject property is located at the northeast corner of Broadway and Upland on the western edge of the neighborhood within the North Boulder uh, subcommunity. 
So it's just some really brief background on the Crestview West annexation. The North Boulder subcommunity plan was adopted by council in 1995 and planned for several large scale annexations in North Boulder. Um, as many of you probably remember, the plan is rather detailed. Um, it includes a comprehensive transportation connections plan, a future land use plan, design guidelines, streetscape standards. Um, the other catalyst for annexation at the time uh, was a discovery of a plume of polluted groundwater that was contaminated from the former Centerline Circuits Company in North Boulder. So um, while there's cleanup efforts that occurred in the 90s, it was imperative to get as many properties in North Boulder off of well and septic as possible at the time. So um, that drove some of the annexations as well. Um, while many property owners chose to participate in the neighborhood annexation, some did not. And the reason that some property owners chose not to participate um, was that the annexation agreements included specific property dedications to ensure future connections and public improvements that were consistent with the North Boulder subcommunity plan. Additionally, the agreement um, contained other financial commitments for things like plan investment fees and water tab fees. So um, generally speaking, the benefit of participating in the annexation um, was a slight upzoning where most properties in the neighborhood received some form of subdivision potential. Properties along Broadway received a higher intensity zoning designation of RL2. Um, which was consistent with the North, sub, sub, North, North Boulder subcommunity plan, excuse me. Um, and most of the interior of the neighborhood received RE zoning. So that said, in 1997, when the annexations occurred, it was stipulated that the property owners that didn't participate at the time would be offered the same annexation package as the rest of the neighborhood should they ever choose to annex in the future. Since that time, we've had a few of these that have come forward, um, I believe most recently in 2013. So like I said, um, 1204 Upland was unilaterally annexed in 1997 as they chose not to participate in the larger Crestview West annexation. Uh, the property was granted rural residential one zoning, which is the lowest category residential zoning in the city, while properties uh, around it along Broadway that participated in the annexation received a zoning designation of RL2. So the um, property was eventually connected to utilities. Um, but the result of the RR1 zoning was inconsistency with the underlying Boulder Valley Comprehensive Land Use Designation Map, which I'll discuss in detail in a moment. So as I said, the property is located at the northeast corner of Broadway and Upland. Uh, the proposed property is in total about 33,000 square feet and is already legally subdivided into two lots that are roughly 16,000 square feet each as a result of the Moore subdivision in the 50s. Um, which occurred through the county. Um, nearby lots that participated in the annexation um, have already subdivided over time and have redeveloped over the years, consistent with uh, the annexation agreement as well as the North Boulder subcommunity plan. We're, we've seen connections realized like 12 and a half street as well as the multimodal connection that exists just east of the site that connects um, Upland and Tamarack. Um, So just a few quick images of the site. Um, here's an image from Upland, an image from Broadway looking east. This is an uh, image from Upland looking uh, south, and that's 12 and a half street that you see in the foreground there. And just some context photos of the neighborhood. Um, a mix of newer homes that have redeveloped since the time of annexation and then some existing um, original properties in Crestview from the 50s and 60s. And even a new duplex that's on the corner of Broadway and Tamarack directly behind this property. So just a quick note um, on flood, like much of the city, this property is located in the 100 year floodplain. Um, the existing structure was damaged in the flood of 2013. Um, all new residential development would be uh, required to be elevated two feet above base flood ele elevation. Um, it's important to note that basements wouldn't be permitted here in the 100 year floodplain. Um, and it's likely to assume that the original structure was damaged because it, it wasn't elevated. It's, it's actually pretty low if you go out to the site. So very quickly with regard to land use, as I noted, the current underlying Boulder Valley comprehensive land use designation for the area is low density residential. 
this is defined as the comp plan as the most prevalent land use designation in the city, covering primarily single family neighborhoods where densities are between two and six dwelling units per acre. <coughs> So the current zoning on the property, as I mentioned, is rural residential one. And as you can see, it's a bit of an island surrounded by RL2 zoning. RR1 zoning is defined in the code as zoning for single family detached residential units at low to very low residential densities with a maximum density of 1.4 dwelling units per acre. So considerably less than the two to six dwelling units per acre that's contemplated by the underlying land use. And like I said, the proposed uh, zone district of RL2 is consistent with the existing comp plan land use designation as well as the zoning designations that were given to other properties along Broadway as part of the Crestview West annexation. Um, just wanted to hit the high points of the differences between RR1 and RL2, mainly um, RR1, single family homes are allowed, duplexes are prohibited, townhomes are prohibited, attached housing of any form is prohibited, whereas um, in RL2, all forms of single family and uh, um, duplex townhome um, are allowed uses. Uh, the other thing that I would point out is um, if approved, the proposed post annexation agreement would require a minimum of two lots, so wouldn't allow one single family detached home. If the property were developed now in the RR1 zoning with a single family detached home, um, under the comp plan, I'm sorry, under the compatible development regulations, you could have about an 8,200 square foot home um, on that lot. So under the agreement, the FAR limitation for each of the properties would be 0.25. So if developed under the agreement within RL2, um, across the two roughly 16,000 square foot lots, the maximum structure sizes would be limited to about 4,000 square feet. Um, and as I noted, duplexes, townhomes, things like that um, would be allowed with a maximum of four units on the property. So key issues as identified in the memo, first key issue staff identified was uh, does the rezoning from RR1 to RL2 meet the criteria for rezoning? The second key issue that we raised was whether or not the post annexation agreement was consistent with the terms of the original 1997 uh, Crestview West annexation agreement. So there are six criteria for rezoning, only one needs to be satisfied. In this case, staff found that the proposed rezoning is necessary to come into compliance with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan land use map. Since as I noted, the low density residential land use designation and the existing RR1 zoning are currently inconsistent. Um, really quickly with regards to the uh, terms of the annexation agreement, it replicates the 1997 agreement. Um, there's provisions for access, curb cuts, driveways, um, where those things should be located, easements um, and dedications for future transportation improvements. It addresses ditch rights. There's uh, provisions in there for maximum fen fence heights, um, general building design guidelines and where front doors should face. Um, again, like I said, requires a, a minimum of two platted lots out there um, and imposes an FAR limitation of 0.25. So um, final note, you'll notice that there's no inclusionary housing requirements that are in the agreement. We didn't have inclusionary housing regulations on the books in 1997. So any redevelopment of the site would require that um, the property owner comply with the existing inclusionary housing regulations, um, which would be 20% on site or the cash in lieu option. So with that said, um, there is a illustrative site plan here that the applicant included, probably easier to see on the board in front of you, but this particular uh, scenario illustrates two roughly 4,000 square foot duplexes on either of the lots with parking in the rear um, and two 500 square foot uh, garage, two car garages. So with that said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Lisa. So I have a question about 12th and a half street because mm -hmm. I've never really, se I've seen it because I walk by there all the time, mm -hmm. but it's not um, noted as a walkway. I don't know where it goes. So 
Is it public? So it is public and it's a great point. I'm not sure why it wasn't signed, but Council Member Brockett actually raised that to our attention recently. So there should be signage installed, um, the street sign um, indication as well as the um, symbol for bike ped path and that should be in by the end of the uh, beginning of the year. Excellent. And then with regard to access to the units, um, I assume would they use 12 and a half street to get to the back of the lot? They would. Um, as a matter of fact, the agreement requires that uh, there be no more curb cuts along Broadway, okay. um, and you get one curb cut off of Upland, but it, it really does um, encourage that access be taken from 12 and a half street. And so that driveway would be shared with Correct. everybody. Mm -hmm. And then, um, um, I'm glad about the no basements, and then regarding ADUs, I forget what we did with RL2, so what would these properties be, uh, in addition to their du duplex nature, would they be able to add ADUs? So they wouldn't if they were developed as duplexes. If they were developed as single family homes, they would be eligible. But these duplexes, I assume, would be equally divided. So I think one is like, I forget the square footage, but mm -hmm. anyway, it'd be like each would be about 2,000 square feet. Right. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just following up on 12 and a half street. Um, appreciate the responsiveness from the transportation department about mm -hmm. signing that. I went by there yesterday, not in yet, but we still have time before the end of the year. Um, but one thing I noticed that day and other days um, is that it's not infrequent for people to use 12 and a half street for parking. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if it's possible to get no parking sign along that right of way as well as sure. the bike route sign and the street sign. Mm -hmm. That would be beneficial. I'm sure that when these are developed, the new residents will have less tolerance for that. <laughs> Probably. But, um, still, I think it'd be good to make the point. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Public hearing? No one has signed up. Oh, I assume the... Uh, applicant? Yes. Wait, is the applicant here? The applicant is here, and he was prepared to make some remarks this evening. Come on. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Terry Palmos, and I am the applicant. I'd like to thank Charles and the staff for their presentation, and I'd like to thank City Council for hearing our request this evening. Uh, a little about myself, I was born and raised in Boulder. I'm a second generation real estate developer, and I've spent most of my life working in North Boulder. My family and I own several properties within a few blocks of this location, and it's very important to me that this corner be developed <coughs> appropriately. I've been working with the property owners, Dick and Lois LaFond, for many years. Uh, we currently have the ability to build one large 8,000 square foot house on this site, and I want to be very clear that that is not what we want to do. Instead, myself, the LaFonds, and several neighbors believe that two duplexes on this property is in line with the goals of the community. We'd much rather have four families living on this property instead of one family living in one large house. I've listened to Council's discussions about large homes on large lots, and it's crystal clear that we need to find creative ways to build smaller, more attainable family housing on large lots. In other words, less big houses on big lots and more smaller houses on big lots. I believe our plan meets that goal, and maybe this is a bold statement, but I think that maybe this project can serve as a model for what can be done on large lots in North Boulder. Again, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Questions? No. Oh, all right. Then we're gonna no. Uh, no. We're gonna go to. We have to go to the public hearing. How many people? Lynn has signed up. Lynn, come on up. God, I think I remember Terry Palmos's name blast from the past from here, uh, way long ago. Um, so um, this kind of uh, I'm glad that this. Thing is, two, two two thousands in each one. Okay, because the walls are shared, more efficient. Um, so, like, great. Um, the, the and the large houses. The problem is, you can't get a lot of people to live in the large, large houses. So I understand that there's not um, the same situation with a smaller house where you have more occupancy. Like in my situation, I'd like more occupancy because I can have, it's better use of everything, better use of every faucet, all the embedded energy that goes into every bathroom, every plumbing outlet, every 
uh, you know, the space heating, the long-term space heating for the, you know, for pe the more people that are habituating the space, um, it's, you have, lower bills distributed between more people, so it's more efficient, and more people are warm, more people are sheltered, and we have this huge housing crisis, so in that sense, this is really good. And especially that you have the connected wall. Um, my only point about like a separate living unit is there must be a, um, a specific unit size that's maximal, that, like mine is probably too small to justify, but I bought it that way, and it's stuck there. Um, and I have to put all this infrastructure into it, you know. And not only that, it has to be heated all the time if you have these ADUs. You have to have people residing there all the time. Um, otherwise, you're just turning on all this heat to keep the water from freezing, you know. So that's the idea of the maximum usage. And, and sorry, but Airbnb really can fill this well. Um, but not the way that the Airbnb um, perception is presently, um, because if you can't get the land used in the most easy way with the most people for most of the time, then you might as well not consider that you're even trying to accommodate more people into Boulder's population. Um, so. I support this kind of a project. Thank you, Lynn. With that, we're going to close the public hearing. Lisa wants to make another motion. All very exciting from my perspective. So, sorry, and I've been working on this with other people, but I'm excited. So, anyway, I move to rezone approximately 33,067 square feet of land located at 1204 Upland Avenue in a portion of adjoining right-of-way residential R, R1 to RL2 and setting forth related details. Second. Second. Go ahead. So I'm thrilled about this. This could have been a terrible, ugly, giant, unnecessary 8,000 square foot house. We don't need this and um, the um, property owners originally approached me and asked if I would consider something else. And I was thrilled to meet with them and thrilled that they wanted to do this. Thank you for stepping forward. I completely agree with Mr. Palmos in his comment that we can do better and that we've got to do better with our lots and with our housing availability for our people in this community. And I think um, this can be a model for how we proceed forward um, with our large lots and um, to have four families living here instead of one, much better use of the land. So I am thrilled. I can't say thank you enough for working through this and it wasn't a straight shot. You had to do some work, but I'm thrilled that you did it. So thank you. I would just add that um, in keeping with the North Boulder uh, subcommittee plans um, vision of having a little bit more density along Broadway and this idea of having two duplexes. I'm, I'm glad to see us evolving that way and I do thank you for helping to get there and I do hope it's a model for the future. Right, and, and if I can just say one other thing, they're, they're, they're compatible across Broadway, these two zones, so that's how planning should be. We should have complementary or um, uses of of the same type on um, opposite sides of the street. And I want to thank Mary Young when, um, after I met the owners, I said, Mary, how do we deal with this? And so Mary, having been on planning board, which I haven't been. Um, <laughs> I come um, up a lot. She, she, <laughs> she was able to come up with some ideas and then we went forward. So I really just thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a great development and um, appreciate you looking to serve as a model for the area, which I think you can do. Um, so Terry, I just ask as you move forward that just think about how these duplexes can be beautiful and how they can address the street and how they can integrate into the neighborhood. Because I think this does have the potential to be a model project. So I look forward to see what you all bring forward. Me too. Anything else? Does your motion include approval of the post annexation agreement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, a roll call vote. We start with Council Member Carlisle. Aye. Grano? Aye. Jones? Aye. Orzell? Yes. 
Nagel? Aye. Weaver? Aye. Yates? Aye. Young? Yes. Brockett? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, your third public hearing is second reading of ordinance 8296 um, regarding BC zoning districts. While we bring up the screen, uh, we're gonna start off with our interim planning director, Chris Mestruck. Thanks, Jane. I'm gonna just kick off the presentation here real quick. Chris Mestruck, interim planning director. Um, so good evening, council. Um, Carl Geiler and Charles Farrow um, from the planning department will present this item. Um, and the scope of the project and the purpose really of tonight's hearing is really um, two pieces is what we're looking for. The first is, um, the project as it started was really about some specific revisions to the BC1, BC2 code changes. And in the last few days, we've heard some interest about expanding the scope of those code changes. Um, and so um, based on that, um, Carl's going to describe some of what we've heard so far, and what we're really looking for from Council tonight is really two items, and our recommendation, which is to first adopt Ordinance 8296 um, with any um, kind of specific amendments that you'd like to see um, tonight. And then to also hear about any of the additional code changes that are of interest for the BC1, BC2 um, zone districts, um, including um, ideas around maybe that there's different typologies for some of these zone districts. Um, we wouldn't craft any of those amendments here tonight, but to hear about those, and then we would bring back a work plan for how to achieve those code changes at the pre-retreat study session uh, on um, January 8th. Um, so real quick, I just wanted to give a little planning context, which actually I think will help for this item as well as um, the next public hearing that we have tonight, which is related to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, which is really our guide for um, growth, preservation, and development, as well as our services within the Boulder Valley. And um, the history of our community is that we've really been conscious about what uses go where, um, essentially what's the structure of our community from a planning standpoint and zoning standpoint. We actually refer to that as our city structure, which is the map you see on the screen here. And so we're gonna use some terms tonight um, in both of these next two public hearings where we'll refer to regional centers and neighborhood centers. Our regional centers are our three major activity centers, downtown, the university, and the Boulder Valley Regional Center, which essentially centers around 29th Street. And then we have a scattering of neighborhood centers that are um, smaller in scale, neighborhood serving services um, to each of those neighborhoods, and those are the smaller dots that you can see on the screen. So as we refer to those neighborhood centers, BC1, BC2 are really the centers of some of those neighborhood centers as well. So um, that's some of the quick context. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carl, who's gonna walk through the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, council members. So I'm gonna start with just the background context of this particular project. So the BC zoning project was initiated in July uh, based on some concerns um, about the fact that residential uses are by right uses in the business community zones. Um, if you read the zoning code, the, the purpose statement in those zones is business areas containing retail centers serving a number of neighborhoods where retail type stores predominate. So there was some concern that allowing them as buy a right could be detrimental to that purpose. So with that in mind, we've crafted several ordinances based on this. Uh, the original ordinance was passed on first reading in July by council. Uh, it was crafted in a way that it um, required that residential uses uh, not occur on the ground floor. And it was, it was strictly written as such, and, and if passed, would have created some uh, non-conforming uses throughout the city. So this progressed to uh, planning board on September 6th, where they reviewed the prior iteration 
of the ordinance, there were some concerns uh, on the board about the fact that it would create nonconformities and it was it limited the expansion potential um, of those types of uses. So the board recommended approval of the ordinance, but on a 4-2 vote, um, and they recommended that uh, an ordinance be brought forward to limit the um, the restrictions to the BC2 zone in the Basemar Shopping Center based on the proximity of that area to the university and the growth pressures that exist in that area. So the next step was to take the prior ordinance as well as the BC2 ordinance to the attention of the council. So we uh, discussed this with council on October 2nd where we uh, presented the two ordinances as well as a number of other zoning options on that night. Uh, the council did not pass either of those ordinances. Um, based on the discussion, there was also concern about creating uh, nonconformity. So council at the time had requested that we return with a new ordinance that would allow a little bit more flexibility that would not render uh, uses uh, non-conforming, but also that the scope of the restrictions on the ground floor be expanded to beyond just residential uses and actually look at uses that weren't necessarily neighborhood serving uh, in these areas. So with that in mind, staff um, rewrote the ordinance and went through the use tables to redesignate some uses to incentivize um, uses that would um, be neighborhood serving and then any that were considered non neighborhood serving and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the presentation uh, were designated um, to be above or, uh, the ground floor. Another difference is that it would allow um, an applicant to request use review uh, subject to a new criterion that was context related um, that would allow some flexibility based on differing contexts. So on December 6, Planning Board uh, considered this new ordinance uh, that was passed on first reading in October. Um, the minutes of that meeting are found in attachment D of your packet. Uh, Planning Board, after their discussion, uh, recommended approval of the ordinance on a six to zero vote. Actually, I'll back up here. Um, Coming past that planning board meeting, there were some concerns raised uh, about the opportunity zone, which we'll discuss uh, tonight, as well as some new ideas on how to address the BC zones uh, through a larger process, and I'll touch on that now. So some of the things we've heard from council members uh, from prior meetings and on hotline are just some ideas to be discussed tonight. So the point about BC zones having different typologies throughout the city, uh, ranging from suburban type shopping centers to corridor strip retail uh, to more neighborhood centers, and that perhaps um, rezoning or creation of new zones to fit those typologies is something that the city should look into. Um, each typology may have different land use considerations relative to the appropriateness of, of housing, per, um, for instance. There might be a certain area where housing should be encouraged versus, versus another area where um, retail should be encouraged. There's discussions about limiting the percentage of types of uses based on center size, um, questions about whether there should be requirements for permanently affordable housing. And also looking at maybe incentivizing uh, permanently affordable housing by lowering the per any percent requirements on office or retail or other uses. So these are things that we, we hope to hear from you tonight about. So just looking at the context of business community zones, these are where they're located in the city. We have the Table Mesa Shopping Center. You'll see the red stars appear uh, where these locations are. Basemar Shopping Center in its vicinity. Uh, Meadows Shopping Center. 55th and Arapahoe, Community Plaza, Ideal Market, and Alpine Balsam uh, has BC zoning. There's the North 28th Street corridor, uh, as well as Diagonal Plaza. And then we have Crossroad Commons and, and the vicinity. Um, there are a couple random locations of BC zoning, um, kind of small nodes that exist. There's two on Valmont, there's um, two up in Gun Barrel, uh, there's one on Arapahoe and I think uh, 38th Street, and you can see those locations on, on the map. Question, and that is PUDs. So we have some shopping centers that were developed through a PUD process. So are those included in this or not? Are they, would they be zoned PUDs? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these shopping centers were developed under PUDs, oh, okay. um, consistent with that zoning. 
So I'm just going to go, if I can, Carl, just the, one of those specific ones I was puzzled about. It, the one on East Valmont looks like it's actually part of the Valmont Park. I mean, it's like, in, or at least entirely surrounded by that. Do you know anything about what's going on? I, I have some pictures of it too that might help. I, I'm not sure what the rationale was for, for zoning BC out in that location. I, I believe it was, it, it's an office building out there now. Yeah. And when it was annexed, they, the, the property owners requested that zoning. Okay. And do you know, is that, so that's, it is separate from the, it's the little parcel that includes that one building. It's a fair amount bigger than that one building, but. Okay. So I'm gonna go through a number of slides that show kind of the differing contexts of the, of the BC zones, and I, I can stop if you have questions. So this is the Table Mesa Shopping Center. I think everybody's familiar with that uh, and its context. We have the Basemar Shopping Center. We have a picture of uh, the Moorhead Avenue area uh, that's separate from the shopping center. And we also have the Baseline East project um, east of US 36. Uh, there's the Meadows Shopping Center. Uh, at the top, we have the, the node at uh, 55th and, Ar and Arapaho, which is BC zoning by Conestoga. And then we have the ideal market, community plaza and vicinity, so Alpine Balsam, the d development around the, the, the older hospital. And then moving into North Boulder, there's the North 28th Street corridor, a picture of um, some of the strip mall development that occurs along 28th Street. There's the Safeway up by Iris, and then everybody's familiar with the Diagonal Plaza Shopping Center. Crossroad Commons where Whole Foods is. Um, and then East Whittier, there's a picture here. This is some of the um, few single family homes that have that continue that lotting pattern from Whittier to 28th Street that are under the commercial zoning. Um, so those are single family homes in the BC zones, as well as East Pearl on 28th Street. And this is some of those random locations. The upper left is, is what we were just talking about in, on Valmont. So there's an office building in that location. There's also, um, it looks like a single family house that's boarded up that's, that's in that zone. Um, and then we have up in Gun Barrel, there's the recently rezoned property, which you heard from a, a neighbor on, or the property owner on that. Um, there's the First Bank, uh, which is BC zone up its spine and lookout. Uh, and another node uh, is basically where like the Fate Brewing Company is along uh, Arapaho that's pictured there. So what I'm gonna talk about now is just um, the ordinance that's uh, within your packet, what's included in it. So attachment A includes 82, ordinance 8296. Talk about what it's, um, what's included in it. So in response to city council comments at the last hearing, um, we've gone through the use table to redesignate certain uses that, that we considered to not necessarily be neighbor, neighborhood serving um, as a new B category. And what that does is it means it's an allowable use. It just has to be above the ground floor. Uh, if it's not on the ground floor, there's the option for, for doing a use review. So what that means is if somebody asks for a use review, they'd be subject to the new criterion that would be in the footnotes and that would apply to the use review. And really it's a, it's something to respond to the differing contexts of the BC zones to allow um, the reviewing body or staff to look at the surrounding context to see if it's appropriate to its, its unique context. Um, the other thing about this is that it would not uh, result in any existing uses be being considered uh, non-conforming. So they wouldn't have limited expansion because they have the use review process. So talking a little bit about the rationale, um, these are basically the uses when you go through the use table that would be designated B. Um, we were looking at other uses. Most of the other uses other than the ones listed there would stay as they are. They would be allowed, which is A. Um, or they would continue to be C, which is conditional, or a U already requiring a use review. And then there would be an incentive to do the neighborhood um, serving type uses through the A, so retail, restaurants, personal service types, uh, types of uses. So the rationale of including these other uses as B were, does it, is it a typical use that really serves the surrounding neighborhood? Like do people walk to it from the surrounding 
you know, residential neighborhoods, or is it more of a draw citywide? Is it is a type of use that, that brings people in from further away? That that was kind of what we had in our mind in addition to um, the residential in designating the B. Yeah. Carl, um, one specific one, I, that all makes sense, but one specific one I noticed left unchanged was um, parking lots as a principal use stayed in A, and I wondered, did you look at that? Was that intentional? I, I think we did look at that. I think we didn't want to discourage park and ride type uses. I think that was the reason why we, some of these locations are on the periphery of the city and they could be opportunities for, for park and rides. Well, I'll just note that for council discussion. So based on that, there's a, and based on this discussion tonight, there's a number of, of different options and we're kind of looking at it as three different tiers. So if the council agreed that the attached ordinance um, met the requests and met the, the intent of addressing the concern about residential and other uses in the BC zones, um, the first option is to pass the attached ordinance. Um, that would allow us to stay on our current timeline. Um, the second tier is in the green. These are the these are options related to if there's like tweaks that can be made to the ordinance to accomplish those intents. If it's pretty specific about certain letter changes or restrictions that could be added or that are pretty explicit, um, or if it's very clear conditional use standards that are limited to certain types of uses, we think that that we we would be able to return. Um, next month with a third reading of the ordinance, um, making those tweaks if we get the specific direction. If we move into the third tier, this is uh, a little more complicated. Uh, it would have uh, work plan impl implications that would have to be discussed. Um, we have a, can we pause you for a second? Go ahead, Jill. Just in the green tier, is that where you envision some of these more random properties coming up for exclusion or where? It could be, it might be a little, we'd have to, hearing the comments, obviously we'd have to see what kind of changes would have to be made to the to the ordinance. It might be a little bit difficult to exclude certain zones that are in the same zoning district or sites that could be a little bit more complicated. We'd have to kind of hear the extent of the comments. So it might be a blue? Probably, it, it, it probably be. would, it probably is a blue. Okay. So probably not okay. green. Thank you. Sam? Um, quick question about schedule. <clears throat> you talk about these, if we move quickly on the blue, that we would displace certain um, work plan items. Um, but isn't there a work plan item to do the comp plan action plan? So in other words, we've adopted the comp plan and then rezoning within the, the comp plan policies is something that was coming in 19 and 20, right? Yeah, there, there is a number of work pro action items that come out of the, the BVCP update that relate to looking at neighborhood centers, which is a lot of the BC zones, looking at the regional business zones, BR, um, as well as looking at industrial areas and the, and the uses in those zones. So we have that on the land use code change list, but that was tabulated for like 2019, late 2019 into 2020 to go, you know, potentially longer than that I mean, is a more involved process. So some of these things kind of touch on that and would be like moving up those up the list basically. So if we were to do the green things and maybe make some modifications, as you kind of indicate would be a possibility, um, we could approach it in a way that is a little more um, just focus on the use tables and perhaps a little more restrictive than we would be. And then if you get into like defining new zones and so on, then at that time we could adjust the use tables to fit those contexts. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at if we if we wanted to prioritize the say the neighborhood nodes conversation, then we could do that and have that be earlier on in the comp plan action plan. I think that's a possibility. I think that's what we anticipate. There will be some discussions at the January eighth study session. But again, it would require some reprioritization of, of other co changes. Okay, we're having our discussion. I was just trying to understand. Well, I, right, but. Okay, so if people have clarifying questions, otherwise we're gonna let you finish explaining the blue to us. Okay, so the blue is just basically things we've heard since the planning board meeting as, as ideas of, of things to consider. So if it, there's a more involved um, 
dissection of the use table related to BC zones as far as changing a lot of the, the uses around that, that would be more involved. Um, creation of p potentially new letters in the use table, like if we're looking at doing um, certain percentage restrictions that are different than what we have in the code now, that would take more time. Um, looking at more involved conditional use standards for specified uses beyond a couple targeted uses would take more time. And then we've, we've heard some ideas related to creating uh, new BC zones perhaps based on the typologies we've heard and potentially initiating area plans um, in some of these neighborhood centers because that was like the original um, goal was with the comp plan was to really do area planning around some of these neighborhood centers, figuring out contextually what would make the most sense in those areas based on the differing characteristics of each of the centers and then have the zoning be updated after that to reflect that unique character. And that, that's why those particular projects were set out in 2019, 2020, because we anticipated getting done with some of the other land use code changes and going on to what could be potentially a more complex uh, planning process to tailor the zones. So that's why we put those in the, in the blue category. So with that, um, that's our recommendation is based on the prior direction of council staff is recommending that council adopt uh, the attached ordinance based on the findings within the staff memorandum. And if some of those other options are, are desirable and we need to have a discussion about how that impacts the work plan, we would request that you give us a little bit more information on that and, we, and then we can come back to council um, at the study session in January to, to figure out how all these would be done. So happy to answer any questions. Okay. I think um, maybe put the green and blue slide back up. Okay, now that we can go a little deeper, um, again, qu let's start with questions. Does anybody not understand or wanna clarify, Mary? Well, I have a question with regards how this could proceed in the context of the stuff that's already being worked on, um, like the use tables, for example, and then the, the implementation of the comp plan. In the context of those two, um, if we could do um, something that addresses the, the primary concerns um, behind what drove us doing this in the first place, if we could address that um, and then finish addressing um, other uses within the BC1, BC2 with the use table project and then the bigger picture in terms of the area planning and the typologies, if we could then do that with the BBCP implementation. Um, how, where would that fall? So I think that's part of what we wanted to try and tee up for tonight was, was if you can address any of the things from the primary concerns through the current ordinance that, that is um, up for second reading with any amendments from specific changes that you might want to make to those use tables, changing what's allowed or not, but somewhat narrow in scope. And then based on this discussion of additional changes that you might like to see and what um, whatever happens with the opportunity zone discussion, I think that's really going to call into question much of um, our code change work within the planning department. So what we'd like to then bring back to council on January 8th is here's some options of different ways, different priorities, and how we could staff those to achieve what, what council is looking for, whether that's revising them through the use table project or maybe we actually have a B BC1, BC2 continuation code project that looks at those. Um, some of the, the ideas that we've heard, especially related to some of the housing desires, may take some additional analysis, and it may actually result in code changes outside of the use tables, but within other parameters of um, the zoning code. So that's why we want to bring back an actual proposed approach um, and understand how that might, might trade off with the rest of the work plan. Does that help answer the mm -hmm. question? Thank you. I, I do have a question. S some of these nodes, or what do we call them, centers, seem to be closer or in need of rede redevelopment more than others. I think that's a safe statement. Um, 
And I guess I'm just wondering as we look at, okay, how do we prioritize? There's a few that are ripe for redevelopment that maybe we should make sure that those in particular are set and maybe, I don't know about area planning, but maybe those are higher up with us than other ones. It's more of a longer term. Um, it would be redevelopment that would probably is not on the near-term horizon mm -hmm. or at least next five to 10 years, which doesn't mean we don't want to get ahead of it. It just means maybe there's not a rush. I don't know if that helps at all, but I can think of a few that base, base mar and uh, diagonal plaza, for example, which we should have a community conversation about what we want to see and, and get it out there soon, I would think. More questions? Sorry. Jill and then Aaron and then Lisa. Um, I, I think this plan is really well thought out for the bigger centers. The, um, I ended up kind of obsessing over a lot of these little random nodes <laughs> as we we're looking, and, and we heard from a number of those property owners too, but those, um, I just, I hear that they're kind of fall into the blue, but some of them are so out there that, that you know, like we heard from one property owner, if, if they lose a tenant, you know, that, that that's, re it, it's really tough to, to, to reattract someone for the same use, and then what do they do with it, and do they get caught? I, I would be interested to know if there's a sort of a, a, a way that they could almost, I don't know. <coughs> sneak sneak through the process if that's the case um, and then also uh, I do have concerns about those who are out there that are that have already spent considerable time and money you know planning in accordance with our own rules um, we've heard from folks that have spent more than two hundred thousand dollars and are already in tech doc review but uh, you know might might have to completely just lose that money, and um, so is there anything, and, and some of those are in these small little random places, so is there anything we can do for them, too? Yeah, I mean, when I mentioned it in the mem memorandum, that, like you said, that tech doc review, um, because they don't have a building permit or because they can't benefit from approval of a site review, they would be impacted by any changes beyond, you know, getting into the, the blue areas, obviously. Um, on the, the your first question about you know, is there a way for them to trade out uses, things like that? Anytime, like, a new use review requirement goes into play, the existing uses can continue. It just, it becomes non-conforming effectively. And if a new use, like let's say it was a ground floor office use, as long as a replacement use is of the same characteristics, they can automatically go into that space. It's only when they vacate that space for more than one year that the, app, the property owner would have to come in with a use review. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the council were to up, adopt the ordinance tonight, they would have to come in with a use review to request that office on the ground floor, for instance. Okay. So it may shift then oh, uh, to a more questions for council of would people be willing to exclude some of these smaller ones and almost treat them separately and are people do people have any appetite for those who are already in in tech doc review um, okay Joe would you excuse me be a little more specific about that are you I, I, I didn't really come up with like a areas um, a number but uh, like the the one the one that Aaron well we you had some photos up actually the one that Aaron referenced out near uh, Valmont Bike Park there's one right at the corner of uh, Valmont and uh, Folsom that's the medical center currently that just doesn't really make sense for you know it's not a it's not really going to be a retail uh, center um, across from the 7-Eleven yes yes um, there there was there was a number uh, uh, in our packet. Um, I can, I'll, I'll find them and okay. kind of make a list. But there, you know, I think, uh, I, I really like, I love the idea of your intent around like these bigger centers that they had up there and, and how can we sort of in, um, create vibrant mixed use areas there and preserve that. But then there's just these like random little two acres here and two acres here. There's one out on um, uh, kind of East Pine, um, East-ish, uh, like, 26th and Pine. There's just a bunch of little one-offs that are like, why, why are, why are they in this conversation? Okay, so we got that on the list of things to chew on. We have Aaron and then Lisa. Yeah, so um, thanks. I look forward to talking through those ideas. Um, so following up on Jill's question in terms of so existing properties, they're not they're not non-conforming in a sense because we would have a use review as proposed, right? Allowed. 
but they might still have to go through use review to change things, right? Correct. And, yeah, and so or what, if they expand. What, what's that? Yeah, or if they were to expand, yeah. Right, and so if we take away expansion, I get expansion would require a, a use review. I'm trying to figure out what level of change would trigger that requirement. So for example, some of our use uh, table items are very similar, like offices administrative and offices professional. Right, those are different categories in the use tables. If you had a tenant, if you switch tenants between an administrative office and a professional office, would you be required to go through use review because you were? Uh, you know? Typically not. No, unless the operational characteristics were so radically different. The code actually has a very specific uh, definition on what constitutes the expansion of a non-conforming use. Mm -hmm. um, so unless the operational characteristics were so radically different that you know, it tripped that threshold in the code, um, which typically isn't the case. Okay, so if you were more or less office right now and you transitioned to another tenant that was more or less office, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to go through the process. Right. And also to clarify, I mean, I, it's probably even an overstatement to say that it's, it's non-conforming. It's really just a use that didn't get the approval that it requires under the current code, basically, like, instead of being rendered non-conforming. Instead of it being limited, you, it actually just needs to go through the process mm -hmm. of use review to, to be approved. And and because um, we had an email from the owner in uh, Gun Barrel, uh, 5400 5, Spine, I think, and uh, he or she, forget, uh, was mentioning, well, if I have to go through this process to re-tenant my building, that would be a, a major inconvenience or difficulty. But probably they wouldn't have to do that unless the tenants were very, very different. I mean, as long as they demonstrate that their their characteristics are the same or it doesn't increase any kind of impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. And then to, to, to Suzanne as, and Jill's point, I mean, do we have any limits in terms of our ability to pick out certain areas and apply these rules to them? Like to just kind of geographically say this bit and that bit and the other bit, but not the other ones? Yeah, it, it depends on the scope of the change. I mean, because if we're like isolating certain areas, that's starting to look like creation of new zones or rezoning. And so we'd have to understand the, the extent of it as to whether it could be a relatively straightforward change versus a larger change. And what would, would it have to be larger in order to be okay? Or I, I don't quite know what threshold we'd be working with there. You would need to have a rational basis for making distinctions amongst various parts of town. All right, rational basis, we, we can do that. Come over that. We can rationalize it. <laughs> yeah. Please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bob and then Lisa. I'm going to stay on the string for just a little longer. Um, so two questions, kind of piggy piggybacking on what Jill and Aaron were just talking about. Um, could that rational basis, David, be, because these are all real, the ones we're talking about are really pretty small, could, could size be a rational basis? Could we say anything under, and we would pick a threshold, you know, maybe it's, <laughs> 10,000 feet or 20,000 feet or 1.5 acres, or whatever whatever would capture these four or five or six, um, we, we've been referring to them as odd lots or ones that maybe shouldn't have been in BC in the first place. Could could size um, matter? Yeah, you could, yeah, th that could be a basis, I believe. Okay. Sam, can I colloquy on this real quick? Sure, and then have Just one Just following up on that. Um, so what about the 28th and Pearl corridors in light of that? Because there would be some small, um, lots in there, right, that would be commensurate with the size of the Valmont or the gun barrel portion? You want me to? Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, these are kind of some of the finer points of why there's so much in the blue. But if that is something that the council is um, interested in um, addressing after it hears from the public on this, um, it would be something that we could bring back um, in January. Right. Yeah, just to chime in real quick, I think that's the thought is maybe if, if there's interest in distinguishing amongst these different areas, we can do a deeper dive and understand the characteristics of each of them. Um, and as was brought up, the idea of kind of looking at the typologies and maybe some of these scattered ones, may, maybe BC1 or BC2 isn't even the right zoning for these in the future. Maybe it should be a different zoning district or maybe we should revise and they're a different kind of BC zoning um, be based on their location and what kind of um, um, areas they're serving. Um, they're kind of mini, maybe neighborhood nodes versus the bigger ones. So those are the great sorts of things that we would love to give a little bit more analysis to. So if there's an interest from council based on after your, after the public hearing to go in that direction, that's the sort of thing that we could bring back in a proposal um, in January. 
So just uh, just uh, to close that out then, because I want to understand the difference between blue and green still. Um, so if, if we were somehow able to identify for you soon, like tonight or soon, a handful of things that, that we kind of didn't really want to change, in the short term, didn't want to change their use tables for. Let's say that David got cool with basing that on size. Um, it would seem to me that I, there's a longer term discussion, I understand that, but the, for the short term, for purposes of the big BCs as opposed to the little BCs, I think what we would be proposing is no change to the use tables for the little BCs. In other words, I don't, in the short term, I'm not sure there would have to be a line analysis. We just say just don't change the use tables because presumably the owners are cool with the use tables and they're consistent with the current use and the owners aren't seeking any change. I know that's a short-term fix, but I'm just trying to help you out with your work plan. Does that does that make sense? If we could if we, if we do a DMARC, you know, and I know Sam wants to talk about maybe two buckets or three buckets. But let's say this is the small bucket, the ones, the little odd ones. Uh, I'm sure the delightful properties, I don't mean odd in uh, that way, but I mean just the, the ones that... that that, that we're trying to deal with that Jill referred to. Could we just kind of say no use change tables for these if they're smaller than X and, and, and in the short term deal with them that way? Again, I, I think it's a possibility. I think it's just we'd have to know before moving forward if it's a really quick change to the ordinance to accomplish that or whether it's a more, because even a small type of change like that might necessitate another column in the in the use table that could get a little bit more complicated and we, we have, want to make sure that we're not creating any unintended consequences by making a quick change so it's if it seems like something that we can alter here pretty quickly to accomplish something that's what we've put into the green category okay okay we're just gonna finish yeah. hang on okay is it on this category because otherwise okay. Lisa's in the queue I guess, I guess maybe I'm losing you here I, I thought what Bob was saying was no change. So then you, I guess the way you answered his question made it sound like there was a change still. Well, it sounds like if we're looking at some sort of distinction that would separate out the smaller sites. Yeah, but not require additional work. It would just be those sites are smaller, but they're, they, they stay the same exact. We can, you know, I think that it would be great if when the council has their discussion about this, that they could just articulate what their objective is and we'll figure out how to draft it. Um, okay. but, you know, and, okay. and not try to figure out how to draft it tonight. Yeah. There's probably a, a number of ways and. Right. Okay, Lisa. You okay, so I have some questions about um, typologies and um, the size of the different BCs. And um, certainly the large BCs, Diagonal Plaza, Basemar, all those, I would think perhaps those could be addressed similarly to the way we address the North Boulder Village, where it required um, um, a new, um, some creative um, ginning up of, of new uses. And, um, and in that plan, we also implemented a whole bunch of streets. And so, um, and I think when you look at the holiday um, area, in North Boulder, it's like 24 acres, 26 acres, and I think that's somewhat comparable to Diagonal <laughs> Plaza. And, and when, before that was developed, there weren't any streets out there. I mean, there were minimal amount of streets, and it was um, a big deal to require streets, but what we got out of that was a more urban form and a better use of our land. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if there isn't some way that we could borrow um, some of the uses that were created in the North Boulder plan to make the North Boulder Village or whatever it's called, um, that would make it easier. So that's one question. And I'm, I'm okay to go to my next question, but you can answer it too. <laughs> I guess the way I would respond to that is, you know, the North Boulder you know, development was based on an area planning process that right. was very specific as to the arrangement of uses and, and where roads and, you know, streets mm -hmm. and alleys should go. Uh, and then the BMS zone, the business main street zone was created to create that downtown. Right. Um, so I think the use side of it could be done a little bit easier than doing the other mm -hmm. parts of it. But I think that's what was originally intended for a lot of these neighborhood centers through the, the BVCP update. Mm -hmm. was anticipating that we might have a smaller version of that mm -hmm. North mm -hmm. Boulder process, area planning process to 
tailor each of those those neighborhood centers. Right, I, and I think um, each one of these have different sizes and are on different, some aren't on arterials, some are, and so how you treat the parking and things like that, I think should we might wanna treat separately. Um, so one of the questions I have is, um, because these have different sizes, different <coughs> topologies, um, it seems to me, um, I guess I want some flexibility um, so that if we're trying to get retail on the ground floor, I'm okay with that if we're looking for like at a main street, but when it comes around the building, that we could be a little more flexible in terms of some of the uses. So for example, um, you have a, a, a little shopping center, you have retail on the first floor, but it's deep enough that now you might want a neighborhood office, somebody to come in. And I don't think it would kill what we're trying to uh, achieve, by allowing neighborhood office on that first floor as long as it's not the predominant use. And I think, and I'm not sure about council, but, or we'll discuss this, but um, it seems to me that it's the large job creating centers that we don't want any more of. We're okay with the smaller businesses or smaller offices being able to locate in these places. So I don't want to end up in a complete um, banning of... So what's the question? The question is uh, how you treat the orientation of the building and the use and, and its relationship to the main arterial. I think what you're talking about is something that we've thought about and, and potentially could be handled perhaps in that option number three. Again, if, mm -hmm. we, if we heard from council very specific things that, of intents mm -hmm. that could be laid out as conditional use standards, then we just go into the use table and we make it a C, we refer to a new okay. section, um, and we craft those specific standards. The things that we have to keep in mind though is if we're requiring, for instance, let's say we just require conditional uses for all uses in the BC zone, theoretically. The thing we have to be thinking about is that, considering all the chains out of, changes, uh, changing out of uses or alterations within these retail centers, that could be a massive um, increase in conditional use applications and slow down the process and potentially overburden staff with a lot of applications that we don't have to look at today. So we'd have to kind of understand from council what, to what extent, um, that's why we've put it mm -hmm. in green, but there might be something that's big enough that goes into the blue territory. Okay. And then just, just I'm curious, um, how much do uh, use reviews cost and conditional? I think a use review is about a $4,000. Um, a conditional use is usually about a thousand. Mm -hmm. There are some special ones that have a, a lower fee. Okay, thank you. Oh, one last thing. If if we did housing and we want affordable housing, that's also gonna be dependent on the lot size in terms of developers being able to pencil it out, I think. Um, so I don't think you could and I'm just making it up, but at ideal, I think it would be very difficult if we said, okay, you can have a second story with housing there to require a permanent affordability on that housing just because the site doesn't seem to be large enough to allow that, but that's just a comment. Okay, we just have a few people signed up for public comment on this, so I propose we go to that. I think, and then when we come back, I mean, the, the goal here is how do we get neighborhood, thriving neighborhood nodes that work with also more housing, which is another goal. Okay, so we will come back and discuss how to get there after we hear from those two people. So, Pete, you have three minutes. If you can start with this, your name and address, that would be great. Hey, Pete Weber, 6318 J Road. Um, I am one of the principals at Coburn and um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about mainly the retail piece of what you're considering here. Um, 
You know, I think the impulse that you've got to protect retail and to protect those tax dollars is a good one. Um, but we have to be really careful here. You know, retail, uh, as a planner and designer, retail is a really precious thing. It can't be everywhere in our city. There isn't enough demand for it. Um, we're seeing how that retail landscape is changing drastically right now. So where we kind of spend our retail uses in this city is a really important thing. Um, but what, what we're doing here, what, you, what you've all been doing and what Planning Board talked about is essentially reacting. It's, it's not planning. Um, it's reacting to what you see in front of you. And just the, the um, deliberations that you're going over and what I've seen on the hotline just in the past few days kind of illustrates what happens when that is uh, planning by reaction and not planning by planning. I think there's some unintended consequences that can come out of this. I just wanted to point out a couple of things um, for you to consider um, as you continue to deliberate this. Um, the first is really the, the little guys. We've been working for several months now on a project um, that uh, is, you know, a small residential project, just 13 units with a small commercial space on the ground floor. We've been going through this with you and um, reacting to the changes to the potential ordinance as we've gone along the way. Um, we're in tech doc now on that project and we're still uncertain um, where our feet should be. Um, so um, anything you can do to protect those like us that are in that situation I think would be great. Um, the second thing is the big guys, and I, I spoke at Planning Board about this as well. You know, again, retail is precious, it's, it's, it's tricky, um, and it's changing. Um, and I, you know, with all due respect, the people that are best at understanding retail are the retailers. Um, it's not us. And um, they're the ones that are going to determine where retail is successful and not successful. And to demand retail happen in certain places, I think, is a really dangerous thing. Allowing retail to happen in a lot of places could be a great thing, but demanding it to happen in certain places, I think, is, is, a, is a dangerous thing. Um, again, unintended consequences that, that kind of consequences that can come from that. Um, Liz Payton pointed out um, at Planning Board, she brought up the example of Diagonal Plaza. That's a great example. It is a um, entirely retail um, project now, but it could be something very different in the future. And to say that retail needs to encompass the entire ground floor, just imagine that for a minute. All we're going to get is what's there now. Whereas if we allow um, residential and hopefully a bunch of affordable residential to happen all over that site, but especially at the ground level, think about the south side of that. That is not a retail location. Um, that's a place where we ought to be encouraging residential. So just I ask that you consider some of those things as you go through these further deliberations. Thanks. I have a question for you. Yeah. And that is one of the elusive things that I think we seek in some of these areas is mixed use, which is kind of tricky. And um, I guess my question is, do you have ideas for us how to incentivize the, or set that up well in these nodes? I, I, the whole idea is, I don't think we just want to react. We, these are nodes that I think people treasure and use that we want to keep around as we transition. And the question is, how do you have thoughts about how to get vibrant mixed use that retains the neighborhood serving retail aspect of that better than we have in our current code? Well, um, things that would encourage residential, which, which you have in most of those places, is commercial. It is retail. So we already have that. So I think the question is how do you incentivize the residential? And so change to the zone that would incentivize further residential could lead down that road. I remember going through a process on Table Mesa years ago, and there was a um, it wasn't a, I don't think it was a city driven process, but it was more of a planning exercise. And how do we get, how could we incentivize um, residential to happen in the Table Mesa Shopping Center um, because we already have the retail. Now how can we get the other, the other uses in there? Well, I think, uh, how do we get both, right? Sure, sure. And now I one guess is that's the tricky thing. Of the it's other. not one or the other necessarily. Okay, somebody else, Bob has a question. Uh, Pete, thanks. Can you remind us of the address of the one that's in Tech Doc? It's uh, 2718 Pine. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks. That wouldn't. Thanks. Anything else for Peter? It's not going to be. Thank you. We want to exempt. Andrea.
Good evening, Andrea Menegel here speaking on behalf of the Boulder Chamber, 2440 Pearl Street. Um, and so the Boulder Chamber sent you a letter yesterday uh, outlining some of the ways that we're looking at this. And so it's nice tonight to see some of the additional flexibility that staff's bringing to the conversation for your consideration. Um, it's nice to see where your questions are going. I think that's kind of what we're looking for. Basically, neighborhood serving retail is important. Yes, of course, it's important to preserve uh, commercial spaces in some of these business districts. Of course, creating affordable commercial is important, and that's a good thing, too. Um, but housing is also important. It's our number one goal that we're trying to get to. And um, there's too little of it. So creating those flexibilities in some of these places, that Pine Street example is perfect. It's in one of these locations where you have access to transit, you have access to commercial services right there. But these are the little things that are getting caught up in the broader policy of it all. So with that being said, um, those impacts on the smaller projects, those are real. And those are projects that people had planned for a very long time to try to deliver things that they thought were our goals, but gets dissuaded when we go broader with this policy that hits all of these areas. So more flexibility, more thought, that's what we're looking for. Uh, this thing about going to use review, a lot of times from the folks I'm hearing from, that's a detriment. You know, it kills 80% of the deals that are out there when they know that they could be triggering additional requirements and things coming out of there that are adding time and cost to projects. So we urge you, work with the property owners. Um, there's all kinds of parcels out there, big, small, but the impacts from broad policy really hits the small guys. They feasibly can't achieve ground floor retail in some of the places that this would then dictate it has to be. And um, it's those small parcels, the two, three acres or less, those are the ones I'm talking about. So instead of um, a broader rule, you know, I would I wish that the retail study was already in place to inform some of these decisions. We'd have good information from that. Uh, but we urge council, keep taking a measured approach to this. Keep looking for where those flexibilities lie and try to get something that gets us to all our goals. Thanks. Thank you. Lynn. Lynn Siegel, Mountain View Heights. Um, this is really, really interesting to think about. I'm glad you're thinking about going to urban design school, Jill. Um, yeah, it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And this is where you really have a, a space to like think about how you want to design your community versus how the community naturally evolves. Um, so it's great. Um, I like the idea of, of little nodes and smaller, better. And I like your idea, Lisa, of the offices going into the back or somehow um, bleeding into the back of all of these fronts. Um, you have to think about what, are, what, is the, what is the housing upstairs for anyway? Maybe there should be a commercial upstairs. Um, although that would intu intuitively, you know, happen. But um, one thing that's really disturbed me this week, managers closing. That, that is horrific for this community. You know, I'm from Seattle. The, the main art hardware store we had was on the campus. It, there, ha there have to be nodes in town where you have themes. And University Hill is not even on, in the BC, right? It's not one of the, yeah, that's, <coughs> why is that? That's kind of weird. Um, let's see, um, I think there could be a whole lot more specificity of the types of businesses, like instead of, um, you know, the, a, a general, something more like the art hardware store, like Menninger's, that, that's, um, really concerning. Um, where are, where are you going to stick? M managers now up in North Boulder because that's not very central. Um, you want, like, all of this should be distributive, just like energy, it should be distributive. Where are everybody going? Where are people going? Um, you should be wanting to go to other parts of town that have an interesting theme occasionally, but when you're at home every day, you need your basic needs met. Those needs are changing all the time. You know, more 
loaded people would maybe want uh, dry cleaners in their area, but really specific things that people need in their area. Little hardware stores all over. Like, what if, you know, Menager is closing, what if McGuckin's closes? Shaste, you know, we uh, this community can't afford that. And meantime, in Seattle, we had Puget Consumers Co-op, this huge co-op that was like McGuckins, okay? But the little co-ops, there need to be little. It needs to be distributive. I don't know how to say it specifically, but no, that's got the it. idea. Got it. Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, with that, we're going to close public comment, and we're going to turn back to council. Um, Okay, so we have some near term and longer term. And I guess, uh, I think it would be useful to get a sense from council about whether we are interested in trying to pass an ordinance tonight or not, or whether we're going to just give directions and I don't wanna say punt it to January, but have them shape, staff shape more, a larger vision for January. Sam. I'm in favor of the latter. I, I mean, I've looked at this as a work session mostly where we would just exchange ideas and maybe give some direction to staff and get more specific later. I mean, my impression is staff's done a really nice job here with adding flexibility to it with these type of use reviews and, and so that's my opinion. Okay. Does, it, uh, does that sum up? Okay. Oh, go ahead. I just want to remind everyone that this came about because the economic circumstances within this community are changing so radically that one of the things that is happening is that small retail, small services are being driven out and being replaced with things that make the investors a whole lot of money. And so that was the reason that this was brought forward, Mirabai and I brought this forward, was the idea it may be reactive, but it's also planning in the sense of trying to keep the community integrated so that the by right use of housing and or office couldn't just happen across the BC one and two zones because that's not really what they're for. And they were able to be done by right at that time. So my concern is that, that we look at this, we can't mandate what retail is in where, but we can try to protect the spaces so that it can be there, particularly when they're, um, it's commensurate to a, the so-called 15-minute neighborhood. And Basemar is one of those prime examples. Yeah. The area across from Williams Village, if, which is used by people across the city as well as students. I mean, these are serving, retail serving in, in a good way. So I, just as a reminder, no, but we, why we're doing this. Yes, yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, so we'll treat tonight as a work session, probably continue this forward and give some direction. So let's start painting the picture. Um, do you want to? Yeah, okay. I'd like to jump in here. I want to paint a picture that's a, a place that I visited in Palo Alto, okay? And it, I was needed some groceries, so I went down to a Safeway um, that had clearly been a one story uh, Safeway with an ocean of parking lot around it. And what it was now was a two-story Safeway that had a wrap of a parking garage around it, and much of the surface parking was occupied along the main street there, I think it was Camino del Real, and it had restaurants and, you know, small stores like Trader Joe's, and then back behind it, as you went deeper into the site, there were new apartment buildings that were clearly, you know, within a year or two that they had been put up. And so I think when we have enough space to work with, that that's kind of a, an urban form that keeps our retail and keeps our restaurants, but also allows more housing. Another way is that, so that's kind of horizontally separated and you had like half retail on site and half housing. Then there's on smaller sites, maybe you can do vertical separation where it's retail on the ground floor and um, housing uh, on the upper floor. I, I agree with what, Cindy said there was a reason to look at this sooner than later, even if it meant that we weren't going to get everything completed until a year passed because we didn't want, for instance, student housing to come in at Basemar or a hotel to come in at the Baseline Zero site. You know, there, there was some urgency to this, hence why we, we kicked it off. Um, I have talked with 
probably a lot of you and staff, I really think these aren't configured right. We have BC1 and BC2. You look up in Gun Barrel, and there's a BC1 and two BC2s up there, right? And and they're small, and they don't have much in common <laughs> with the shopping centers, Baseline Zero, um, <clears throat> Table Mesa, the Meadows, all of those. And when I talk to some of the planners um, in the private practice, they're like, yeah, you just put in internal streets in there, right? And you could have less retail on the bigger sites fundamentally because you have internal streets now and they have different frontages than they did before and then you know i've been thinking as the sites get bigger you could require less retail and even less if affordable housing is put on site so there's you know so i think less by way of percentage less by way of percentage of retail right as the site gets bigger and then as as you get more community benefits that you want, maybe even the retail goes down. But I think it's critical that by the time we're done with this conversation, that we have broken things up into logical buckets, like the big centers in one bucket. And then, you know, it's nice that we have BC along 28th and Pearl, right? And Aaron had suggested, and we can talk about this more, that some of that should be able to go to housing. But since you'd want like a complete development, a complete lot to be all housing, then maybe only a fraction of that should go to housing so that you preserve some of the retail. But that's different because there's lots of little lots. And then you've got 55th and Arapahoe and um, uh, the ideal market shopping centers, those, they've already got their streets, right? They're, if they redevelop, they're not gonna redevelop in the same way so they could have different use tables and be in their own zone district. And then all these little scattered things, I don't even know if they need to be in this zone, but if they do, it could be a fourth. So I just wanted to describe that you know, kind of out loud when um, we're here at the meeting. So I think that's the long-term vision I would see is getting the zoning right and adapting the use tables for it. I think a short-term thing we can do is continue on with what staff has teed up for us. Um, the unfortunate thing about, I, I kind of really do agree that I would like this not to apply to the, the small sites that are scattered, but it's how do we do that? Because a lot of these changes that would protect the big sites from potentially going to all a monoculture, um, we still wanna get those done before our pending ordinance thing runs out. So I, we're in a bit of a conundrum and that, that's just my thoughts, so. Is there, and you don't yet have a solution for us on that issue, never mind. We already tried there. Okay. D David, David said he would do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious. Well, okay. Uh, I was going to start seeing which part of this people agree with, but do people have some other, one to flesh this out further? Or Can, can I, yeah, maybe um, respond to that a little bit? Because I I, what I heard from staff was you all figure out a little bit what direction you want to go in, and then we'll figure out what how we might process that in terms of, ordinances and next steps and things like that. So um, I think Sam, that was that was well articulated. And, and just to say a little bit more about some of those ideas, I, to me, the it's the uh, neighborhood shopping centers in particular that we want to protect as mixed use centers, but make sure that they have retail. I mean, that that if, if Basemar or the ideal market area became 100% housing, that would be a huge loss to the kind of 15 minute neighborhood character of those areas. And so there, there are those that I think it's it's really important to put some kind of protections in, and and then there are others of these that that's that are more of the central commercial areas, like the um, along Pearl Street and the Folsom area, or along 28th Street um, north from there, that I think support more of a mix of uses. That certainly some retail in there is important, but I think more housing is is good there. Just to remind everybody about what a critical need for housing that we have in this town, not that people need reminding, but just to make the point and how we don't want to, I'm really concerned about disincentivizing housing too much. So so I, I, I personally I like the idea of coming out of this project and changing up the zoning some and, and so something more like neighborhood commercial zone versus central commercial zone. Um, and then like you say, Sam, you know, take some of these little things and do something else entirely with them or, something like that. So I, I, I'd love to see it, some some rezoning come out of this project. And then, and then for me in terms of, I, I worry about catching people up um, who've been working on planning things that could be very good projects um, if they're not um, 
if it's not necessary. So if there's a way, this is what I was talking about before about, um, you know, what, what could, how could we section this out? And so if there's a way for us to say, okay, uh, the neighborhood retail centers, we go ahead and do something in the shorter term, and then the rest of it, we allow to stay more or less the same or maybe the same until we finish the larger project. That would be a direction I'd be interested in going in. Okay, I got a cue. We have Mary Mirabai, Jill, Lisa. So I, I agree with, with Sam's assessment of and description of all these different little um, centers and that they do have different typologies. Um, however, um, I do think that we need to, as Cindy brought up, remember why this came up. And um, I would, I am interested in kind of going in the green zone um, for the short term and then letting some of this play out um, through the planned comp plan implementation changes. So what, um, what I would like to see happen is when, one of the, the things that I saw that could still occur in the BC1, BC2 um, in, um, in our memo was that there could still be um, hotel and office. And, and hearing um, Lisa talk about the small offices, maybe what needs to happen is that we have, we can allow office, but it is, um, um, as Sam termed it, sole proprietorship smaller, and it could be addressed with something like office space, but less than X number of square footage or something like that. And hotels, um, I don't know why we need hotels. That would be the, the more frightening thing, uh, consequence that could happen over at um, the, the ideal shopping center, full disclosure, that's my neighborhood. Um, but I think that, that the uses, um, as far as the uses, look to places like ideal and, um, and the Table Mesa area where it's functioning really well. And as Lynn said, that there's the, there's the, the high dollar people that need a dry cleaners but right next door to that is a laundromat um, where um, that serves, you know, so it serves um, a whole bunch of people. There's a whole bunch of uses there, and it's very, very, very functional in terms of places that people can walk to. So I would hate to see that um, go to hotel or office spaces. I could see housing on the second floor. Um, so I think we can tweak what, what is in the memo by addressing things like um, the allowance of hotel and office currently still um, into the ordinance as proposed. And then I have a whole bunch of other questions where, um, for instance, um, um, private educational facilities are Bs and then adult education facilities are As. And I don't understand why that is. Um, but, but those are the kinds of things that I think could be addressed and tweaked. Um, and then, you know, addressing the, the other big zones with area pl uh, plans and, and further down the road. Um, as long as we take care of the reasons we took this on in the first place, which was make sure that we don't get these areas replaced by hotels and office space. Mirabai. So Mary just took a lot of what I was going to mention in terms of the hotels and office space on the second and third floor. Um, but I will just say from the initial thoughts of what uh, Cindy and I were looking for here, again, I was looking more to cover six or seven of the locations that are on our maps um, and not having all the, as Bob said, the peculiar <laughs> Uh, areas caught up in this. Uh, that was, I don't think, at least it was not my intention. I don't think it was Cindy's either. Um, so again, if we can figure out a way to discern between the two, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> I think that <clears throat> we have to remember here that we're not disincentivizing housing because we're hoping, I'm hoping to have it on the second and third floor and especially find some really good moderate um, middle income and low income housing, affordable housing uh, to be in these locations. And one of the thoughts that we could do is kind of similar to what Europe does where you have the neighborhood serving retail on the bottom floor. The middle floor could be these smaller offices or studios. So it could be an art studio. It could be somewhere where someone gives music lessons or art lessons. Um, 
and then they live on the top floor. So they, you know, live on the top floor, go to work on the middle floor, and go to their neighborhood serving retail on the bottom hood floor. No, but, sorry, bottom floor. Anyways, so that was, you know, really my intention in creating these wonderful areas where you don't even really need to get in your car. So that's that's where I'd like to see it go. And again, I would like to try to release some of these little nodes that um, are being affected. Jill. <laughs> Mirabai, that's a really well articulated vision. I think it's really cool. Um, and and, and um, I agree with, with everything you just articulated. And um, it seems like maybe what what we could do based on like your suggestion, Aaron, and what you're saying, Mirabai, is instead of picking out places we don't want, just identify the, the big centers we, we do. Um, and then I think staff, um, you know, has heard the vision, and and it doesn't necessarily. I, at least from my perspective, I, I really liked what the first speakers had to say. That um, you know, we, a requirement that it, all ground floor is all retail may not make sense. Like in Diagonal Plaza on that south side, that's right. It's it's you know facing over uh, to residential, but uh, you know, you guys are the planners, and we we leave it in your hands. Um, but I just wanted to kind of echo what, what I think both of you guys are saying is let's let's pick out the places we do want and maybe just leave the other ones alone. And um, f one final recommendation, because um, I, th I think I've heard agreement from other council members that those who are already in the process, they, they'd like to maybe exempt. And I guess I just want to throw out there that, it, that we could use tech doc as that defining line. Um, if there's another defining line that you guys like better, that's a, I'm open to it. But if, if they've gone as far as tech doc review, I think maybe we leave them alone. Lisa. Well, it sounds to me we're pretty much all in agreement here. And um, I think what people are saying is um, what I would um, reflect as well. I think we want to make sure we get what we want. And um, I think there is a big difference between the larger parcels and the smaller parcels. And um, I think, um, I don't know what would be the threshold, but I would be interested in maybe not including some of these smaller um, sites right now. I think they, they're functional, they serve their purpose, and they're, um, they're great for the neighborhood. Um, I am not interested if, if somebody's already in tech docs on tripping them up at all. So I would go forward with that. And one of the things, um, I think Pete Weber made uh, a good point about, you know, um, certainly on a lot the size of Diagonal Plaza, you don't want retail on all the first floor, and we don't want so much parking either. So what we need there is a lot of housing. And, um, but I think it's really important that we just don't throw it in, but that it has an urban form. And so it needs to have some kind of um, city streets and things like that. And so that's what I would like to focus on. I don't know, um, I'm pretty much happy just staying in the green. Um, my only concern with um, smaller parcels, um, like Ideal or VIX, no longer VIX, um, uh, some of these smaller ones is how do you accommodate parking? And so I think those ones are on Broadway. I would hope we don't have to talk about parking and that we have parking maximums. and that the fact that you have a frequent bus going up and down uh, multiple routes um, should suffice to replace parking. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm happy to use this as a, just a work session and move forward and ask staff to come back with the lar um, some thoughts on the larger, but I'm also not interested in um, leaving some of the projects we're already um, working on, and I want to continue on those projects, so. Okay, Mary, we had something to add, and then Bob. No, I just, um, it, with respect to the tech docs that you just mentioned, there is a precedent for using that as the cutoff point, and David, if there was, I can't remember what it was, but it was, it, it was more complicated than it sounds. Or yeah, in yeah, and um, I've drafted some language, if you guys, when you guys get to time, 
that we can um, that you can consider. And um, I think that the, time, the the instance that you're thinking about was when we were um, phasing in the impact fees. Yes, we, that's it. Um, exactly. Did a similar thing uh -huh. um, with tech docs for that as well. Bob. So I think we are in agreement, um, but let's really play it back to see if we are. I, it feels to me like there's kind of small, medium, and large, right? We have um, we have large, right? So that's diagonal, and this is not going to be exhaustive. T uh, diagonal Plaza, Base Mar, Table Mesa, the really, really big spaces. And I think there's a recognition that the really big spaces, there may be, there may be, uh, I'm going to just use Diagonal Plaza as an example, there may be a place in those things for some housing, right, and some internal streets and, and with the focus on retail. Then we have the mediums, and I guess I, I'd use like Ideal Market maybe as an example of that, where I think we do want to try to really emphasize retail there, right? Now, whether there's any housing in there, I don't know, but I think those are very successful retail complexes. They're kind of medium sized, they kind of sustain themselves. And then we have all the rest, which I guess I call the smalls, the ones we, I think we all don't want to disturb. They probably shouldn't have been in BC in the first place, but here we are. And I think we're, we're probably not wanting to change the use tables with respect to those because those properties are happy properties and they're not threatening some of the things that we want. Some of them are residential, some of them are commercial, but it kind of doesn't matter because they kind of work, right? And they're not big impacting. Is that kind of- Wait, I, What about quarters? Yeah, I was, I was gonna- well, well, maybe, I would put quarters actually in the medium size, but no, but, but, may, not, but maybe it's large. But they're not centers. They're <laughs> You're right, they're not centers, yeah. So the, they could be in either, either category. You guys, we can talk a little bit about that. I, I, I propose in the future, they'd be their own category. Well, so, right? so in the future, maybe. I, I'm trying to get us through, because I think we're all trying to get right. done in green without going too deep into the blue. So I'm trying to oversimplify intentionally, and so we can have a discussion about whether they should be in in the in the the large or the or the mediums but i do think that we owe it to staff um to be somewhat precise here on pro on a property by property basis because i wouldn't want them to go off and draft this over the holidays and come back on january 15th and we say oh that's not really what we meant so i, I would okay, suggest well, we we'll take a few try, minutes I'll to do that we'll try to do that yep. do you have any did you have you haven't said what you think i agree with you guys all i think okay. we're i think we're very well in aligned i think we just need to categorize can, can I call a quick? Yeah. The, the thing that, that's tough on, on the sizes is that I think it's more the size of the center rather than the parcels. And and so like I just zoomed into the base mar here and there's a, a main parcel that we think of as base mar, but then there's a bunch of little ones right around it, but that I think you'd think of as that neighborhood center. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I'm challenged in terms of how we spec this out because I, I, I kind of want to draw circles around them on the map uh, and because if we go by parcel size, I don't think it's going to guess what we're yeah, looking there, at. There are some examples in the zoning code of appendix maps where r certain rules apply and then others don't. So that's an approach we could take geographically. Again, I appreciate, you know, if we get some input that's precise about certain areas to leave out of it, but we, we could create a map that shows the main centers and excludes the smaller sites to apply this. And, and if I could call it, the goal would be to get rid of that map in a year or two, <laughs> right? Yeah. Where we've got the zone districts right and that's not a, but that might be a way out. Mm -hmm. Right. So let, let's go ahead and articulate, uh, let's go ahead and articulate those then. Yes, let's. Let's, and you guys write them down. So one is base mar, the larger base mar. Great, greater base mar. You mean geographically? Do you mean north? Are you calling north stuff? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we started Table Mesa then. Okay, starting at the south. Table Mesa. Okay. Shopping center. Yep. Yeah. Now I'm going to look on your map. Okay, hang on. I'll have it up in a moment. Um, no, I got okay, it. so that goes in the big bucket. Okay. Yeah. And then base bar. And, yep. We, and base mar includes all of that BC1. Base on zero, BC base zero. mar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Greater okay. base. Meadows is over here. Yep, mm -hmm. Meadows. And then um, 55th and Arapaho, all the stuff around there. Yep. So that's one of those zones, but that is different in that it doesn't have a big shot. It that's a high functioning neighborhood. Yes. I think that's uh, a little different. different. I think well, that might uh, but let me, let me explain the thought um, yeah. just briefly. Okay. It, the stuff on the since I'm out there all the time, north side stuff on the north side, not only does it need to be redeveloped, but it um, could be redeveloped into something we don't want. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I would throw that one in is I would consider that to be potentially at risk because it's a large enough land area that you could do something like hotels or offices there. Why 
if I may call it, we just, um, the, that one at 55th and Arapaho is actually two typologies. Mm -hmm. There's one typology north of Arapaho and another one that is more of a highly functional neighborhood center on the south side. On the Coniston. So there's, there's yeah. two different kinds right there. It has nothing so, to do with size. And, and if I could chime in, I totally agree with you, Mary. But I, th I think that my point would be that that whole area should stay a, a neighborhood retail sure. center sure. of one kind. Yeah, and I, I think what we're trying to do here is get the stuff we want in the short-term protection named. Is that right? Mm -hmm. People agree with that? So if that's what we're trying to do, I would like that one in there for now. Okay, well, but notice that, but note that one's a hybrid, so that one, but still, okay. That one doesn't fit into our big medium category so well. No. So. Then another one that is, uh, is the ideal market, you know, that's a medium category. Yep. That's highly functional neighbor. Highly functional, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then there's the question of what we want to do with the Pearl and um, 28th Corridor, right? So all of this stuff there. From, from my standpoint, you could see all the stuff along 28th. I mean, we've seen a lot of hotel activity and so on in there recently. Um, no, actually, it's a little south of there. Um, so I don't know. Do you have a suggestion, Aaron? Well, you well so I, I do. I do a little bit because one thing we might consider is, is I mean, we could just say that hotels are not a good use yeah, of these zones that's entirely, what I'm and then not worry about hotels. Per yeah, se. just and, and, okay. And, and then and then limit it a little bit more. So I might just look to the diagonal plaza area rather than all uh, rather than all of 28th and Pearl quarters. Because well, I, I think those are some good places for housing. I think the diagonal is the last one. Um, of the big ones. Right, and okay, but uh, so, okay, so maybe we just say we have enough hotels. Um, I'm not the, saying necessarily citywide, but in these zones. Yeah, that's what we're talking about, right. Not, these are um, neighborhood. I would say that, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> okay, but we're, but, okay, we're gonna focus tonight, um, but I'm not sure, the corridors part, I'm not sure if I understand the resolution on Pearl and 28th. So my proposal is to not include them in the short term uh, blockages to just include the diagonal plaza area. And so when you say diagonal plaza, you mean on um, like the diagonal plaza side, the Safeway side, and the um, little plaza on the northwest corner? No. No, just diagonal plaza itself. Just east of it, it's Okay. Yeah, it's it's a neighborhood center. It's a designated neighborhood center if you look in the comp plan. Okay. And that diagonal plaza itself, and then um, the rest of it is sort of, um, it's very different from everything else. Um, Why is it different than everything else? Because it's along a corridor. As um, which one are you? Talking but that strip about? mall where that's that's the that's the one that goes along 28th Street. Well, I would I would say 28th Street. The Safeway at 28th Street and Iris is more comparable to Ideal Market. It's a true core <laughs> functional retail center. But we are mm -hmm. taking steps to protect those in the short term now. Right, I was just categorizing. I was okay. talking about the okay. treatment. Yeah, okay, well, so that one to me is another hybrid. I'll just note so, for whatever that's worth. So, and I, I think we're we're going to have a, a place, time when we pass an <coughs> ordinance. We could get the exact details at that time. Well, if we want to, we might take a little more time on another hearing to go to specific lines on in that area. So okay, so we have. The buckets. No, did we did we say where the one in Gumbarrel, the ones in Gumbarrel? No, nope. no. I I don't think that they are. Um, they're too. They're their office and. I, I but don't we want to create more nodes there? Isn't that one where we want to envision? Are those the properties that would do that? Well, they're BC one and two. Well, true, but they're. Isn't that our best opportunity to create nodes? I, I don't know the typology as well. Would it be possible to bring up the um, context pictures for Gun Barrel? Sam, I mean, I can tell you where the good neighborhood, but I'd have to probably be rezoned because the area right now that is serving the neighborhood is kind of being established because of all the new apartments. And I don't think that area is actually zoned that way into the BC 1 and 2. So, so that's what's currently on the left and the right there, spine and lookout, that's what's currently the BC mm -hmm. one and two. Yep. Mm. And, and that's what I'm saying, so p p the parts, I mean, if we want to protect First Bank, but I don't see that leaving anytime soon. 
there's apartments all back in there, the Apex Apartments, and they have some ground floor retail now, um, but then it's further up and across That's the street. That's RH zoning. It just doesn't seem to me like these are good. Okay, we might put it on the list of, hey, maybe we should help Gumboro out by figuring out to help them get some nodes, but. When we do the rezoning, maybe. When we do the rezoning. Okay, so we've typologized these. Um, okay, in the near term, amending the use tables. We, we talked a little bit about hotels. There are other specific things we want to direct staff around. I have a short list of questions. I thought mostly it was very good. Um, I thought both the change to provide flexibility and what you designated. Here are some that I was curious why they ended up in the allowed bucket and not the review or second floor use bucket. Schools, government facilities, museums, churches, indoor rec facility, especially business support services and parking. And I heard parking from Aaron as well. So those were some of, I thought most of the others were good um, designations. Could I add to your list? Yeah, sure. Wait, uh, are we looking for responses for them? Or are we just for making suggestions? Uh, I'd like a response just out of curiosity, what the <laughs> thought process was, and then um, <coughs> to discuss. Okay, well, so let's just bite these off real quick. Which is the first one? Well, schools, public and private, were both straight allowed. And then, as okay. Mary said, adult education, I believe, was a reviewed use. Right. They're, the adult ed education, both sizes, were reviewed. I think the thinking on schools is that there are educational uses and that they're beneficial for neighborhoods. You could have a neighborhood or elementary school, you know, that is could be part of a neighborhood center. So I think in looking at the different educational uses, we figured those should be incentivized. We, we looked at private a little bit differently because that might be a draw from another, it might be a specialized school that draws people from outside the community. So we looked at that a little bit different. So I guess one of the things that will be a theme here in this is we're, if we're looking at the big centers, that that's kind of what we're gonna, do, gonna focus a discussion on just for doing it. Um, would, you ha would you want schools to be more than a certain percentage. So I think one of the challenges with the allowed use is that you could do like a great deal of something there. You know, whatever it was, it could be large or even most of the project. And so maybe another way to think about this is we want some of these institutional type uses to be a, a small fraction. You know, like uh, talking about office uh, for like architects and massage therapists and so on, that, that, those could be 10% of the FAR. And then you make sure that those uses don't dominate so we don't end up with the baseline zero kind of proposal where it's all class A office and a hotel. So maybe that would be food for thought is that you're right, we don't want to not have them, but whatever, we don't want them dominant. Like we wouldn't want the city of Boulder to come in and put in a government center <coughs> at base R. Only we had control over that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, does that mean creating a new letter? that it has percentages, or is there already one that says can only be a minor use? I think what you're talking about looks like a new letter. Um, it would be a different percentage. Uh, and if we were going down that road, we would just request, if we were to do a new letter and a new percentage, whether there would be the flexibility of asking for a use review to have a different percentage. Well, I mean, I thought that was the way that you threaded the needle before that was so nice was you just made them bees and you did a use review for them and then it's your judgment as to how this meets the goals from the comp plan and the zone definition. So I would be just comfortable having them be the um, conditional use review the, or... Or the B, or the way the... Yeah, like the offices. bees, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, those were principles who's articulating, but the, you just do a B just like you do the others. Well, again, if we're just talking about a percentage limitation and then... I, I could take the percentage away and just have it be staff judgment. Can only be a minor use. Well, I, one of the things that I'd like to um, get into when we pass the final ordinance is the criteria that would be used for the use review, mm -hmm. where I think we could articulate things like that. We could have the exact language and also some intent statements. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something that we can also revisit. I like that. part of a final order. And maybe get some some um, language 
um, suggestions from staff. So I guess what you're hearing, I think, just to speed this along, is we'd like a category, and it could be maybe conditional, for a bunch of uses that we wouldn't want to predominate, but should be, it could be allowed, and that we rewrite, we rewrite some criteria around that. <laughs> Do people agree with that? I, I thought that they could be Bs, like Aaron said, Did and it? then we could have the criteria for the review under the B if they're going to be on the ground floor. And that'd be simpler. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The, and then the only one there's that uh, the parking um, is, is different. I would probably not, I would make it a, because a B doesn't work, because I guess a, you could have a garage above it, so. The criteria. But I think, you could address it in the criteria. Mm, I guess. So well, I guess I guess that's fine. As long as it's not an allowed use. I don't want parking as a principal use as an allowed use. So put it as a B and let's articulate principles like you said, but I, I think having it be for carpools or um, you know, transit node kind of thing, if you did it right, it could be interesting. Um, and you know, even if it was structured parking for that purpose. Yeah, potentially so. Okay, are there any others in that category that that's you That's my list. Okay. You had some there? They were addressed. Okay. Um, and so for, and we, other things I heard articulated, but I don't think we have to change anything, is don't disincentivize housing too much. So if we don't change anything, we're still good there. Here's a suggestion for the, the housing piece. I think one of the, um, the concerns was that the housing would be the four to a bedroom kind of student housing. So maybe it can be addressed in the criteria? I think so. <laughs> okay, yeah. what? Yeah. Um, okay, and then we we have this idea as tech talk as the dividing line, are people okay with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I'm sorry, not to go backwards, but we had a lot, all these little <coughs> one-off parcels, we're just trying to leave them out. Well, we're only including. We're only including the ones that we specifically okay. said, and and so they're going to put an appendix map in, right? Right. Okay. So there, I assume, will be two different sets of use tables, one for those that are in the appendix map, BC one, well, BC two. I think the criterion would just say, you know, for the uses that are in appendix, whatever it is, um, they're subject to this. Otherwise, it's allowable. Okay. Yep. So I want to bring in a suggestion that would likely only apply to the bigger sites, which would be to allow um, the um, allow housing on the ground floor mm -hmm. if the the um, affordable housing is on site. Yeah. Can I colloquy? Yes, please. I was thinking that on the really big sites we might. Um, set, this is kind of your idea really, we might set the percentage of retail on the first floor lower than 100 and then further reduce it if the affordable housing component is placed on site. So start at 75, go down to 60, <laughs> and I'm holding a space for the future when we have an affordable commercial because if you did affordable commercial and the affordable housing on site, maybe that retail requirement could reduce some more because the intensity would go up. and. <laughs> further from the street, retail might not be successful. But that could, I think, do we think that could be addressed in the criteria? Or, or it well, might I be guess a later phase. I mean, that, that might come as the next phase rather than this. Yeah. Not, not the one that we do in January, but the one that's on the longer to-do list. Mm -hmm. Up. Let me pile on that. I, I agree with Aaron. I, I, um, I understand the social benefit of having on-site affordable, and we're going to get into this discussion um, sure. on the next agenda item as well. I, I just want to make sure we don't put our thumb too heavily on the scale on on-site uh, affordable, though, because um, keep in mind that Cash and Lou does um, allow us to do some larger um, permanently affordable um, projects in town that are built by Boulder Housing Partners and by Thistle Communities and sometimes by Habitat. And um, we do have a little bit of a problem right now where um, the pendulum has swung back the other direction and people are doing on-site affordable, which is great from a social standpoint, but the, um, but the plot's kind of empty right now and some projects that want to get done um, that are 100% affordable can't get done because we simply can't support them. So I, I think we need to be kind of careful and thoughtful about not pushing too much in the direction or not over-incentivizing on-site affordable 
Um, and uh, so I'll just say it, leave it at that. I think I agree with Aaron. If we can park that topic until the broader, longer discussion, we can have a more fulsome discussion and Kurt can bring some statistics and we can talk a little bit about um, w w what that balance <laughs> need to be. Cool. Can I make one kind of yeah. closing comment? I mean, Seth, I think you did a really nice job here. Um, I also appreciate counsel for like trying to separate it out in a rational way. Um, I just wanted to call out to the community that the, the idea that our uh, sales tax is down is not really accurate. Um, our main retail sales tax bucket, which is a big portion, maybe 75% of what we collect in sales taxes, is up 3.2% over last year to date. And the total, which includes construction use taxes and construction taxes of various kind that are sales tax oriented, is up 8.8% over last year. So our total sales tax revenue collection is actually substantially up. Now, some of that is temporary, one-time kind of things, but the baseline that we monitor is up 3.2%. So just that's different than what we heard earlier in the year. Okay. One, one little thing. One little thing. Uh, just on page 140 of our packet, uh, the ordinance uh, references MU3 mm -hmm. when I think it should be the BC1, BC2. I don't no, th that's actually an accurate um, reference. Uh, we we felt that a lot number of conditional uses are listed for reference in that table. So the title of that particular MU3 code change was not in that prior ordinance. So we took the opportunity to add it to I, this one. So it is a new change. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Okay, staff. What else do you need to know? Good. Good. Well, I I would say that if you want to amend in a tech doc. Um, provision into this ordinance, you could do this, or you you could do it tonight, um, or you could um, consider it at a future date. I think we do it tonight. Yeah, yeah do I, it tonight. I think we can get that one tonight. Okay. Well, I'll suggest some language when you guys put a motion on the uh, table. Oh, are we gonna pass? But uh, I thought this we, tonight we're not. Well, no, then you, it's gonna have to come back for another reading. But so weren't we gonna continue this as a second reading? Yeah. Yeah. But. But it, yeah. It's the same effect. It <laughs> will be continued now for a third reading. But the with the language in it? Yeah. With the tech talks requirement would be as of this date or January 15th? I think that I would just draft it so that it would be parallel with the building permit requirement, that if they had applied by October 16th, 2018. October 16th? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is what the, the building right. permits. Okay. Do. So from a process standpoint, we want to add that do we need to do something tonight or just? Yeah, if you want to do it tonight, you could just uh, make an amendment amendment and pass it, and it still would not be a final ordinance because it'll require another. I move we include, do you want to put your language up or read it to us? Sure. The, the language would be in section four of the ordinance, and it now reads, this ordinance shall apply to any building permit, and then I would add, or development that is in the technical review process and paid to the technical document fee in section 4 2043 BRC 1981 and then continue on with the sentence after that. I move that amendment. Second. Okay. And uh, we leave the rest as is for now? That's correct. Okay. Anything else that we need to say about this tonight? It's good work. And you'll, you're you going to let us know um, in terms of your proposal of how to move forward mm -hmm. such that January 8th when we're looking at how does this all work for next year? Mm -hmm. You can speak to that. Yep. Yeah. The only thing I would ask is um, if we could have um, really granular maps of these various, because um, we have the big map and then there's little tiny boxes and if, if you guys could go, hopefully you, you we were clear on what we were saying mm -hmm. as far as these areas, but then if you just do a page by page map of each of these things, not necessarily for the ordinance, but just for our own visuals, sure. it would be great. Okay. Everybody clear? Okay, I guess just a show of hands for second reading. Unanimous? Okay. So we're going to third reading, that was technically? That's correct. Okay. Okay, hey, just one more public hearing. <laughs> Feeling good about this. Your final public Brand hearing. Roll. First reading of emergency ordinance 8303 regarding a temporary suspension of development applications within the, within the census tract 122.03 opportunity zone. Yeah, but we gained um, 15 here and 25 here, so. 
Oh, yeah, that's that great. is a net of uh, ahead by 30. Time's on up. How's come up? It's on your purple. Well, it's just, it's the net time. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. Math. <laughs> Keeps me entertained. So as we get ready to pull up this item, um, we have several presenters. So the first presenter tonight will be Yvette Bowden, who is, <coughs> excuse me, the Interim Director of Community Vitality, um, and then followed by Chris Meschuk, and then David Gear will talk about the proposed moratorium ordinance. So I'll start off by referring it to Yvette Bowden. Yvette. Good evening, Council, and thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening. I'll be um, briefly going through the agenda and looking forward to getting your feedback this evening. We'll be going through the Opportunity Zone Federal Program, talking a little bit about Census Track 122.03. Um, specifically, we'll be talking about the program intent, uh, a little bit more detail for the community about opportunity funds, timelines for investments, and the federal guidance that's been received to date. Um, I'll share a little bit about Census Track 122.03 in Boulder, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Chris Meschuk from Planning, to go a little bit deeper on applicable zoning. Um, we will talk through uh, staff work that has already been planned in the 2019 work plan and consideration of a moratorium. The Opportunity Zone program arises out of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act. Um, it's a bipartisan initiative as part of that effort. Um, intended to incentivize private investment in high poverty, low income areas, or both urban and rural um, across the country. Um, it is a long term equity investment driven program and does provide deferral, reduction, and even potential elimination of certain federal tax, uh, capital gains taxes over the time of the program. These have to be eligible investments in an Opportunity Zone Census Tract qualified through Opportunity Funds. It is a brand new program. <coughs> Census tracts are certified by the U.S. Treasury. Um, the eligibility is based on both poverty level within the census tract, and in our case, this is a decent size areas, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, based on what the median income is. Governors nominated up to 25% of eligible census tracts in their states. Across the United States, there are 8,700 approved certified census tracts. 126 were certified in the state of Colorado. This includes one in Boulder and three others in Boulder County. They are subject to all local zoning and regulatory authority that is applicable. There is a 10-year certification which cannot be eliminated or modified during the 10-year program period. So how does it work? Um, basically, taxpayers uh, through the federal government get capital gains tax deferral um, by making investments into qualified opportunity funds, which I'll address a little bit more fully in a minute. Um, and that gets invested into a qualified opportunity zone property, which could is either the real estate or a business entity, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So what are opportunity funds? Um, we are still learning about this <laughs> through the IRS. There's been very limited guidance to date. These are self-certifying partnerships or corporations created specifically to invest in the real property or businesses that are located in the certified zones. Um, the Internal Revenue Service determines and qualifies and verifies the qualifications of these self-certifying entities. 90% of the fund assets have to be invested in Opportunity Zone assets during the hold period. And funds need not be local to invest in an Opportunity Zone. IRS um, issued draft regulations, and I'm emphasizing the word draft, on October 18th. Finalization is expected in 2019, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the fact that these are forming now. That, can I ask a quick question? Sure. If you want to go back one. Um, so it says 90% of opportunity fund 
assets, meaning dollars, I assume, must be invested in opportunity zone assets. So does that mean hard assets like buildings, land, and equipment? Is that what the 90% refers to, or is that equity included in the? Yes, and we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what are the potential taxpayer benefits? Basically, this is a deferral program or elimination of capital gains tax um, until sale of that asset within that time period until the, or until the end of the current program period in 2026. The reduction and or deferral is determined by both holding period and basis. Um, and it does go up the longer you hold. So. In some presentations that I'm sure we've all heard about or looked at online or listened to, this is long hold. The longer you hold in the 10-year period, the longer the deferral opportunity. It must be an equity investment. Most are in or anticipated to be in real estate, business property, or stock. We'll talk about that in another second. And they have to be located within the opportunity zone. I want to make a distinction here. The opportunity fund is self-certifying and can be anywhere and is approved by the IRS. The opportunity zone is a location and or business entity. Certain business types are excluded. Um, while the list is still being explored, it includes everything from country clubs and golf courses to liquor stores and massage parlors. And we imagine, and th that list kind of comes from other federal legislation and similar type programs that existed in the past. Businesses must have 70% of its owned or leased property within the zone to qualify. The, this is still being explored. This is just based on what we know right now. Um, so if something, a business has offices, the majority of their offices in many other places, um, there's a question and, and needed clarification, which we expect shortly, on whether or not that would even qualify. Property must have been purchased after the enaction of this tax law, which was January 1st. Um, 2018 by a quote-unquote unrelated party. We also are expecting some explanation of what is meant by that and how there's some guidance but nothing definitive at this point. Nothing is really final at this point on this. And it has to be substantially improved without uh, within the 30 months. This is a lot of percentages and numbers, so we thought a couple of graphics would be helpful. Could you, could you Can I that? ask a Sure. Yeah. So, just help me out. Diagonal Plaza, plaza mm -hmm. in order for it to fall under this, it has to be purchased by somebody else? It has to be an entity that is a partnership that is improving that asset within the 30 months, and we expect further clarification. So you're getting kind of to the issue of is it possible for somebody to own it today and create a fund to improve that their own asset. Is that what you're asking? Or does it have to be new? Is that your question? Well, I'm just trying to understand. Property must have been purchased after January 1st. Somebody already owns Diagonal Plaza and has for a long time. Multiple people, multiple entities. The interest in the asset. Mm -hmm. So how does it apply to Diagonal Plaza unless it gets sold? We'll walk through a couple of Okay, good. good. Well, before you walk through, sure. I, I, can I go back to the bullet point above that? I don't understand. No. Um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The business must be 70% of its owned or leased property located within the opportunity zone. I, I don't understand what that means. I mean, like if the gap, which has properties all over the country, 70% of its business must be in the OZ, otherwise it doesn't qualify. I mean, what's the definition of a business, I guess? I think we're waiting to get definitive direction on that. Arguably, and I think we will hear something about that. Entities that are, it depends on what the definition of the business is. It's possible that a franchise yeah. could be its own business, even though it's part of a larger entity. While an entity's headquarters, for example, would be considered one business. So I, I think we're waiting on further direction there. Um, and I'm not comfortable that it's specified enough and I would be leaning to our colleagues in the IRS to give you the best answer on that. Okay. okay. Yeah, and just the yep. one other thing, and, and if you're getting to it, I apologize, but the st substantially improved, 
Does that mean like broken ground or does that mean you've finished what you were going to do? It's determined by basis, um, not including the land, but we'll get to that in just we'll a second. Great. <laughs> so just a couple of things to, again, I think this is still being developed. Um, so you have your individual taxpayer. They invest in an opportunity fund, and we're going to talk about timelines in a minute. There are three different avenues for the investment. One is in the qualified opportunity business property. That's the real estate thing that we've been discussing in the community. Um, then there's the partnership interest, which I think we still have to explore and understand more fully. And I think earlier this week I got a question about whether or not it could actually be equity in a new business. And the answer is yes. It can be funding for businesses as well that it could be about their equipment. It could be about materials that they need and isn't necessarily about real estate. But there are, um, this is a, a wide spectrum of things that we expect to get more direction on. Can I ask a question? Here? Sure. <clears throat> what the individual taxpayer invests in the opportunity fund, if I'm not mistaken, is previously realized capital gains. Is that right? So these are these are capital gains they took from a sale of some asset, and so they would otherwise owe tax on their gain, and they can invest those capital gains in the opportunity fund. And we'll see that in a minute in the timeline, but it also could be something that they sell during the 10-year timeline. Right, right, but it has to be capital gains that get invested. That is what the program All is right. designed to do. Um, so investments that do not qualify, and we're really – you know, I have no more specificity than what's here is kind of funds of funds, like the creation of another fund, um, financial institutions, and the excluded businesses that we talked about, um, which I think are still being defined. There is a substantial improvement test that applies um, unless a business is an original loose, like a, a brand new startup, and we'll talk more about that as well. I, we thought it would be helpful to share what this broad timeline looks like. And this this can get very, you know, it's going to be very helpful over the next couple months to see what the IRS says. So anywhere starting between the inaction of this and January 1st, all the way through the 10-year period, people can both be selling and investing in that time period. The realization of the relief from the tax liability comes for the period of the holding. So. You've been hearing a lot, and the community has been having a lot of discussion around, is there a rush? Is, is something happening right now? There are um, conversations happening that are forming these, and there are other people that are waiting for the finalization of the guidelines, because there's just a lot that's not known right now. But the benefit of the program is realized over time. So within the 10-year window, with the 10 years having started, you do see dialogue happening about people forming and beginning to develop their strategies for what they want to be able to invest in. This is why communities across the 8,700 opportunity zones that have been certified, you'll see some states are saying, you know, choose Georgia or choose California, and they're starting to build prospectus on what they'd like to see to be able to influence that dialogue. Let's talk about near-term timeline. Um, in 2018, what we're seeing or likely to see is the beginning of a certification process and the self-certifying process through the IRS. There's only a draft form 8996 on how they will do this. This will be occurring directly through the IRS. Um, to my knowledge, there are no um, public processes that provide disclosure of those. That would be completely voluntary. Um, the IRS is releasing guidance. Uh, we do expect the finalization of the form shortly so that people can then file with their 2018 taxes in 2019. Um, they'll start to formulate these funds in 2019 and begin making investments likely in that time period. And between 20 and 21, we do believe there will be um, continued investment. They need to reach those thresholds around 90 percent, and that's in order to capture the minimum of that five-year, 10-year time frame. I want to talk a little bit about the census tract. So there were 12 qualifying tracts in Boulder. Um, 
there were two that scored higher than 122.03. Um, so there was a question about, which was not included in the memo, but I want to make sure I address it tonight, of why not those other two or what was in the other 10. Um, you should know that the majority of those tracks um, were situated in an area that encompassed very close to CU. The belief of staff in that short window of time of consideration was that the income levels were skewing because of the high density of the student population. And so there was a leaning more heavily into the comp plan of where does the city want to see things happen. And the remaining conversations were around Alpine Balsam, um, Gun Barrel, and the Diagonal Plaza area. It cannot be broken down further beyond the census tract size. And so it wasn't possible to our knowledge, and I don't believe that is still the case, um, where they can be broken down into smaller categories. They cannot be modified and they cannot be removed from the 10-year program. Let's talk about who's in 122.03. There are approximately, and this is based on 2015 data, um, 8,300 residents, um, heavily populated at the northern side of the census tract, um, 20.9 below the poverty level, um, median income around $51,000. Um, and so we wanted you to know what was the breakout of how many are in single family homes, townhome today. You know, that's based on 2015. Obviously things change, but this is kind of what it was then. In terms of the business overview, there are roughly 1,500 businesses. The majority of them are small, 69% under 20 employees. 2% have um, more than 100 employees, a huge mix of industries. So we thought that would be relevant for your conversation. So kind of setting this at the, the baseline, I know that we want to, the, again, all current zoning and regulatory authority applies, all local taxes apply, and I'm now going to turn over the conversation to my colleague, Chris Mestre. Thanks, Yvette. So I'm going to just do a quick zoning overview and discuss a little bit um, the different zoning districts in the uh, um, Census Tract 122.03, um, as well as some of the policy objectives that we have for those different geographic areas. So um, first, I'm going to give an overview, then I'll talk about the industrial areas, then the Boulder Junction area, and then I'll end with the Boulder Valley Regional Center. So first, in terms of an overview of the census tract, um, the, this is a map of the different zoning districts that exist, and then I've kind of categorized them by their zoning category. So the most predominant zoning districts that exist within the Opportunity Zone is our industrial zoning districts. That's primarily on the east side of the, of the zone. Um, and then followed by residential zoning districts. So that includes both the medium density residential zoning districts as well as the two mobile home parks that exist within the district as well. Um, and then there is a, um, about 20% of commercial zoning um, in the area. And then there's actually 2% of agricultural zoning, um, which is one parcel that's down at the very south end next to the hospital. There's a big chunk of hospital land that's behind the hospital that um, is zoned agriculture and has a big flood easement over it. So that's just the weird anomaly, but it's a big parcel of land you can see there on the screen that's green. So now to dive into a little bit more detail uh, in each of these zoning districts. So the industrial zones, like I said, are primarily in the eastern part of this zoning district or of the of the opportunity zone. And um, Different mixture of industrial general as well as manufacturing. Um, the light blue areas or teal blue areas is um, our service industrial areas. Um, this is the primary area of where the jobs currently exist in the opportunity zone, um, but it's a mixture. This is also the area where there's the largest potential for job growth based on our existing zoning. Um, the industrial areas, though, don't have um, a massive amount of redevelopment potential based on previous policy actions um, by council and the community. Um, there was a significant rezoning effort that occurred in the community back in 1997. Yeah, Mary? Quick question, Chris. Um, so this area is in the TVAP2 um, area, correct? And the, or, or at least the, the area 
just to the north, I guess, of the curve. Correct. And so my question is, is when is the um, rezoning um, visitation scheduled, currently scheduled to occur? The Transit Village Area Plan, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here next, um, there's two phases to that plan. Phase one, which is um, uh, almost completed now, and then phase two. So phase two is east of the railroad tracks, um, between the railroad tracks and Foothills Parkway, from Valmont down to basically Pearl Parkway. And so that phase, um, we've envisioned what the new uses in that area are, but we have not initiated the land use changes or the rezonings for that area. The TVAP implementation plan defines some criteria about when we would initiate that. First is sub substantial completion of phase one. The most important criteria is um, a plan for the public improvements that are necessary for phase two. So the street connections as well as any of the other necessary infrastructure upgrades. Um, and that plan plan has not been initiated yet. Um, so right now, we don't have TVAP phase two queued up in our um, BBCP implementation plan or action plan. Um, we have that queued up as a mid to long-term action, so that's probably in the 2021 to 2025 timeframe. Thank you. Um, so jumping back to the industrial areas, um, in 1997 there was a significant rezoning effort throughout the community um, and one of those actions was related to our industrial zones where we lowered the FAR as well as the height um, allowance in our industrial zones. So it ranges from a 0.4 to a 0.6 FAR in our industrial zones with a height limit of 35 feet. So at, that, at this point we have a lot of properties in the industrial areas that are actually at or over their current allowed FAR. Um, we do have some that allow um, some additional development potential, but it's pretty scattered throughout the zone. So that's the industrial areas. Um, so can I ask a oh, quick yep. question? Um, the memo mentions a bunch of prescriptive requirements in order to do infill housing in the industrial zones, and that I think came about as part of the 97 rezoning. Can you talk about what some of those prescriptive requirements are? Sure, so yeah, we have a section in the code about residential and industrial, um, and um, there's a bunch of pres prescriptive requirements. One is parcel size, um, and there's a threshold at five acres, and there's a threshold at two acres, um, and there's also um, adjacency requirements to existing residential areas or open space or parks. Um, and so we have a map, if you wanna dive into more detail about that, that shows what parcels might be eligible. Um, but it is pretty prescriptive, and it actually leads to, um, in the last comprehensive plan update, we talked about how we wanna see more residential in this part of town. Um, and so on the screen on the right-hand side is an example example, um, just a snapshot from the comp plan page that talks about our light industrial areas and some um, guidelines and principles for how should we achieve a more mixed use environment in our industrial zones, balancing um, the role that they play um, as an employment center, but also um, that we want to see more mixed use. Um, we envision that this actually is going to be a combination of probably area planning at 55th and Arapahoe, as well as then some code changes to our industrial areas to clarify and clean up what's really the resin industrial code language right now that's pretty complicated. So that's something that's queued up as a midterm action right now in the comprehensive plan, action plan. So this would be kind of 2020 timeframe that we were planning to do that. If council was interested, that could be something that we consider accelerating um, if we wanted to see changes in that area. Okay. So now let's jump to Boulder Junction, um, also known as the Transit Village Area Plan. Um, this was completed in 2007. Um, phase one, like I described, is nearly um, complete. Um, and typical to when we do uh, more localized planning, we get a vision for that area and then we write zoning districts to achieve that detailed vision. So in the phase one area, there's a lot of different zoning districts that are specific to that. So we've clearly articulated what we wanna see in that area. That was staff spaces for why we recommend excluding um, TVAP phase one from uh, any moratorium. Um, and then we talked already about phase two. So any other questions on the Boulder Junction area? Okay. 
so the last area that I wanted to touch on um, is the Boulder Valley Regional Center. Um, and so that's the area circled here on the map that centers around um, 29th Street as well as um, the kind of regional business areas. That's the red areas on the map. Um, uh, that's really been um, our primary retail center throughout the community. This was a big focus of conversation um, as a part of the last comprehensive plan update. And really it's time to look at a, um, an evolved vision for that area of town um, to see it more mixed use, to see a balance preserving our retail areas, but also adding additional housing. Um, and as we were really working through that in the comp plan update, that's gonna take some detailed analysis to make sure we get it right. Um, the um, current height ordinance that is in place applies to this area of town, um, a lot of those areas surrounding 29th Street, um, and that right now um, holds back probably a lot of redevelopment that we would potentially see in this area. Um, and we see that, um, and what's recommended in the comprehensive plan is um, amendments to the zoning code in this geographic area to really articulate what we want as a true vision. Um, that's gonna take some economic analysis and testing of the zone district to make sure we achieve what we want. But we have articulated and adopted guiding principles to guide that work. Um, and again, that's something that is queued up for kind of the next slate of, of code amendments um, in that kind of midterm 2020, 2021 um, timeframe in terms of years. Chris, um, yeah. Can you, I didn't hear the first word. You said what is holding up redevelopment in the- moratorium. What? Height moratorium. Oh, height. Correct, okay. the current height ordinance that's in place mm -hmm. um, doesn't allow that the applications to go up to 55 feet. Um, and that's where um, we believe there's a lot of the potential is with the additional height is where we would see additional redevelopment applications. So the current height ordinance that's in place um, is probably what's holding those applications back. And then we talked about Diagonal Plaza a fair amount in the previous item, so I wasn't gonna go into much detail in addition to that, but that is identified in the comprehensive plan as an area for um, additional uh, um, analysis and area planning. Um, part of the key thing in our big retail um, or neighborhood center sites is um, the need to put a a plan together, if we're gonna break those sites up, put in exactions like streets, we need a plan basis to do that. And so that's where that recommendation for area planning that's in policy 2.19 in the comp plan comes from. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Yvette for us to talk about next steps, and then we'll hand it to David, who's gonna um, go ahead and go through the proposed moratorium. Already in the 2019 work plan, you've heard earlier from the planning department, there's several other strategies underway and across that we have checked with our colleagues that are already in the work plan for 2019. Implementation of the beginning efforts of our comprehensive housing strategy. The citywide retail study by the Community Vitality Department in concert with many of our other departments. Redesign of the flexible incentive program has been suggested by council to possibly look at greater incentives um, supporting small women and minority owned businesses and the continuing work on community benefit. In addition, we would continue to conduct research, benchmarking, and possibly monitor impacts more fully described in the memo in your packet. And the city has developed a web page that is available both through the planning department and community vitality, specifically related to the Opportunity Zone program to keep the community apprised of different pro, you know, progressive efforts or more information <coughs> that we receive from the IRS. With that, Yvette, can I ask um, you a question about that? Oh, um, sure. Mm -hmm. There are a few other um, 2019 staff planning work um, mm -hmm. that I assume we're still going on at the moment in in the order. There's use table review, and then there was a site plan <laughs> review criteria reform that we had talked about. And That's correct, and those are still on the work plan as well. Okay. Yep. I think what's being discussed okay. is the timing of some things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So, wait. So this list is specific to the the, the zones, or it's related work okay. that staff was already planning to do that didn't arise out of the opportunity zone work. However, we could certainly address it or consider it as we implement those efforts. 
Gotcha. So this wasn't an exhaustive list, so we s okay. that's, that's where that's maybe that confusion is coming from. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think, did you want to? So can I, can I ask the, sure. that my question earlier I don't mm -hmm. think really got answered about the 70% are substantially complete. Yeah. Right. There was the within 30 months, things needed to be substantially complete. So what what defines? Do we have any sense of what defines substantial? Yeah, I, d I have sought additional input on this. What we are understanding is it's not necessary for the entire project to be if it's a real estate project, for example, to be built out if there is substantial planning is what's in the guidance so far. Um, we believe that there will be additional definition around that, um, but the, a project does not necessarily need to be completely built out in the 10-year period of the program to be substantially complete if the basis is improved in that time period and there's substantial planning. So it was, it was 30 months. Correct. It's not 10 years. It's 10 years for the program to be realized in the basis. Right. 30 uh, months for the... But the 30, but that's what I'm trying to get to is yes. the 30 months. So what has to be done within the 30 months? So it, it, does, it, does it include building a first building? Does it include breaking ground? Or does it just have to be planning? I don't believe that we've received enough clarity on th that for me to answer you more fully right at this so time. So we just have no idea at this point. Um, I, we don't have further direction at this time. Okay. I think we're expecting that shortly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Yvette. And you know more? Can, can I? Sure. They've, they've specified that within the 30 months, additions that are equal to or greater than the adjusted basis have to be made. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, they don't, you know, they don't say like a certificate of occupancy has to be granted. They haven't gone into that kind of granular detail, but they've, um, you know, they, they, they've said that it has to be equal to, so if they, uh, you buy a $3.5 million property, you put $3.5 million or more in, in 30 months, um, and it, so probably more than just having some sketches on a definitely yes you know, yeah. you yes it seems like the the mm -hmm. at least the way it's worded now it's the invest that investment has to be made in it thank you and um, I thought I read somewhere that the public comment period is still open we're expecting a hearing in January yes on the direction. I believe that the IRS is still taking the input. Yeah, yeah, th they're in a proposed, they're in a rulemaking process, they've issued proposed rules, they're in the public comment period of the, for the proposed rules, and mm -hmm. a final ru ruling will be, or a final rule will be established after they complete that process. Send, send your comments in. Yeah. <laughs> How curious. Okay, so you were going to keep, any other, qu I'm sure we're going to have more questions, but can we continue on to the moratorium <laughs> part? Okay. You want to go to the yeah. okay? All right. I'm going to just uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to go through the moratorium ordinance. Um, first of all, just in terms of how we structured it, um, the first section of the moratorium is basically the plan basis for implementing a moratorium. What we did is we went through, um, for the most part, the comprehensive plan and some other plans that the city has. Um, to see how our plans address the concerns that have been raised by um, council members and members of the community about development in opportunity zones. And we tried to be rather specific about that so that if people want to go back and um, read the plan basis for the moratorium that we're, pro that we're proposing, um, that citations are included in the, in the ordinance itself. It then goes on to the regulatory part of um, the ordinance. And the first, the first um, section of the ordinance, it, it basically tells the reader um, what actions will, we will be suspending. So we're gonna, st if the moratorium is passed tonight as drafted, um, we would stop taking applications for site reviews, use reviews, and building, permit ac building permits. And that would be for, and I think that this is a pretty important element of it, it's only for construction of new floor area for office, medical, or financial uses. And the basis for using that um, as a rash, or a, for regulating that set of uses is that I think one of the things that we've heard a lot, and it's I think also reflected um, in our comprehensive plan, is that um, 
we have a jobs housing balance and that those are the types of jobs that um, are the ones that are most likely to um, further um, create that imbalance between jobs and housing in our community. Um, it also, of course, we, we are constantly talking about affordable housing. Um, and one of the prohibitions that we put in there as well is that we are prohibiting the construction of any new dwelling units except for projects that meet inclusionary housing requirements on site. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about um, the last major regulatory David, portion of the ordinance. Yes. Can you go back for a second? The, the cr construction of new Floria area. Yep. Does that capture redevelopment of an existing uh, ch change of use? It, it only no. requires building a new building. No, what about what, redevelopment? Well, so the way it's drafted is it's drafted that any construction that results in um, any new floor area for those uses, it does not it does not regulate tenant finishes for changes of use. So if you were going from one use classification to another, that is not prohibited by the moratorium as it's presently drafted. Could we? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so in a renovation, if a certain floor area was taken down, old building, and then a new one built to the same floor area ratio, that's also allowed? That would not be allowed. That would not be allowed. Yeah. Because you're not accepting site review, use review, and building yep. permits. Okay. Yep. So they can do internal renovations. Yes, they could do internal re renovations. Or they could add floor area or new buildings for any other uses that don't fall within that office medical or financial uses category or the affordable housing. So Zan asked, don't you need a building permit to do an internal renovation? You do. But it wouldn't be adding. So it's only but it wouldn't be adding building floor permits area. for those yep. uses. Okay. But so it's not. But if it's not adding floor area ratio, it's not. It's not regulated. Got it. But yep. as I just asked, we could. Oh, we can change all of it. We could change it so that we don't allow uh, um, new construction for a change in use. Yeah, and that, that that's part of your. Um, that, that can be part of your deliberations. And I, I guess maybe what I should have started with is um, we drafted this ordinance in an effort to, to start the conversation, mm -hmm. and we anticipate that the council will, ha you know, you will have your con conversation, and I anticipate that it will be amended. Okay, yep. great. Qu another question before we off the slide. David, I understand the um, the rational basis for office medical or financial, you just described it. What's the rational basis for ex prohibiting um, uh, housing other than on-site um, inclusionary housing? Well, I think that it would just be that um, it would be based in the policy rationale that this would be an important um, outcome that the council would want to see and that they would prefer to see this outcome with um, affordable housing within the opportunity zone there as opposed to payment of cash in lieu funds which could be used anywhere in the city. Okay, but I, I guess I'm struggling a little bit of what, what the difference is between inside the opportunity zone and outside the opportunity zone because we don't have this requirement outside the opportunity zone. We do not have this outside. Okay, so what's the rational reason to impose it on inside the opportunity zone? It's It, it has to go with what your objectives are with regard to affordable housing in this area. Okay. Okay, so a bunch of stuff we're gonna discuss further. Uh, clarifying questions? Yeah, just just on that, I mean, I'm, I'm a big supporter of on-site affordable housing, but we, I've always been told that when with the affordable housing program, we have to offer options that, that come from a legal perspective. And we're okay not offering options under this moratorium? Yes, I, I, th I, think, I think it's okay because it's temporary. It's like a moratorium, you know, it's a moratorium on certain types of development that you don't want to, that arguably, you don't want to see happen while you're doing additional planning in the area. Okay, okay. Thank you. is it clarifying? Because I, I'll go right ahead. It's a, it's a clarifying question about the moratorium in general. Do you have more slides? I've got one more slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So I, just quickly, um, what, the, what this ordinance explicitly permits, it's basically, it permits building permits, site reviews, or use reviews for anything that's not expressly prohibited in section two of the, of the ordinance. Um, as we just discussed, projects that add dwelling units that meet the inclusionary housing requirements on site would be expressly permitted. Um, any project that has a prior discretionary land use approval um, would be able to build out in a manner that's consistent with their land use approvals. Um, uh, site reviews, use review, build, and building permit applications that are pending will be processed based on the rules in place at the time of their application. Um, and then I, I guess I, inclusionary housing was so important that I put it on the slide twice. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else on the moratorium? That's it. Yes. So, what's allowing us to bring this as an emergency is the fact that there's this expected new infusion of, of cash into this area, is that correct? I would say yes. Okay, so if, if that's the case, there, there's a lot of properties within this zone uh, that are not going to be qualified opportunity proper, opportunity zone properties, um, or they're going to choose not to use funds because there's so many rules around them. Yeah. So, by definition, wouldn't they be exempt from the moratorium then? B because they, they're not subject to that emergency nature of a, a cash infusion. They're not participate. They, they don't. They're not eligible to participate in, pro or in the process or, or in the funds, or they're choosing not to. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that we can. I think it would be very difficult to um, predict how oper you know how the funding would affect this area, and I think that that's kind of why we're having this conversation right now. So I, I'm not quite sure how I would, um, um, in kind of a legally defensible way, uh, describe who's in and who's out. I think that from a policy perspective. The council has that authority. Um, you know, Chris described the zoning district. Well, first of all, we made a value judgment based on, uh, you know, office, medical, and financial uses. Is that the right set of uses? Well, you guys will probably add hotels. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but but there's a policy. You know, there's a policy basis for the council to weigh it on there that as well. Um, Chris described a number of zoning districts that. Um, perhaps don't have a lot of development potential. Um, one of the you know one of the policy considerations that you could make is which zoning districts is this appropriate for? It may not be appropriate for all of them, um, but I think that that's uh, that that's how I would tend to parse it out is to look at well the way I kind of um, analyzed it on a personal basis was you know I got the zoning map out. And I kind of looked at it, and I made my own value judgments about areas where I guessed would be areas of change, um, and areas that I thought were pretty um, stable. Um, and yeah, you guys have to make the well. I judgments. I hear what you're saying, David, but I I guess I'm saying something a little different. The if, if the rationale for an emergency moratorium is this new infusion of cash and somebody comes to us and can show that they're not eligible, there's very specific requirements to make them eligible or not, and, and they want to move forward with just traditional funding mechanisms and or their own financing, how, how are they then subject to an emergency based on an infusion of opportunity fund cash? Like that's that to me. I hear kind of where you went in these different places, but that to me seems very easy to parse out. They, they're either receiving funds from O funds or not, financing from O funds or not. You know, pretty 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 plain and simple, right? Yeah, and maybe I'll try and chime in and add a little bit more explanation. Is um, there's probably a few pieces. The first is the actual use of opportunity funds. That's a private transaction, something that the city isn't party to. Um, and so we um, apply applications for people to do things to 
redevelop or develop property based on existing zoning. And so as David described, the way we looked at certain zoning districts have or don't have a lot of development potential or risk for or opportunity for change. Then there are other zoning districts where um, we have identified some policy objectives of things we want to change in those zoning districts. And we had planned that we were gonna go to work on those in a few years. Um, and I think the circumstances have changed now that um, this opportunity zone designation may accelerate redevelopment or investment in this geographic area. And so I think the concern is until the zoning is in place that is gonna achieve the outcomes that we want, um, there is there's a reason to hold or stop some development applications until the zoning is is in place with the policy objectives that we've stated. But the biggest, I, but I think the biggest thing is it's a private transaction that we, well, yeah, but is, so that, right. I think that's that, the part that's of That's the only piece that I feel like addressed my question, which we could say, well, under perjury of law, you have to, to, to promise that you're not using funds, and then actually, the funds do show up on your tax returns, so you, we could then double check that with tax returns, but, but it's the second part, well, but by, to, to see if they're using funds, um, but the second part of what you said still doesn't address the question because, again, it's un these places not using opportunity funds have nothing to do with this. I might piggyback. Um, the opportunity funds are created. Whether they choose to invest in the zone um, or in a particular project will also be a private determination unless a project is sort of raising their hand to say we are primed and ready to go and shovel ready please pick us um, part of what we grappled with is both the administration of how do you make that determination and um, in you know, in our conversations, people do not have an obligation to explain their capital stack when filing a permit. Um, at the same token, if the city would desire um, that kind of disclosure, what communities are doing are creating a prospectus around a particular project. There's been a lot of dialogue about the Diagonal Plaza. What is the community's desire in positioning that as something that is an invitation to more of the carrot, less of the stick, perhaps. And so I think, you know, you're absolutely right. The other thing would be, um, what's the remedy? So after a permit is issued and the building is improved, let's say, or the land is improved, if, if we were to discover that any portion of that was in its source opportunity zones that were not disclosed, what happens is is at least the conversation that we as staff were unclear about so we kind of went in this direction for you to have a conversation thanks so so is that good enough for now on that one because we could, uh, so i guess i had another suite of questions which is um gets back less to the more the more moratorium is still you know time out to get, make sure we have everything in place I also want, this question is more about what you were getting at is if there was some good to be had, um, opportunities to, to take advantage of with this program, how creative could we get in terms of putting out a perspective for, I don't know, our ambitions around energy or around affordable housing or a model mixed use redevelopment of a shopping center or whatever. Like, are we free? free to get as creative as we want and try to drive that. Of course, we're subject to whether anybody finds us interesting, but I guess, yeah, what is the potential of this tool? We, we understand that I mean, there's potential negatives, so the potential positives. I think that's to be explored vigorously. Um, th this is about choice making of investments. We have many passionate people in our community and people that are passionate about Boulder, hopefully everywhere. Without taking a position, I can tell you that this program can be combined with other funding sources and other programs, and that should be explored. 
that we may look at incentive programs that the city already has within its cadre of tools to say how might those be combined and certainly taking direction primarily from the comp plan and existing planning from TVAP to uh, whatever we discover out of the retail study that becomes practicable to redefine these neighborhood nodes you were discussing earlier this evening. Um, it's part of our ongoing benchmarking and part of my, uh, our department's work with our colleagues in planning and in legal and in housing. So like the mobile, like the mobile home parks that are there? Um, Everything from public, it, it is very broad in its wording of how this can be applied. And I think the definition will be, can Boulder position its opportunities as advantageous in this competitive space should we decide that we have particular priorities? Okay. So I, I have a question. You, you know, Suzanne, you brought up the mobile home parks. Um, and then uh, in your presentation, Yvette, you put up there that there are qualified partnerships mm -hmm. that, that can receive funding from mm -hmm. um, opportunity funds. So could, for instance, in, in terms of positioning projects and, and, and trying to meet the goals of what the stated um, the stated goals of the opportunity um, zones, mm -hmm. which is to um, help low-income communities and, and vulnerable, vulnerable communities and um, communities of color. So that those are the stated goals. And, um, and so could we, um, as the city, um, partner with some entity and be part of a partnership? And as you said, supply some of the investments and then position something like, for example, um, mobile home park infrastructure? Um, public infrastructure is a possible investment on the program. Um, it's a competitive program and, you know, individual investor decisions are made on what motivates them. I think that, um, and, and certainly it's been our benchmarking so far, that communities are being relatively descriptive in things that they would like to see. Um, Shovel-ready projects are preferred because of the timeline, and they're trying to be very um, advantageous about the timing um, to achieve the things that they want. So I, I think it, it, you know, should council direct us to go and look more fully at the things that you'd like to achieve and those, in order to position them, that doesn't guarantee that they'll be selected. These are investor decisions. But positioning them from a spirit of openness to using this as an opportunity is what it is indeed intended to do. Well, so um, if we wanted to have a little more control over a fund and the investment decisions, could we um, set up a fund that is publicly administered and that the community can contribute to um, with their um, 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 capital gains. Uh, capital gains, thank you. And um, something I don't have, so I don't know that <laughs> it's like. A, um, but um, so could we do that so that we, as a community, could actually invest in our community in that way? The creation of the funds will be dictated by the IRS around that, but I think the partnership opportunity and the definition and collaboration is something that is available to us and being explored in other communities. Should council direct us to explore that more swiftly or as part of our 2019 work, uh, we would welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, oh, okay. Elisa. So following up on Mary's question, question, are there other tax credits we could use? So we got an email from um, Bridge House, mm -hmm. and they were able to use new market, new market tax price, huh? credits on mm -hmm. their Aurora Bridge House project, and mm -hmm. it enabled a lot of things for them that they wouldn't have been able to do without those um, tax credits. Could you explain briefly, um, as best as you can, how those, if and how those new market tax credits could work in this opportunity zone? So that program, as well as some other programs, are also built on census tracts. One of the things that we could look at as staff would be overlays of what applies in both areas. Mm -hmm. the, one of the great things about the Opportunity Zone program um, 
is that that type of funding can be used in combination with programs such as this. Um, I will say that each project is developed in its own spectrum and has to be structured in a way to both achieve the community goals and then explore what would be the investor opportunity. Um, one of the important factors is for us to think about the intention of this around receipt of the capital gains and the long-term investment. I think it's a combination of things that have to be explored. I would welcome also the opportunity to collaborate with members of our community who know more either in the zoning and what is appropriate, the housing efforts that we already have underway, the banking industry and what would be most appealing in the way to develop a perspective that is beneficial for our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to prioritize those projects. Do you, um, so we, I don't want to cut us off, but we have 30 people signed up to speak. <laughs> So we might want to get to the public yeah, hearing, just, yeah. but did you, unless this is a new thing. I mean, it was just related to what Mary and Lisa were saying. I guess, okay, I'm going to say it. Yeah. Just, um, just cause the event didn't bring it up. But if you're talking about how to um, attract capital to like uh, uh, projects that capital might not otherwise be attracted to, like, like housing, affordable housing or whatever it is, the, uh, you keep kept saying shovel ready. It, it, the faster we can move, the better, because there's three different tranches of benefits, and the two, the first two tranches, the, the your basis is going to go up uh, on the original gain. So your your um, your your taxes owed later go down, and that is going to expire. I think at the end of. 20, the, well, not expire, but you have to have in, invested by the end of 2019 to, um, real, to realize the first tranche, and then you move into the second one, and then and it's the third one. So the, um, my, the bottom line is, if, it, if, the, if the project is less attractive, um, like there's less percentage gain than, than like a, you know, luxury real estate, right? Y you'd want that them to be able to get in as quickly as possible because they get into that first tranche and they s they actually have this higher adjusted basis, which saves them money in the end. Right. Um, Could you say that in English? <laughs> just means <laughs> never, never, never whatever. No, I, I think I got it. But, yeah. But the, the, and I don't, I'm just gonna throw out there, I still don't quite get how Diagonal Plaza falls into that category. Mm -hmm. And can you explain that any better now to me in a way that I might understand? I mean, what has to be purchased? I mean, it's an existing property that has languished. It doesn't have to be, it can be, it, the, the interest in the project to improve the property. Ah, it's just the interest in the project. That has um, and, and the interest in the, in the improved property over time has to be is, is what the basis is. Okay, so they don't actually have to purchase the property. So the simplest example mm -hmm. would be they purchase the property. They go somehow organize that would six be, people, purchase mm -hmm. the property, and then redevelop it. And so they would own the property and the improvements, and then if they held for 10 years, they would pay no capital gains tax on what is presumably a profitable mm -hmm. project. So they could yeah. buy the property. They could, and that certainly is the most understandable, but that's it's seems like an, or they seems like there's other ways they can the current owners. The present owners could rebuy their own property? No, no, no. That's somebody not else. what I said. Uh, completely somebody yeah. else, okay, somebody opportunity else. fund mm -hmm. comes in, yep. okay. purchases the property, all seven or eight, and consolidates them. And okay, that, that, I just wanted to make sure I was on one simple one that could happen. There's other more complicated ones that can happen as well. They Which is they buy an interest there. Right, okay. So just along those lines where somebody comes in and in order to get to the first tranche, they come in and buy it, and then time goes by and somebody wants to get into the second tranche, they resell it, and then the price inflates again, and then you can get to the third. So is it possible that, um, that nothing would happen, you would just get flipping going on? No, no, no. theoretically the... the <laughs> it's go no. down with time, not okay. up. Well, also you have to substantially improve it. That's right. So you can't just flip it and, and still get the tax gain, right? Well, we don't know what substantially improving We don't is. know the exact definition, but you gotta but do something. But we have some, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Well, we know the amount right. Okay, is that good enough now? Thank you for clarifying that sort of. Okay, 30 people signed up, here we go. Um, 
given the number, folks will get two minutes. If you could start with your name and address, that would be great. And if people can line up so um, they're ready to go, that's great. We're gonna start with Vanessa and if Mark Wallet can be on deck. One more. Hi, my name is Vanessa Schatz, um, 2525 Frontier. I'm here to represent um, the Hopper. We're a hybrid organization of Innovation Lab, Maker Space, and Farm Fresh Eatery. Um, we're a needed amenity that will enrich the Boulder Junction District. And we're a small team. My team is here tonight of local parents, educators, and scientists with a mission to make science discovery a part of everyday life. So in the past two years, we've engaged and listened to hundreds of Boulder parents and children of all demographics. We've sparked curiosity by facilitating thousands of experiments using everything from powerful magnets to noodles and marshmallows and a necessary dose of glitter. This August, we found the ideal location, 2525 Frontier, right at Pearl Parkway. It has great views of the flat irons, easy bike and driving access to neighboring towns, and even parking. We're planning an adaptive reuse of our severely distressed property, complete with site beautifications. We've hired architects, and we're currently raising funds with the goal of opening in 2020. After going under contract, we learned that our building is in a designated opportunity zone. After months of planning and complying with city rules and regulations, we closed on our property actually just this afternoon, investing three and a half million dollars in the name of enhancing boulders, family resources, and community. Let me repeat that. Today, we invested three and a half million dollars into this community. We understand that City Council has hard decisions to make regarding the future development of Boulder. However, a no exemption ban on development in the Eastern Opportunity Zone would be a fatal blow to our ability to raise capital, would shut down our small business and disappoint our growing hopper community. We therefore ask that beneficial use projects like the hopper remain exempt from the sudden and unexpected moratorium. Thank, Thank you for your time. So can I turn to staff and ask um, if we can hear about the details of, of the site? I mentioned at CAC that... I might look to Charles a little bit to expand um, on that. And do you want to do this? Well, yeah, do you want to do that now or do you want to do that? Do okay. You can also reach out to us anytime. We have an open house planned in spring and Great. we've been you, in contact thanks. with you. I was so. just going to. Yeah. And okay. Congratulations on the purchase yeah. of your building. Thank you. We're excited. <laughs> Mark and if Mike Schreiner can be ready to go. Mark Wallach, uh, King Avenue. Uh, thank you. For better or worse, Boulder now has a, an opportunity zone under a program whose stated purpose was to funnel capital into economically deprived areas. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not how it's going to work. Capital will flow to the areas of greatest potential returns and lowest risk, and Boulder is therefore one of the most attractive opportunity zones in the country for such tax advantage investment. As a former developer, I can tell you that avoiding capital gains on a development project potentially including gains resulting from depreciation, is like finding the treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> the, this is why the rush to organize opportunity funds is in full force. One study showed that sales of development parcels in opportunity zones increased 80% in the first three quarters of this year versus 2017. So opportunity zone capital is coming. The only issue is how we deal with it. And that's why the moratorium is important. It's a breathing space to permit this community to draft its own rules of the road and to determine what types of investment we incentivize and what we discourage. And because the value of the tax break increases with, the rising, with rising property values and the required investment in opportunity zone property, the program, perhaps unintentionally, promotes the displacement of local businesses and residents in favor of higher income uses. The moratorium will also permit us to address these issues. The moratorium is not about preventing development or holding back the winds of change. The money is coming and the development will follow. It is simply about formulating the guidelines to ensure that we get the development we need, not merely that which provides the highest return to investors. 
So rather than turn 10% of this city into an investment-free fire zone, we need a moratorium to take a pause and then move forward. I urge the council to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike Schreiner. Ah, oh, he's not here. Gary Erling. And if Mike Marsh could then be ready. I'm um, I'm against oh, I'm for the moratorium, as the last speaker said, for exactly the reasons he said. And Sam brought up something that's very important. He was in Palo Alto and he saw something. I was there when Palo Alto was changing. I know what they did. It was a working between industry, university, and the city and the people. And it was good. But they did it smart. They didn't do it in a boomtown rush. They did it slow and thoughtful. Some of the data that you're getting, as one of the people here told you, is distorted, very distorted. The, you're too focused on certain things without facts to back it up. And it's easy to prove those, very easy. CU is too big, and uh, it's bringing 30% of your population here is CU students. They fall in the 18 to 21 year old group, or 24. That is where 50% of your below poverty people lie. If you took them out, the poverty level in Boulder would drop. The place that you're not focusing on is what's most important. The middle class is being squeezed. Those are the people that spend. Those are the people that create families. Those are the people that want to stay here and build something. <laughs> you're also too focused on housing. You're too focused on carbon. The thing that's gonna happen first when you lose, when global warming comes here, you're gonna lose your water supply. That's the danger. Thank you. And you're spending water you don't Thank you. Have. Population. That's Mike, Mike, you're pulling with two people. Can they raise their hands? One, two, thanks. You have four minutes. Good evening. If investors keep their money in an opportunity zone for 10 years, they pay zero taxes on it. So they have significantly more margin than normal to contribute to public good. So within our opportunity zone, I recommend doubling the amount of required affordable housing. I also support preserving small local independent retail in the zone as opposed to ever more office space. <clears throat> but these things won't happen on their own. Council's going to have to formulate guidelines in the face of a never before seen federal investment loophole which could see millions of dollars flowing into luxury office parks if the city has limited means of directing development there. <clears throat> but figuring out guidelines under this totally new phenomenon will take some time if they're to be done right and we want those guidelines to hold up to scrutiny. So I support Boulder in joining many U.S. cities that are taking a step back until they can figure out how to effectively guide the Opportunity Zone process toward public good. This isn't a citywide pause. We're talking 10% of Boulder. Is it worth allowing development to continue normally in 90% of Boulder while taking a pause in 10% of it in order to accomplish some extraordinary community, community benefits there? I think it is. To those who say a pause in development isn't needed, think about this. Macy's, which sits in our new opportunity zone, yesterday submitted an application for 160,000 square feet of office space in place of local retail that has served many people. I'm guessing few on council are happy about that, but you'll get a lot more of that in an unmanaged opportunity zone. If we don't manage it, it's gonna manage us. Numerous U.S. cities, planning, city planning staffs, affordable housing, nonprofit <coughs> advocacy groups, and affordable housing builders are voicing concerns about opportunity zones. In a piece for the Detroit Journalism Cooperative, Jamie Schreiner, executive director of the Community Economic Development Association of Michigan said, it's very confusing and some folks are very frustrated. There definitely will be equity issues. <coughs> 
I don't envy the state because they are clearly making winners and losers. Her organization includes nonprofit affordable housing developers, community foundations, and local governments. Alejandra Molina is an Equitable Cities Fellow with NextCity.org. She covers cities, immigration, race, and gentrification. She wrote about Austin's concerns about opportunity zones. Quote, officials and residents are worried about potential development that could price out the very residents it's claiming to help. <clears throat> Mark Rogers, an affordable housing builder through the Guadalupe Neighborhood Development Group said, residents are sick and tired of all the investment, making things less affordable. That paradox is the key to understanding opportunity zones. Opportunity zone money is very likely to luxuriate communities, thereby raising living costs for everyone there. In Cleveland, a Marriott hotel is being constructed using opportunity zones uh, funds, even though it doesn't need it. Finally, city staff and councils in Astoria, Oregon, and Redwood City, California have asked to be removed from their opportunity zone statuses. Redwood City cited the likely displacement of their most vulnerable populations and are asking developers to cover their relocation expenses because of the proliferation of purely luxury housing construction, to Mr. Yates' question. Their mayor wrote that, unfortunately, the governor ignored our request to be removed. We will now examine what we can do to maintain local control and ensure that the opportunity zone doesn't cause negative impacts or unintended consequences. That's all that's happening here tonight. I support a temporary pause because I want an outcome that helps those in our community who most need it. I don't believe the unmanaged market will provide that under opportunity zones. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne, and after Suzanne, we have Mark Gelban. Good evening, I'm Suzanne DeLucia, 86 Mineola Court. Um, I first want to say that both Mark Wallach and Mike Marsh, um, I agree with their sentiment, sentiments. I think they summarize things very well. But I, I really do welcome this opportunity to speak with you because I've been long concerned with the um, impending retail and small business disaster that I feel is looming before us and the Opportunity Zone fits into this conversation. I work as a business broker and I've had the opportunity to review perhaps more small business financial statements than anyone else in this town. It's eye-opening. Um, it's w with great sadness that I often recommend a business shuttering and selling their real estate as that's their best financial move. This impacts many of the businesses that are very well known, loved, and which just really give character to our town. Um, our retail sector is approaching a situation in which only home run hitters can survive. Many are simply non-viable and non-saleable, so these people's investments are gone. I believe that uh, the proposed Opportunity Zone will create a commercial real estate feeding frenzy, which will result in more Class A space, moving out many of the local businesses which we need to support our community. If they leave or close, all this does is add to our traffic and to our cost. Uh, we risk using, losing our unique retail businesses to big box chains that can afford the rent and spread out the risk across the country. Our plumbers, electricians, other service businesses will all need to commute in and charge extra for their time. So I'm asking for this pause in order to formulate guidelines for sane development. Um, just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is Mark here? Okay, Adam. And after Adam, we have, is Peter Mayer here? There you are. Okay, you'll be up next. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Great. Good evening, Council. Adam Swetlick, 645 Manhattan Place. Um, I had a whole diatribe written here, but the presentation gave me a few extra little pieces to work off of, so um, I really love the usage of the individual taxpayer as the uh, main term used in this entire presentation, considering those are probably the people who are least likely to ever pay taxes on any of this money. Um, that's That's really pretty rich to me. Um, also, the, the number of the we're not sure's given in this presentation 
is a pretty leading indicator that this is an idea that needs a pause. Um, now I'll go into the diatribe for a little bit. <laughs> so while the opportunity zone designation cannot be changed, there's still a chance to utilize this area as a boon to affordable housing and affordable business space. One of the most interesting aspects of this part of our community is it's one of the few areas with racial and socioeconomic diversity. Uh, unchecked development here will all but guarantee an accelerated amount of gentrification and essentially remove all the people who are trying to help the most. So I know you're all standing up for you know, our community members. I know you're not leading out of fear. This is just one of those opportunities where you do need to take a pause, look at what our possibilities actually are, hopefully get some clarification on all the, I'm not really sure what that means, and work off of that. Um, I want to say also that we, we probably can't regulate our way to paradise here, but we can use regulation to help non-wealthy people continue to live in Boulder. I truly do believe that. So this is the greatest challenge we're facing as a community, and I think that's what this pause is about, taking that time, assessing what we can actually do, and moving on from there. Also, Thank I hope you look forward to the dictionary definitions of opportunity and moratorium coming at you very soon. <laughs> And after Peter, we have Rolf. Is Rolf here? Okay, you'll be ready. Okay. Good evening. I brought your bedtime story. Peter Mayer, 1339 Hawthorne Avenue. I'm the co-chair of Plan Boulder, and tonight I am speaking on behalf of Plan Boulder. So Plan Boulder County believes council must act swiftly to ensure that the opportunity to zone designation does not subvert planning in this 2.5 square mile area of Boulder. The new opportunity to zone designation and the tax windfall associated could quickly distort Boulder's uh, carefully considered planning and development process. City Council should act immediately to pause the development within the new de designated opportunity zone with the moratorium in place in an expedited process council then can consider and adopt measures so that any development resulting from the creation of the opportunity zone is consistent with our community goals and ensures that the entire community re reaps the windfall rather than the select few the focus of opportunity zone development really should be on affordable housing, preserving neighborhoods, and preserving essential existing light industrial in that area. With protections in place, Plan Boulder believes the opportunity zone designation does have the potential to benefit the Boulder community in the form of more affordable housing and affordable space for small businesses. However, it is critical to take the time necessary to ensure that the resulting opportunity zone development benefits the community rather than an ad hoc barrage of the most profitable projects. So Plan Boulder recommends that council enact an immediate moratorium as an emergency measure, clearly laying out the nature of the emergency. Council should also carefully analyze potential exceptions. We heard a good example of an exception earlier this evening, to and make sure that the results are what we want and not what is unintended, and those exceptions may need to be enacted by separate ordinance. The council should also identify goals and objectives that will be necessary in revisions to the land use regulations and plans that will guide investment and redevelopment of the opportunity to zone. And finally, select a reasonably sized working group with expertise in Boulder planning. Thank you so much. Way to go tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So Rolf is up. And after Rolf, we have Robert Vissers. Is he here? Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Rolf Kelso, 816 10th Street. I just wanted to share some general concerns for you at this time of so rapid and um, diffuse change with so many unknowns. I think the question we must all ask about economic opportunity zone is opportunity for whom? And collateral damage for whom? I just recently met a newcomer in my neighborhood at a Christmas party a couple days ago who is what I would call a quality of life refugee. She came from the San Francisco Bay Area and was fleeing what we are now facing. I told her she might have jumped out of the frying pan and into the fire. 
Boulder's on the brink of becoming what I call a successful failure. A success for the very wealthy few and a failure for the many, by which I include homeowners, the renters, local businesses, and the many who commute in to work here. Council must not be like frogs languishing in this rapidly heating cauldron that we have of boulder until we're all cooked. I and many, many other Boulder citizens worked very hard on last city council election in the belief that elections could have, indeed should have, consequences. I guess we're about to find out. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? And after Robert D. Perry, is D out there? Okay. Rob Vissers, 2036 Mesa Drive. I'm here tonight to represent Boulder Community Health, not only as the President and CEO, but as a former emergency department physician who's deeply grounded within the needs of an independent nonprofit healthcare system to continue to evolve to meet the best needs of the community. In short, the proposed moratorium as currently stated would apply to all the BCH properties within the Opportunity Zone, which includes the Foothills Medical Campus, where the hospital is, on Arapahoe, the Riverbend Office Park, as well as some of our surrounding clinics. The City of Boulder has long supported ours and others' efforts to develop this section of the city into a centralized hub for medical-related services. However, including the BCH properties within the moratorium would clearly hamper future development of medical space that would be used to provide care to the citizens of Boulder. For example, the 70,000 square foot mental health medical pavilion currently be constructed on the campus would not have been allowed under the proposed moratorium. Not only does this put us at a disadvantage in our ability to serve the community, but it would have likely led to us discontinuing the mental health service line since we cannot add additional beds to the current Foothills Hospital. In addition, an 18-month moratorium essentially means any new projects that are identified would not happen for over five years. An 18-month delay due to the moratorium, 24 months to work our way through the city planning process once the moratorium is over, and then an additional minimum 18 months for construction. Uh, I personally find that incredibly challenging position to be put in as a CEO of a community hospital responsible for providing care to our community. In addition, it's important to note that BCH funds our development through tax-exempt bonds and would not utilize the development-related tax advantages of an opportunity zone to fund any of our projects. We therefore respectfully request the Council consider unique community benefit provided by BCH and either not approve the development moratorium or exempt BCH properties from the moratorium. Thank you. Yes. I have a qu couple of questions for you. One is um, if you have any projects that you are planning um, within that timeline. Uh, not right now, although uh, a five-year timeline in, in healthcare is a very long one given the current changes, and I can tell you that for our critical care beds, medical surgical beds, we currently are running at averaging over 90% occupancy. Uh, and so uh, the only place that we can add beds would have to be proximate to the hospital. We wouldn't be able to locate them in another part of, uh, so I think uh, our greatest demands will be to move um, clinical space out of the hospital that needs to be proximate to the hospital and then hopefully be able to add beds somewhere as well. And um, my other question for you is, um, BCH is a 501c3? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. D. And then after D, we'll have Lisa Spaulding. Is she here? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, D. Perry, 3134 Palo Parkway. Um, I am the chair of Boulder Community Health Board of Directors. I'm also a Boulder native and was born at Boulder Community Hospital. Um, despite many challenges in health care at the national and state levels, BCH is providing our community with the breadth and depth of services that is only possible due to being independent and locally governed. <clears throat> Despite the negative impact to the bottom line, BCH continues to invest in services that are aligned specifically to community needs. A great example of this is our current expansion of our mental health services. At a time where all other hospitals in the county have deprioritized in this area, 
BCH is the last remaining system in Boulder County that provides acute inpatient mental health care and is the only institution that is further investing in mental health across the continu continuum of care. There is no doubt that mental health care is at a critical point. The gap in services is increasing and the resources, or the gap in services is increasing and resources at all levels are decreasing. I don't think anyone in this room would refute that investing in mental health is critical. Yet if the proposed moratorium was in place in 2016, it would have eliminated our ability to provide inpatient mental health services for our community due to a lack of a suitable facility. I ask that you seriously reconsider the emergency moratorium or at a minimum exclude BCH, your community health system, from any restrictive, restrictive measures. As the city staff summarized in their background memo regarding opportunity zones, quote, the BVCP suggests the city explore opportunities to fund and sustainably provide for services and facilities necessary to maintain the community's safety, sustainability, and quality of life, end of quote. The community services provided by BCH certainly seem to fit this criteria. Without question, we are committed to continuing to provide the best health care to the community, yet our investing is making this, hap making this happening is becoming very challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? And then Corina, is Corina out there? Yeah, okay. Lisa Spaulding, 1135J. I read staff's memo on opportunity zones and council's agenda packet, clicked on the link to the Investing in Opportunity Act fact sheet, and read that it was introduced, in quotes, to revitalize economically distressed communities suffering from a lack of investment and new business growth. This does not describe Boulder, Colorado. So I called the office of Senator Cory Booker, a sponsor of this legislation, and spoke to a member of his staff about the intent of the act. She explained that the legislation was created to help revitalize depressed economies in rural areas and in low-income cities like Newark and Camden, New Jersey. When I explained that Governor Hickenlooper proposed an opportunity zone for Boulder, Colorado, which is neither rural nor has a depressed economy, and that it was granted, she was very surprised. She said that they trusted governors to do the right thing. I guess they should not have trusted Governor Hickenlooper. In light of these facts, we should reread the opinion columns and guest opinions in the daily camera, chastising council members as driven by fear of redevelopment and community members as NIMBYs for expressing concerns about a misuse of the Opportunity Zone legislation. It is deeply disappointing that our own city staff and Chamber of Commerce have been complicit in exploiting the letter of this law while ignoring its spirit. Although the Opportunity Zone designation is not reversible, we are lucky that members of City Council with a backbone to approach this issue ethically called for tonight's hearing. I urge you to follow Plan Boulder's four recommendations for dealing with the Opportunity Zone designation, starting tonight with a clearly reasoned emergency moratorium. It will offer you a path to at least honoring the issue of social and economic justice that inspired Opportunity Zones. Thank you. Thank you. Karina, and after that, Leora, is Leora here? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Karina. Um, I'm from Peru. I'm here today to express my deep concerns over this uh, Opportunity Zone topic. Um, as one of many immigrants who live here in the city of Boulder, I'm, I'm very worried about the future of the apartments where I live with my family and also my, my beloved community. What's gonna happen to the people that live and work or study here? Are our rentals going to skyrocket, forcing us out? Are our apartments gonna get demolished? Uh, will be forced to get out of Boulder in commune, in commune, long hours in and out. And as a result, we'll use more gas, we'll pollute the city, and uh, we'll stop supporting local businesses. I will stop sending my kids to activities in Boulder, and um, this will be really sad. A lot, of, um, a lot of businesses are already closing, unable to pay exorbitant rentals wages. We all have a right to access to safe and decent affordable housing, and the decisions of, of authorities should be made in order 
to really save or preserve these lower income homes, engage people in the process, and respect the efforts of the community. At the end, we all want Boulder to be a happy place to live. I hope you guys um, make a good decision, take your time to think about it, and put the city and the people first. The settlement of Colorado was found by the lure of gold. Dear authorities, don't take it literally. Thank you. Could we, could we have some questions. questions for you? Uh, can you tell me where in the city your apartment is? Uh, 2995 Glenwood Drive. It's on 30th and Glenlake. Thank you. Same Thank you. question. Thank you. Uh, Leora? And after that, um, Jan Trussell. Is Jan here? Okay. Cool. Hi, I'm here to, Leora Frankel, 3685 Conifer Court. I'm here to talk about the stakeholders. I'm here to talk about Karina, who just spoke. I'm here to talk about people who, the 8,000 people who live there, who there was never a process. They were never given an opportunity to come here to express their opinions. They were never informed that their lives might be completely changed, which they almost certainly will be, because the incredible incentive of the Opportunity Zone, it's like, you know, it's been referred to as a jackpot, et cetera. So I'm wondering how preventing medical office and uh, what was the third thing? Financial. Financial. Financial is going to protect the existing apartment buildings. I'm wondering what is going to prevent their demolition. I wrote to you already. You take 100 apartments. Right now, right? You take 100 apartments. You demolish them. You build 60 luxury apartments. You put in 15 on-site affordable. Yay! We have 15 on-site affordable. Karina's gone. The other 100 families are gone. This is on you. It's totally on you because this moratorium does not protect her. It also does not protect the people in the industrial zone because the fact that it's only 35 feet and that whatever far it is does not mean that with this kind of incentive there isn't enormous opportunity for profit. So you are not, pre you're not preventing the demolition of our service industry. You're not preventing the demolition of these homes. And by the way, some of the information that was given was incorrect. It is not correct that you, the money that goes into it has to be from capital gains. That's if you want an, an additional deferral for seven or eight years, whatever it is. The money can come from anywhere. So also, the, the facts that are being given to you by staff, there are a number of corrections that could make. Anyway, you badly need a moratorium to understand what you're doing. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Jan? And after Jan, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Good okay. evening, Council. Michelle, I say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Almost. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, Perry Shoes, now in Nederland. Absolute Vinyl, now located in Longmont. Ross Casas, now located in Lafayette. Boulder Army Store, Connor O'Neill's, Rob's Music, gone. The list goes on. How many small retail businesses and restaurants do we have to lose due to high commercial lease rates in Boulder? Meanwhile, the likes of Google, Amazon, and Apple have no problem paying these lease rates. If council is truly serious in providing retail, serving our community, and quelling the 60,000 cars driving into Boulder every day, this so-called Opportunity Zone scam is not the answer. I support City Council's potential moratorium in these, this selected Opportunity Zone that encompasses 2.5 square miles, including that horribly disadvantaged Google development site. The devil is in the details as these opportunity zones were supposedly created to aid economically disadvantaged communities like Trinidad, Pueblo, and Lamar. When last I checked, Boulder does not fall under this category. The last thing Boulder needs is more Class A office space. The only opportunity these zones provide are tax breaks for people investing in real estate or businesses located in these qualified OZ zones. They hold on to it for 10 years, and not only can you sell your investments free of capital capital gain tax, but you can also get a tax break or untaxed capital gains rolled into an Opportunity Zone investment. Individuals in high tax state and with short-term capital, ga capital gains can avoid $7.50 in taxes for each $100 they invest, even before considering 
any return on their zone investments. It's a very favorable treatment. The credible sources, okay, well, I guess I'm done. <laughs> but Please uh, consider this moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. E is it Elon? You're up. And then John Coble. Is John out there? Oh, okay, you're next. Okay, great. I've heard a lot of talk about this opportunity zone, the opportunities made available. Um, the opportunity is, is, is a slogan. If you look uh, to the people who passed the legislation, it was passed in a tax act which reduced tax rates by two or three percent. But in real estate investors such as Trump and Kushner, their tax rate was reduced by seven or eight percentage points. So they pay only 25, 26 percent tax. That wasn't enough. They needed something else to give them even more tax breaks. And the real estate community came up with this so-called opportunity zone, well, it's an opportunity for the very rich to pay less tax. Uh, to market this, they had to use a slogan which appealed to you to have the kind of conversation you're having of how can we take advantage of this opportunity. But it's not for you. It's for the billionaires. And my request to you is what the federal government has given by tax breaks, you take away through impact fees. Boulder is a very, a very um, attractive place for investors to invest. They will come. They will, in 2017, property was too expensive. Uh, the biggest problem Boulder has is income inequality, primarily because of the cost of land. So developers come, they'll invest, and I heard Mr. Yates say that there's a shortage of a, uh, of a fund which is for uh, affordable housing. It's going empty. So investors come, invest under existing laws, but for every square foot you build, pay $20 to your fund. Um, that is my request to you, that you reverse the, the benefit of the federal tax uh, system. Uh, again, it is, it is not an opportunity, it's a threat to our community, and minimize that threat by replacing the tax with the, the tax which the federal government took away. Thank you. Thank you. John? Oh, okay. Good evening. Wait, oh, can you hang on a second? A question? Uh, well, I need a motion to continue the meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Sorry. It's a thing we do. Okay. Ready to roll? Yeah. Uh, John Koval, 2245 16th Street. Um, I'm going to make an attempt to try to humanize a little bit of the discussion from the real estate perspective. I am in the real estate development business. And, you know, the Opportunity Zone. How it came to us, um, obviously we heard a lot about it, everybody's talking about it, there was a lot of buzz. Um, I think staff did a great job presenting uh, a pretty complex uh, set of issues and a lot of things aren't determined yet and we acknowledge that. Um, you know, it's sort of our, our typical year end, our CPA came and talked to us and said, hey, these opportunity zones are gonna be coming into effect, there's opportunities in Boulder, there's opportunities in other parts of the state, other parts of the country that you work. Um, Here's what we know about them so far. Here's how they work. And, you know, from my perspective, it was presented as their opportunities and their opportunities to make projects better. It wasn't presented as, oh, you got to get in on this. You got to do it now. Hurry up. Um, it just wasn't put out that way. It was a really practical, um, pretty constructive conversation. Then we talked about our other business and, and went to lunch. We had a few follow up questions. And as staff indicated, a lot of things are still trying to be worked out. So I think this um, perception that, you know, everybody in the real estate business is clamoring to do stuff in opportunity zones, um, we just don't see that from our colleagues and what we are experiencing necessarily. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, working in affordable housing projects and other uh, tax supported um, projects, it's a heavy, heavily regulated thing. It's not necessarily gonna be a fit for every single project. And the one thing that I know is nothing changed as far as our zoning laws, nothing changed as far as process rules relative to the opportunity zone. So we still have an opportunity to, as a community to look at these projects as they come forward. I really think the opportunity zone is an opportunity to, as, as we're starting to talk about, um, create projects in a better way. So hopefully, uh, you won't pass the moratorium, and good luck. Happy holidays. Thanks. Thank you. Michael? And after Michael, we have Leonard May. Is Leonard out there? Okay. Well, then Boyd Hamilton should be ready. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi, good evening, Mike is Eric. I'm from Ball Aerospace. Um, we're located 1600 Commerce Street. Been here since 1956. Uh, it was a few, actually a year or so ago here. In fact, um, we were kind enough to receive an award uh, here for the chamber. For a, a long-standing community resident, we, we certainly believe we're part of Boulder community in the fabric. Um, and so I come here tonight to say uh, for us, uh, while space wasn't on the bad list, um, unfortunately what we do uh, to protect what matters most, to explore the universe, requires offices on occasion. Um, and so, uh, and the permitting process that we enjoy with the staff for many of our facilities, I mean, I can't quite tell on that list, but it didn't look, it didn't look good uh, from us. So for us and our ability to plan for our business, some of our projects like the James Webb Space Telescope or Hubble take years of planning. Um, it's such a kind of a shock to a moratorium on our ability to um, manipulate our facilities would be disastrous to our business. Um, and it would certainly impair our ability to continue to do business here in Boulder and we really would hate to see that. So again, I would, I don't, I don't understand and don't claim it's not my business for opportunity funds in real estate and so I, I, I remain respectful of your decisions there. I would only ask as others who happened apparently to be in a heck of a zone, uh, you know, we've been there since 56, um, <laughs> has really complicated uh, our business for, for reasons that we, we really have nothing to do with and, and, and don't really fully understand. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions for you. Sure. Aaron uh, and then Lisa. Thanks for coming here tonight. Do you, do you all expect that you might have some need for additional space in the next couple of years? Um, more renovation for us, I would say, for the existing facilities we have. Um, we have explored other um, uh, ability to create new projects, which we have on pause at the moment. We've, we've talked with the city about that before. But the mo moment thing for us because of that is, is really renovations. Okay, thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I had a similar question. And what, what you anticipate as your needs and things. I mean, it would be terrible to see ball go because it's sits so well with what we do here in Boulder and the federal labs, the university, all of that. So um, in terms of your anticipated needs, um, what are they? Yeah, mainly, again, in renovation. I mean, aer aerospace today is experiencing growth across mm -hmm. uh, there, and, and I think the company is experiencing that as well, managing as best we can across our campuses. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do the best we can. But the renovation of facilities, uh, clean rooms, uh, the things we need to do to build hardware as well as office space that accompanies that is, is our main foreseeable, uh, I, I would say, projects we have in the future. So on your renovations, do they require a change in use? I mean, you guys are doing what you already do. Yeah, the only thing I, I, again, and it was hard to interpret from a few bullet points, but the thing that would concern us would be office space. Mm -hmm. If we add an extra cube in, no. is that gonna, yeah. that, that's the main concern oh. we have. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Oh, we have another one. So if you add an extra cube of office space and therefore get triggered into this moratorium because you've added some, some space, do you anticipate that you would be using funds from an O fund to finance that space? No, we do not. Okay. I don't think we fully That's understand. what I'm talking about before. I know, I love, yeah, yeah I, was, I was with you. <laughs> There's so many people that are gonna get caught up in this. Okay, hold okay. that thought. Thank you. Uh, Leonard May, no, we said Leonard wasn't here. Um, Boyd. And after Boyd, if Mark Painter could be ready. Mayor Jones, City Council, I'm Boyd Hamilton. I'm the property manager at 29th Street Mall. Uh, you should have received a letter from me uh, on behalf of Maestrich uh, today. So as you're aware, uh, malls uh, are failing around the country. Uh, ours isn't. And it's because uh, we're nimble in the community. There's a need for our center in this community, and the multi multifunctional aspects uh, we've developed. And those include retail, restaurants, fitness, office, financial. Additionally, the development of 29th Street North adds a, a housing element. As the largest tax revenue generator in the city, we want to ensure that we're able to remain the economic and uh, community engine that was collaborated on during the reimagining of the former Crossroads Mall with the city, community, and matrix. And uh, got to be able to breathe. <clears throat> we ask that no moratorium be put in place, but if it's found to be necessary, that it be narrow in scope and should take into consideration that when we get a new tenant, the tenant must get a permit 
for a new use or a mod um, modernization of the premises. Whether it's a small office, uh, retail use, or any other commercial use uh, currently allowed at 29th Street. Uh, a moratorium that would prevent us from replacing tenants with uses already allowed at 29th Street would put the vision, uh, the vibrancy uh, of the community and the sales tax revenue at risk. Thank you for your time. Question. We have some questions. Oh, sure. So um, thank you for coming, Mr. Hamilton. Um, have you read the uh, Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan um, goals for the uh, Boulder Regional Center? I don't think so. Okay. But well, I, I will. <laughs> I, I would suggest that you do that because we have seen something that happened in the regional center uh, today, yesterday, that goes exactly against what is in our comprehensive planning document, which was just updated a year ago or so. And so I would just ask that you take a look at that because it describes where we think as a community that that best directions for that um, property are. So okay. thank you for coming. Thank you. That particular case aside, um, when you have um, retail tenants, I, I assume that's mostly what you're referring to, retail tenants that? Well, I think that one of the, one of the things that maybe I didn't explain very well is one of the reasons that we remain vibrant is that we've become multifaceted in the use. So. Uh, you know, retail, I've been in the retail business my entire career, uh, and sometimes it doesn't make it. So you've got to find another use that is viable for, for the space. So um, my question then would be, how often, when you do a change of use, um, is there um, construction beyond the square footage that is already there? Uh, very seldom. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mark? Nancy. Good evening, Mark Painter, uh, 2121 Calmia Circle. I'm an attorney representing uh, Mace Rich and 29th Street. And I wanted to follow up, was the, was the question about what happened today, was that the Macy's application? It is, but it happened in the Boulder Valley Regional Center, so I don't hold Mace Rich accountable for that, but it right. is, it is uh, an example of a tenant, a business, who, going against what the community's been right. asking for. I just wanted to make sure it was clear that Macy's owns its site. Right, it is clear. Yeah. Mace Rich doesn't control that um, at all. Um, it's, it's hard to speak passionately about things in the code. Uh, positively, uh, but I want to try and put a little bit of perspective on this. We have a tax department in our firm. They're still trying to figure out what all of this is, and we don't have uh, investors and clients jumping on board uh, to invest in these funds. People are looking at it, and as John Koval said, it is something that's just kind of plodding through, but it's, it's very amorphous right now. But I want to say that Opportunity Zones are a limited tax benefit and incentive for a long-term investment. So are low-income housing tax credits. Those appeal to what are being referred to as folks who have a lot of money. Uh, people who don't have a lot of money don't invest in tax credits. Same applies to opportunity zones. Same applies to solar tax credits. All of these are incentives that go out to try and draw investment money in that wouldn't come in otherwise. And so when we're talking, we don't demonize all of those other things and say, oh, these are wealthy people who are coming in to rape, pillage, and plunder our community. We're trying to use this as an incentive to bring them in. And so I, I would hope that council looks at this less as a threat and can I have a little time just yeah. because of the back and forth? Yeah. Um, look at it less as a threat and more as an opportunity uh, because you have control of whether these projects go forward. Uh, these are not, this is not a sword that is used against the community to force bad development on it. It is an opportunity to help bring money in and that is completely controlled by you. And as, as Mr. Hamilton said, Mace Ridge and 29th Street do not benefit at all from this. But if you impose a moratorium, 
and they have a tenant that leaves, and I think he misspoke when he said seldom. We have applications for use review here all the time when a tenant turns over. And if you have a moratorium in place and we have a tenant that leaves, we're gonna have empty space. So um, please bear that in mind as you think about the collateral damage of a mortgage. So just uh, yes. a quick clarification. The question was not whether or not use reviews occur, but whether or not they are, there are increases in square footage. Oh, true. There are some increases in square footage that have occurred, um, but those don't happen that often. Thank Correct. you. Were you consulted by staff during this process? Consulted our city by staff. Did anyone contact you from the city during no. this process? No. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? No. Okay. Thank you. Sue. And after Sue, Andrea. Is Andrea here? Yeah. Hello. Uh, Sue Pran, I live at 3172 29th Street. Um, I live one block from the Diagonal Plaza. Somebody who's owned a condo in this neighborhood for 13 years, we'd like to see something besides a parking lot. The sooner the better. The big empty parking lot at the Diagonal is not the only blight in our neighborhood. Next door to my condo complex are two used, park, used car parking lots, one with a giant pile of tires. There are multiple auto, auto service stations and fast food places within a block of my neighborhood. I love my neighborhood because it's easy to get to many places by bike and transit, but my neighborhood is really far from beautiful. The majority of housing rentals included are individually owned or permanently affordable housing. There's a lot of fear mongering around this issue. So while the majority of housing in the area is definitely rentals, I would ask staff to provide facts about around how many single owner apartment buildings there are versus people renting out individually owned condos, because that makes a big difference in this argument about big large properties being brought out, bought out. Uh, the more housing built at at all income levels, the more it provides a safety valve to keep the older multifamily housing units like my own affordable. Our condos are getting expensive because there's nothing else for people to buy, not because they're particularly desirable condos, to be frank. Um, so some moratorium do more study. Council passed a height moratorium in 2015. It was supposed to be 24 months at most. We're at four years without it being revisited. And now we're asked to trust the mor moratorium um, is not a stall tactic. The current land use in my neighbor is pretty awful. We can't wait four years to have things improve. We're looking forward to all sorts of different things happening in the neighborhood to make it less blighted and more vibrant. And finally, uh, one of the things totally depressing about this and so many other issues in this community is I thought we were supposed to be welcoming and inclusive. And that means to everybody. There's also awful lot of demonizing and fear mongering about the tech community, everybody else, things staff did, they're just trying to make up sales tax. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Sue. Andrea, and then is Chris Shears here. Okay. Andrea Menegel, uh, 2440 Pearl Street, speaking on behalf of the Boulder Chamber tonight. And, um, you know, it's disappointing to see that some of the discourse on this issue is going towards looking at this designation as a threat when we should be having the conversation about the opportunity that we have here. How do we utilize this to achieve all the things we want to try to get in this community? How do we go to a positive place yet a moratorium is being contemplated? And that moratorium would limit the investments and assistance for those that need it and that would qualify for it. Uh, the Boulder Chamber submitted a letter yesterday to you that tried to highlight some of the types of developments and investments that could benefit this community and that are critical to the area and that are critical not to be banned or um, permitted from going forward. So what are those things? It's creating those affordable commercial spaces for small businesses. It's projects and services and uses that have some kind of community benefit. It's allowing for adaptive reuse of spaces that are otherwise vacant. It's the mixed use development near transit lines, uh, corridors, and underutilized commercial parcels to promote walkable access to employment, commercial services, live and work options for creative professionals, places for the arts and culture, uh, nonprofits that are planning to build their headquarters. The, the list goes on. It's extensive. But as Mr. Gare pointed out tonight, a moratorium means no exemptions. It means um, no provisions to allow these things. So in the meantime, Boulder misses out. 
This opportunity is all about timing. The moratorium is designed to create savings and opportunities if we can capitalize it. If we stall, we miss those opportunities. So Council Member Young posted something yesterday and it was looking at how to use this in the best possible way that we can in all our planning and I hope that the rest of the council can look at it that way, to look at what can we achieve, what can we do to utilize this opportunity that we have in front of us, and so it's positive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, and then is Peter Awida out there? Yeah, okay. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Chris Shears, 365 Quail Circle. Um, my company, Sears Atkins Rockmore, the architects working with Quorum Real Estate, uh, and Macy's to develop a proposal uh, for adaptive reuse of the Macy's, Macy's uh, property. You've received a letter uh, from Jessica Fraser, who's the Director of Development for Macy's, regarding Macy's intentions, and that letter uh, has been made public. Um, the letter states clearly that the existence of an opportunity zone had nothing to do with Macy's decision uh, to redevelop. Um, any um, suggestion of that is, is simply uh, inaccurate. Uh, Macy's and the development team, uh, the design team, the engineering team, uh, and other consultants, and all of us have been working on this for just a little under two years. Uh, everybody involved only learned about this at the same time you did. I want to confirm, um, as you know by now, as you have heard earlier, uh, that we did submit a complete application uh, for site review yesterday afternoon. Um, it's a compelling proposal uh, that will adapt this building to an appropriate combination of retail, office, and possibly other uses. Uh, it's consistent with the existing zoning. This will require uh, opening up the building uh, for light and views and will bring needed activity and new life to the north end of 29th Street, including the now relatively dormant public plaza. We submitted our site review yesterday because we would like the opportunity to have a discussion with the community to work with staff, planning board, city council, uh, and to further develop our proposal that we are convinced will benefit 29th Street, the community, occupants, and the owner. Thank you. Mr. Shears. Mr. Shears, oh, we have, we some, have some questions yes, for you. Yes, sir. So I will ask you, have you read the Boulder Valley Comp Plan section that applies to the Boulder Valley Regional Center? We've reviewed uh, the comp plan, yes. What, what does it say in there about the design? I can't, I, I can't quote that right now. Yeah. Well, I will be happy to. Please do. For you. Um, it says um, that the intention for future development of the comp plan is to increase residential capacity, preserve retail, and to decrease um, occupational capacity. So I would just ask that you review the intentions of the community as stated in the recently adopted comp plan with your clients and realize that that was a result of a couple, three years worth of work at coming up with the vision for how development will go there. So I would appreciate it if you would do that. Well, I would hope that, that you would entertain some ideas associated with the challenges of redeve redeveloping and reusing a big box. It's not an easy uh, thing to do, and I would like the opportunity to have that discussion. Thank you. Um, we have another question. So I just want to know um, if you could tell me what percentage of, your, of the development um, application is retail and what percentage is office? That's up for discussion, as you and I and you, you and I have discussed that. Um, I think through this process, we would be interested in increasing retail, especially on the south side of the building, which fronts the plaza. Uh, we've even thought internally about a food court of some kind, uh, much like some of them that have been uh, proposed in Denver, and uh, by the way, have been very successful. Uh, these are the kinds of, of I think uh, discussions that we would like to have. Um, we understand that some of you are probably not happy with the fact that we submitted yesterday, but we have been working on this for a year and a half. We think we have a compelling idea and would just like the opportunity to present it. So could you answer what's the percentage of office? Because I looked at those, those plans 
and it was a very small percentage of retail. And tell me how much. I don't. A I, lot of I don't. I don't know what the percentage is. Right, but it's office is a much greater use than. Oh yes. Retail. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, and then is Eric out there? Yep. Good evening. Uh, I'll try to not regurgitate a lot of what's already been said. <clears throat> um, this seems like uh, an ordinance a moratorium that is following a pattern of changes without consultation to those that would be affected by it. Uh, it's based on pure rumors and speculation about what may or may not happen. Uh, my company owns eight properties, uh, industrial properties around 55th and Arapaho that would be affected by this moratorium, although, as staff said, you know, we may not have room for increased square footage or uh, some of the uh, criteria for uh, what this will allow. Um, but I think the real question is why, why is this even uh, an issue? Um, there's no emergency necessitating these actions. Uh, uh, there's no way to anticipate the unintended consequences to Boulder's economy businesses or uh, city tax revenues. And uh, we all want, uh, I, I found it rich that the plan Boulder people were talking about affordable housing, but they don't want it near them. Um, uh, we already have a rigorous review process in place in the city, and uh, these ordinances are, uh, this moratorium is not necessary. Uh, but the most disturbing part of it is the lack of a public process for this. Um, it uh, seems like fast-tracked and uh, a solution without a problem. Um, a moratorium just seems a little bit extreme for uh, what we're talking about today, and it's more than just a pause. And uh, you know, some of the moratoriums, well, one of them that's, that was, uh, was already passed a few years ago uh, has been less than temporary, shall we say. So um, I would uh, hope that Cooler heads can prevail here. We wouldn't do a knee-jerk reaction. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Eric, and after Eric, we have Sean. Okay. Good evening. My name is Eric Kampf. There's two P's in my last name. Happens all the time. No big deal. Um, so I'm uh, Eric Kampf with Quorum Real Estate Group. I'm here on behalf of Macy's. Uh, they're located at 1929th Street. And as you're aware, the retail environment uh, locally, nationally, is dynamic, a dynamic, rapidly changing market. As part of the changing landscape, the composition of commercial shopping centers that Boyd discussed earlier is migrating towards an experience-based, mixed-use, live, work, and play environment. 29th Street is no exception and is already providing this model and through its existing mix of uses. As retail continues to evolve, Macy's is taking steps to evolve with it. In early 2017, we as a development team began studying the real estate in Colorado, specifically in Boulder, as a viable opportunity to reinvent and adaptively reuse the building. By the summer of 2017, after a thorough review of all the potential alternatives, given the logistical constraints of the real estate, and under the context of the current zoning, and under the context of the 29th Street review documents currently in place, our team concluded that adaptively repurposing the building and converting it to other uses, principally focused on office, was the most viable, cost-effective, long-term strategy uh, for the property. This strategy will allow us to recycle the building into a modern, sustainable, and renewable manner, adding vibrancy, natural light, energy efficiency, while creating a project that reflects its current zoning. Further, it would be complementary and supportive to the existing mixed uses at 29th Street. Any alternative uses would require demolition and a rezone, which would simply not be cost effective. Macy's decision to reinvest in the building was made nearly two years ago in order to allow Macy's brand to adapt in the changing retail marketplace. I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you. That's how that works. Thank you. I have a question for you. Oh. Yes. Let me guess what it is. Oh. <laughs> in all of this planning that you did and the studies, did you read the sections of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan that speak specifically to 
the Boulder Valley Regional Center? We looked at it in context of the broader 29th Street Mall, and I look forward to discussing these issues with you through the process. Okay, so I will just remind you that they uh, specifically called for preservation of retail, more housing, and fewer occupational jobs. So I would just look forward to having that conversation with you as well. Excited but if you want to be ready, it's section policy 2.18. Roger that. And, Thank you. And you you did quote that before, Sam. We, we did hear it the first time. I, I just wanted to say it directly to the real estate developer. Would you repeat that, please, Sam? Yeah, I, I didn't know, hear I it. <laughs> um, you also have the option of selling to an opportunity fund if we give you too hard of a time. That, that is a distinct option. Um, but, <clears throat> but that is not our goal tonight. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Sh Sean. And then Ben, okay. Good evening, mayors, uh, members of council, Sean Coleman, 3250 O'Neill Circle, representing myself for the first time before you in the better part of a decade. And the reason for that is because this issue is important to me, as many of you know me for the better part of a decade, as my friends, colleagues, but in no, in no case is my neighbor, <laughs> right? I can see Diagonal Plaza from both my balcony and my bedroom window. This is my neighborhood for the past, uh, I get more than a decade. Um, we are ready for investment in our community. If we were going to get investment in our community through other means, I think it would have happened by now. We have a unique opportunity to bring together the very few owner-occupied residents in our community, like myself and Sue. The reason why there's so few of us left is because so many of those units have already been sold to uh, to developers and investors because it no longer does it make sense for the jobs that are available in the city where a person can own a 600 square foot condo that costs $250,000. When I look at the uh, demographics of my neighborhood, um, a quote from the movie Amadeus comes to mind. I'm not living in poverty, but I'm broke, right? So what we have is an opportunity to not only make sure that we create opportunity for the residents who do live in this neighborhood, who do want to see our community pr pr improved and do see services, but also in so doing, perhaps we can actually help the, our vulnerable neighbors that we already have living at Diagonal Plaza who we've seen such little sympathy for. So I ask you to, instead of taking a short-sighted view on fear, take the long view that I, and many others who have invested in that part of this community for more than a decade do not pass as more. Thank you that Diagonal Plaza is not included in it, but in order to make sure that this conversation is honest in the broader community and that all the stakeholders, including the residents of the community, are involved, that please do not pass the moratorium. Instead, use this energy to move forward on bringing people together so that we can finally improve the, our community that we've been wanting to do for uh, really 20 years. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Ben. And then Karen. Is Karen still here? <coughs> yep. Well, good evening. Uh, ben Binder. I live in South Boulder. I, I think it's appalling that two and a half square miles of Boulder were included in a program designed to encourage and accelerate development of economically depressed areas. And I think it's inexcusable that this was done by staff without the knowledge and consent of the city council. I've been here long enough to remember when the old Crossroads Mall was declared blighted in the early 80s in order to give it tax advantages and set up the Boulder Urban Renewal. There was public hearings and there was a blight study. The same with the St. Julian Hotel. So now you have 2.5 square miles of the city of Boulder uh, put in this economic development uh, zone without any consultation with the city council. Staff talked about all the work that was done, looking at all the different um, census zones in order to choose the correct one that would work best. And, and during all that time, were you ever consulted? Are you incensed that this took place without your consent? <coughs> I uh, would ser seriously question the statement that being in the, uh, in the uh, opportunity zone is uh, irreversible. I would, I would look and to see the documentation for that decision. I would use your contacts with our government, the governor to get out of the in, uh, opportunity zone if that's your desire. I question each one of you as to whether or not you really want to put up with this big morass 
Your zoning regulations are complex enough without having to deal with all the issues that are being brought up tonight. So I suggest that you, oh, one, decide amongst yourselves whether you really want us to be in this uh, opportunity zone with all this investment coming in from out of state investors that are very wealthy that are trying to get tax advantages, or whether we would be better off without it. And if you think we'd be better off without it, use your attorneys and 17th Street attorneys and contacts to get the hell out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karen and then Lynn. Karen Holweg, 4440 Greenbrier Boulevard. Thank you for listening to all of us tonight. And I just, in brief, want to say that contrary to the views expressed on the camera's Sunday editorial pages um, that spoke instead of regulation to the need for incentives, I see government regulation as necessary. I fully support your proposal to have a moratorium in the opportunity zone to constrain uses and shape development. And as a middle income resident, I want to see you pursue the goals we established in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan and address the jobs housing imbalance. I want to see you enhance our efforts to provide affordable housing for low and middle income folks and local neighborhood retail space. So please do not allow the Opportunity Zone to be used to establish more high-cost office space, attracting more high-paying jobs and their impacts on our community, and implement the moratorium. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Lynn, and then John Taylor. Lynn Siegel, Mountain Heights. Let's get real. Maybe Detroit needs an opportunity zone. You know, Boulder's not Detroit. We need a ban. I go to your sister at the county commissioners with regards to fracking, and it's not moratoriums I'm talking about, ban. I don't know if you can save anything financially with lawyers to see if we can get out of this or if we can just ban it. That will be simple. Apple, Amazon, Google, we got plenty of bucks in this community. The last thing we need is steroids added to steroids. And we got a big jobs housing imbalance. And, you know, I guess there's kind of a dilemma here with Macy's because I go there every six years to get underwear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I guess I can do that on Amazon. <laughs> so, thank you, Lynn. Uh, <laughs> TMI comes up, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, John Terre, uh representing Boulder Chamber. And, and you, you have two poolers? Oh, yeah, I got two poolers. Two arms. Yeah. Sweet. All righty. Um, so Adam and I did not choreograph this, but he is in fact right that you would hear the definition of um, opportunity and moratorium. So here we go. Opportunity, a set of circumstances that make it possible to do something. Moratorium, prohibition of an activity. Many of the people coming before you tonight or who sent messages are talking about opportunity. Opportunity to keep their businesses moving forward, improve the city of Boulder tax base in the face of flat revenue, flat revenue relative to inflation, and certainly relative to our neighboring communities. Develop creative mixed use walkable spaces and to improve their community. They represent the spirit of Boulder, our creative businesses that are leading the world in science, natural foods and medicines, just to name a few. The residents 
who believe that we can do more to protect our environment and support social equity. Representatives for organizations that support biking, business, and affordable housing. Contrast that with the language of those who talk of moratorium. They speak of fear. They want to stop change. They are closing off options. That is not about solving problems. That is the talk of giving up and the place where ideas go to die. Or, in the words of one writer who uh, spoke to you, by passing this moratorium, quote, the city of Boulder is clearly on the path to closing the door on all development. The unattended consequences are enormous, unquote. I like to think of our city as a place of innovation, a place where smart people come together and allow creative creativity to flourish, where no one or no idea is demonized. Opportunity zones are just that, the opportunity to pursue, pursue projects that otherwise wouldn't be feasible, to be creative and innovative for the common good. Yes, with too much opportunity comes risks, which is the very reason we have the backstop of the comprehensive plan, zoning rules, and public review processes to avoid potential violations of community standards. At the same time, there has been talk of infusing greater equity and character into our future development. That is the talk of opportunity that happens when we work together to move our community forward, not close things down and it is the conversation the Boulder Chamber welcomes. Please don't become the moratorium council, the council that caters to unfounded fears and closes off options. Be the city council that is worthy of the spirit of this town, a town that comes together to resolve issues with all our creativity, innovative spirit at our disposal a town that is capable of being a model for how we balance the challenges of keeping a place like Boulder special while balancing our environmental, economic, and social values. A town that thinks before it leaps into dangerous new territory of prohibition and regulation in response to unfounded fears. Please oppose the proposed moratorium and instead Let's take advantage of the opportunities the Opportunity Zone creates. Thank you. Oh, we have a question for you. Yeah. John. Have you read the yeah. comp plan. Just kidding. Just yeah, kidding. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh my God, I'm screwed. I, I knew. Chapter and verse, I can quote it. Have a copy of the comp plan. <laughs> I do. Well, old one. Do you, John, did the Chamber of Commerce consult with city staff before this was put into place? Actually, I'll be very quite clear about what happened. We were contacted by the city, and they said, our city staff, and they said they were interested in pursuing it, and we thought, I don't think we're going to be eligible. We had, that was our initial response. And then when they said that they were interested in um, pursuing it, we said, that sounds great, and they put the program together and, and submitted it. And, and we were certainly supportive of that, but we didn't have to take any actions to pursue that. Did you consult with anyone in the community, like Ball Aerospace or Boulder Community Hospital or the folks out th right behind you over there? The Hopper? Thank you. Yeah, no, we, with we, anyone? I mean, this we didn't because this was not our action to take. This was an action that the city of Boulder was pursuing, not the, not the um, Boulder Chamber. So we weren't engaged in it other than to just hear that this was going forward and to understand that it was a uh, So, and I, and I won't comment now, but I'll comment later. But I would like mm -hmm. for Sam, Sam, would you please repeat the, what our tax um, use and sales taxes are doing this year? Um, we're up 3.2%. 3.2%, and inflation's about 2.3%. And if you look around the, the regions, many communities are double-digit um, sales tax Different increases reasons. during a time when our economy is booming. So that would give you concern just because as we maybe approach a downturn, we wouldn't be in as strong a position as some of these other communities that have seen exceptional growth. So. It's something to be concerned about. Certainly, uh, it's not at zero. You're right, Sam. Um, but we, we see a flat tax um, is not um, a positive uh, step for our community. And I suppose, well, you probably saw Friday's paper. You know, Apple's coming here. They're going to be adding hundreds of jobs. Do you mm -hmm. think they're taking advantage of our 
being in need of an opportunity zone too. Maybe that's it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so, Cindy, yeah. but, but I, I mean, I, where some welcome those, um, a business like that in our community, I understand um, that there's um, others who have concern about um, that type of additional development. That's the kind of conversation the Boulder Chamber welcomes, but we see it as a positive for our community to have that kind of diversity in our economy. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, we're gonna motor through Judy <coughs> Nog and then Eric. Okay. Hi, Judy Nog, Boulder, and I'm speaking just for myself. And I'm just gonna mention a few things that I haven't heard before. And um, thank you for your presentation, and thank you for giving attention to this particular issue. Um, I think that you all can come up with a great exemption process for people for whom would be harmed by a, this moratorium. I think that the 30-month time limit um, is mitigated by the fact that it looks like you can apply all the way up to 2026, so I don't see a real hurry or need to hurry on this. Um, my biggest concern is that the federal government doesn't have any idea what it's doing yet. They can't give the guidelines. And so the dangers of whatever they decide certainly would require that you go slow on this project. I also want to say, since Sam, you talked about the comp plan, um, I read the comp plan, and there's, um, it's incumbent upon city council to be very thoughtful, the word thoughtful is used about development, so it's actually your mandate to go slow with this and be thoughtful in your planning since the, there are so many unknowns. I also want to add, I really like John Tare, as he as he knows, and we get along great. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and we get along great, and all the things that John hopes for, as far as how this place is developed, this area is developed, I also hope for, and that's why I'm for the moratorium, because I think there's too much risk to those things not happening unless there is a moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. <coughs> and then Renee will be last up. Hello, uh, Eric Budd, I live at the Ingram Housing Cooperative. I think a lot of people in the audience and all of us can agree that from a federal perspective, an economic perspective, that the Opportunity Zone is not a very good policy. It's one that gives a lot of money to a lot of people who already have a lot of capital and they're going to generate profits off of that capital. But from a local perspective, I really appreciate the work that the staff and city manager have put into this because from the local perspective, it's our job to do the most to get the most out of our federal policy. And that's what I believe is happening here. And so what I really wanna say is that I appreciate the thought of going slow and to have a careful planning process, but I believe that's not what this moratorium is. When you look at the people affected in this room, the people affected are affected by your moratorium, not by the Opportunity Zone. And as Councilman Weaver has made the point several times tonight, we have a comprehensive plan, we have zoning, we have all of these tools available to us to prevent development from giving us what we need and to make sure that the development that we have is to the benefit of the community. So please use those tools. Don't use the hammer of the moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. Renee, last up. Hello. Um, Renee Hommel, Vista Village. Um, first, I wanna thank council for all the wonderful support that you've given over the years to our mobile, to our manufactured home communities. So thank you very much for that. Um, as you know, Vista Village is one of the two manufactured home parks within the um, Opportunity Zone. And, um, you know, there's been a little conversation with Council about whether or not we could be impacted, and uh, chances are not, but um, as I said in my email to Council, just as this process goes on, you know, just be alert to anything that might come up. You know, it's like 10 years, Councils can change. Permanent zoning for manufactured home communities, 
How permanent is it? I don't know. Um, so that's that's just on that side. In terms of the moratorium and other things I've heard tonight, uh, someone used the phrase, you know, think before leaping. And um, I know this opportunity came up and staff and city manager had very little time to think about it and maybe not bring it to council, but I personally feel very distressed that Boulder has ended up in this situation without any ability for council to deliberate. And, um, you know, I don't expect an answer now, but I'm just curious, um, you know, how this could have happened and if there's gonna be steps in place to prevent such things from happening again in the future. Um, in terms of the moratorium, I, I'm just wondering, is it possible to make like a six month moratorium renewable in six month increments instead of an 18 month moratorium uh, to kind of balance things for uh, people who do have very legitimate concerns about um, hampering their development? Um, so, um, uh, and just one thing, in terms of this uh, thing of, you know, basing it on fact, not fear, um, I think there's enough information out there about similar programs in other places that similar programs have led to gentrification and displacement, so that is a concern. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, we're gonna <laughs> close the public hearing. Um, I do wanna thank everybody, I think we all do, um, for coming out, for sharing your concerns with the folks that e emailed us. This is an important issue, and um, we're taking it very seriously. I guess the one thing I would like to say by way of context is, is some people have said, why are we doing this? And I think, just to be clear, if we're gonna get an infusion of investment in our community, we wanna make sure we have the right policies and zoning in place. And as was mentioned several times, hmm. We just went through a comp, comp plan process that articulated sort of the latest vision of our community. We have now to implement and update the regs per that plan, and we are still in the middle of doing that. And so that's what this is about, is making sure we have the right things in place to get what we want. Now, whether or not we needed a moratorium to finish that work or not is what we're gonna discuss, but I just wanna make real clear that we have some rules that we need to update, and it's never a really good time to update the rules because inevitably somebody gets caught in the process. But that's what this is about, is making sure we get the outcomes we want. So just in case that's not clear, and part of this discussion, although it is late, is what work do we need to do to update those regs so we're good to go? How long is that gonna take, and do we need a moratorium while we finish that? because as I think Macy's just illustrated, uh, they put in a project for something based on old, old, the old vision, and we need to make sure we have the new vision in place. So I just wanted to set the context for this exercise so it's really clear to people. Um, I don't think it's because we love moratoriums, it's because we need to have the right rules in place, and that's our job to try to make that happen. So with that, um, I just oh, and you wanted to add something. No, to I, just wanted, I just want to add um, a comment that I saw in one of the links that staff put in the packet. And um, it was five points on how to proceed with an opportunity zone. Two of them were that um, to be proactive and that urgency is key. And so I think that's why we're here tonight as well. And um, the others were like, think like an investor and um, things like that, but I thought that these were very um, pertinent to what we're doing here tonight and why we're doing it, and um, I just wanted to share it. The other thing I wanted to ask um, my colleagues um, that, you know, as we saw um, earlier <coughs> this evening with um, Sarah Silver and Chris Nelson coming forward um, and, um, and showing to us what um, civility and respect can lead to and um, can lead to great working relationships and um, and solutions. So I hope that as we move into this discussion, we follow their lead and um, and have a civil, respectful, and um, and calm conversation. And I know emotions are high, so I hope that we can have a calm conversation. Yep. Okay. Well, let's let's talk process here. Uh, Can I ask a question yeah. first? Yeah. Um, so I wasn't going to talk process. I was going to see if we could get an uh, answer from staff about what the situation for the hopper is. 
I had mentioned that at CAC. Um, sure. Charles Farrell Planning Department, what's the specific question? Well, so there was concern, I, I think, that they could be caught up in the moratorium, and my understanding after speaking with staff was twofold, that um, they weren't necessarily gonna add floor area, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't come under that. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if they'd been in touch with staff about their project and if there's been any kind of movement or pre-application. They have, we've had pre-application discussions. They're located in the IS2 zone district, if memory serves me. Um, I'll admit they're, bit, they're a bit of a hybrid, kind of a funky use, so we're having trouble assigning a, um, uh, a category um, but it's really more like a, a museum as we understand it with some accessory uses. So I don't think in this case that they would be affected by the moratorium. Okay, both because they're not expanding their footprint and further because- Just really more the use. They're not an office. They're not a financial use. Well, we may go somewhere else with right. that, but meaning, meaning also that since they've been in pre-application, we could say that that qualifies enough to not to be grandfathered mm -hmm. in. I would look to David to respond to that. The, the question would be just how you would define what a pre-application communication is. Um, all the other ones that we've ever used, that they're, it's, we tie them to a distinct regulatory event and <coughs> pre I see. Okay, pre yeah. not. Okay, thank you. So, okay. so could I just follow up on that and the fact that they're not expanding their footprint and they don't fall into what at least are now um, Sure, and I haven't seen any plans, but if they're just, you know, right. adaptively reusing existing space, then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's Thank good. You. Well, as long as we're on this topic, so, so just to distinguish, some folks have talked about renovations, and can we just, you've said it once, but let's say it again, about what would be captured or not captured, and what's being proposed at this time? Well, the, the, the way we drafted it, was that we were really tying it to the addition of new floor area. So um, we actually made a conscious decision in terms of the drafting to not put conversions into any type of like tenant finish conversion type um, building permits into the moratorium. So it, if that's not being regulated as drafted. But a significant change in use we could yeah I, I think that that's a policy discussion okay. that you guys you. need to have okay um but okay so i don't want to spend too long time on it but i do think it would be useful to pause and go the work that needs to get done the rules we want to change before we talk about the moratorium can we do that i know that might be a little backwards but to me it it lays the foundation for whether we need a, uh, a moratorium can we do that yeah. sure okay no, ooh, that was a sigh. It's just we, we, we have all this stuff on our work plan. I mean, we, we kind of know what we're working on, what's queued up. I mean, you could talk about reprioritizing it because there's a feeling that there's more urgency, but I mean, I think we, isn't that our work plan that you're talking about? Well, I just think it's useful to, the things that need to change in order for us to feel secure about investment monies coming in, I think it's worth somebody articulating that. It, okay, okay, so. For, for me, what I want to start from is a position of do no harm. And so when I look at who or what is most vulnerable, I look at our lower income people and um, housing opportunities. Mm -hmm. So when we look at mobile home parks, um, I think Ms. Hummel was completely right. There isn't any, even though today we have uh, permanent manufactured housing in, as a zone, there isn't any guarantee that this council can hold, um, um, can force a future council to follow our, our rules today. And so what I would like to do with respect to the mobile home um, or the manufactured housing zones is I would like to put some kind of a rental cap on, on that and to ask staff to look at how that rental cap could be implemented. The second place now I would look at would be um, all of the residential units that are in this opportunity zone. And um, 
the potential for them to be bought up by investors, scraped, and redeveloped, and another East Point development occur. I do not want to have that. So I would like to put um, a ban on all demolition in the opportunity zones. And, um, and I'll just leave it there right now um, because you want it to know what we want it to do um, without, an op without a moratorium. But I'm just setting it up um, that we want to protect what we have and uh, make sure we um, continue to have that without the radical change we see right now. Yeah. Um, totally with you on the uh, limit on rent for, uh, in mobile homes. Um, so I, I, I did think Sue Prant had a really good point, though, about looking up the number of uh, uh, units in this area that are individually owned versus big um, apartments, because that's going to, um, you can't, you know, no one's going to be right, able to buy up the whole yeah. thing. But there, there um, are apartments in here. Yeah, so it might be good to just distinguish before, mm -hmm. like, there was some kind of ban. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, quickly, other things that we are clearly doing is we're finishing BC1, BC2, which we hope to have done, depending on how this... Middle of February. Come, yeah, January, February. Um, other you things... So, so uh, yeah, I was going to say that when I put out something on Hotline about a way I was thinking about it, one of the things about the moratorium was how to bring things out of it. So if we do one... What's the most expeditious way to pull things out of it? And so BC1 and BC2 is one of those things, right? Because if we get that done and the use table updated and a plan in place for future rezoning, I would think that based on what I had proposed, that that would be a trigger to bring it out, um, BC1 and BC2. And I feel similarly with most other things. I think we can get, especially if we put a no demolition of residential current residential and a rent cap on mobile homes, then we protect what we have. So we're not going to lose the residential we have, but we go through the other zone districts, look at the use tables and any zoning changes that might or might not need to happen in order for those to be good for like real infill in the industrial zones. So I think it's actually part of a work plan item that we already have in place, which is the use table review. And we're just going to maybe reorder the uh, zone districts that we do first, I had asked staff if it was possible to do the use tables in chunks, because I don't think there's any way that I could possibly digest one big push on all the use tables, because I'd rather have them sorted by similar things and look at them in smaller things. So uh, another thought was to reorder how we would do the use table project with an emphasis on what's in the zone district if a moratorium goes in place so we can bring them out more quickly. Um, and so for me, the structural thought here is that they, things can come out when the, the development review is done. Mm -hmm. And I would also propose that we start by exempting affordable housing, I'm uh, sorry, start by exempting housing projects which are not tearing down a project and a, an existing residential development and replacing it, but instead maybe they'd go into the BC1 or BC2 zones. So I personally don't want this moratorium, should it pass, to stop housing projects. And so I talked with some members of the community and I would ask staff to feedback on this. I had originally said if they put their affordable housing on site, right? But I don't feel that way anymore because I feel like small projects can't do that. And I don't want to stop small residential projects that aren't displacing or gentrifying. So I would propose that one of the exemptions that's important to me is residential projects under four acres aren't part of the moratorium. And if they're more than four acres, that they need to include their affordable housing on site. So that's just a proposal for council to discuss. But that's another of the, the program elements I've been thinking about. Can, can I just ask for yeah. clarification, Sam? When you define residential, I mean, we were just talking about BC1 about not allowing residential on the first floor in the BC1. So it wouldn't, but you would think not 100% residential, I'm assuming then, or pre predominantly, how would you define that? Well, I wouldn't require, if it's a mixed use project, 
I would want its affordable housing on a site bigger than four acres. I would want whatever its affordable housing, uh, sorry, wh whatever its affordable housing requirement based on the number of units that they're putting in in that mixed use project to be on site. Well, I'm, uh, my, my point was just that um, if you're going to exempt residential projects, which I think is a laudable goal, that you, I think you have to define residential as not 100% residential because we're not allowing that in some of these zones in this area. Right, so you'd have to define like it as predominantly residential or 75 or something like that. So which zones are you thinking about that we wouldn't know? Well, the BC1, BC2 that we were just talking right. about. Right, okay, so, so all I was, maybe I'll try one more time. If that is more than four acres, that um, development, then I wouldn't dictate that it be a certain amount of housing, but I would say whatever amount of housing does go in there, has to put its affordable component on site. Okay, but but you're exempting something from the moratorium, and and right, I mean it's the BC one and BC two zones, as an example, wouldn't be exempted until we get through this process. I thought you were creating a separate exemption for residential. Am yeah, that's what I'm proposing. So, but, but you're talking about it in BC one, BC two. So yeah, that's yeah, separate yeah, that 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 you let, it, you're, you're you're proposing an exemption that would start right away, or assuming the moratorium. Except went for through. not in BC one. Right, but um, so would you say that it would not include projects in BC one, BC two, because they'd have to go through the use table review, or? Yeah, that's correct. The BC uh -huh. one and BC two have a pending ordinance rule that would apply in any <laughs> case. So even if they weren't in the moratorium, the pending ordinance rule would stop any redevelopment from happening until February 13th. Is that correct, staff? It, it, any redevelopment would need to be consistent with that, with the pending ordinance. And, and so you're, you're imagining BC1, BC2 coming out as soon as that is I, done in February? I would very much hope that I we're hope. done with that by early February. Okay, thanks for clarifying. And I, I think, if I understand correctly, that we should tee this up so that <coughs> It really is a timeout till we get stuff in place, and as soon as we get mm -hmm. stuff in place, we release. Yep. Yes. Um, so that's, I think, the intent. Excuse me. Did yep. I see the mic? Uh, after Mary. Okay. Because uh, Mary's next. So um, thanks, Sam. I, I would uh, I would support that, and um, I just wanted to also add that in releasing areas from the moratorium, I think the goal it would be to look at what we're already working on. So in addition to the BC1, BC2, and the use tables, we're also um, on the current work plan is community benefit. So that would be another thing as it relates to site review criteria. And, and so that would probably um, affect some more releasing of areas. Um, and I would look to staff to see what that might, how that might work. Um, and then the other thing, things that I would like to see um, included in the moratorium would be to um, look at, um, uh, consider an appeal process. So that if there is um, a property in a zone or a project that um, really shouldn't, as Jill was saying, um, may not be taking any opportunity um, fund money or meets community values um, that that they're able to appeal and is completely local um, that we consider something um, an appeal process and I welcome more criteria for the appeal process. Okay. Um, I would really like us um, to, um, well as part of this appeal process to um, look at uh, to, uh, applying an equity assessment. Um, that was something that was included in the policy link um, article that I put out yesterday. And um, I know that, that staff is working on, on putting that in place and if we could put it in place for any projects that um, are coming forward in that area, I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, I would like us to consider also um, the formation of a public fund um, I did reach out to the Community Foundation today and see if there might be any interest. Um, I did not hear back from them, but um, that would be something that I would like to have explored so that um, local community members could actually invest in something that we could have a say in what 
um, that fund could invest in. Um, and um, included in something that we could look at, I would like, to, like us to consider looking at uh, mobile home park infrastructure as something that such a fund could invest in. Um, I would also, um, I, I just want to put out there also that if we want to consider higher affordable housing requirements for, um, for anything that redevelops in this area as a result of an opportunity fund to um, maybe look at the um, affordable housing analysis to see how that, um, how the fin financials would work out considering investment from an opportunity fund, if that might allow for a higher uh, percentage of affordable housing. Can I colloquy on that one sure. for a moment? <clears throat> so I, I think what um, we had discussed was going and dusting off the um, studies that were done when we added the 5% middle income housing. So we looked at <laughs> scenarios and cases and so on for that and, and used that as the baseline. So it's just adding in the opportunity zone to the ones that were done before. Does that make sense? Could I just ask a question? Are you assuming that these opportunity funds are going to say we're an opportunity fund? No, not at all. So, so these are scenarios in the abstract. So they're, they're representative three different scales of project. Mm -hmm. And looking, so we had to do some of that to decide, was it feasible to add the 5% middle income housing on? And so now we have another source of funds, you know, then we were looking at LIHTC funds, for instance, and this would now have opportunity zone funds. And so would it be possible, I think what Mary's saying is to be able to look if we were to want to require an additional 5% affordable housing in this opportunity zone, does that still pencil out for the developers? Within the district itself. Sorry, Mary. No, that's okay. Um, and um, and also, I, I guess as an example of um, something that could be considered under an appeal process were the um, um, Boulder Community Hospital, for example, as well as Ball yeah. and, and their renovations. So something um, that would consider those kinds of projects. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. So I was going to bring up the appeal process, which I think has to be very much so. I totally agree with Mary on that. Um, um, we are developing a prospectus, I assume, and so I'm hoping that we have a very clear prospectus in terms of what we want and what our pri the community's priorities are. Um, <clears throat> I read, and this is a question, I read in the materials, it looked like we had some of this opportunity zone is in county, is that, is that correct? Yeah, there's a, a small areas of enclaves that are within the census tract boundary. And could you just tell me how that how that would work? Uh, how they would participate in in this? So in those properties right now are subject to county zoning okay. and county development regulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, it. If you do any sort of moratorium or anything tonight, it wouldn't apply to those properties because they're not within um, city jurisdiction. Okay, that's great. Okay, um, I would like to um, prohibit um, construction or remodeling that is requiring a change of use. Wait, to any kind of change of use? Okay. Well, a significant change in use like retail to um, office that's gonna generate several hundred jobs. Well, okay, but that's a kind of use then. Do we want to define a kind of use? Well, I don't think, I mean, <clears throat> I think several of us have said that we need a lot more jobs like we need a lot more holes in the head. <laughs> and <laughs> we really don't. What we need is housing, housing for the middle income and housing for the lower income. And we need to have creative ventures coming forward like the hopper. Um, we need to retain companies like Ball Aerospace, who's been here since 1956, so I agree with I, you. I was just trying to, yeah. I'm writing down okay. what you're saying, but so you need to qualify. I, it, on office, I wanna, 
basically not want a lot, a large office, but I would be fine with some office uses because some small office, because as the gentleman from Ball pointed out, they're gonna need that as, as their experiments and their development at Ball um, changes with time. I'd also like, I think Mary said this, uh, to exempt BCH from this um, moratorium. They're not going after opportunity funds. They, the gentleman said they get their money from private equity funds and they're a 5013C and we are so lucky to have BCH in our midst. So I'll just leave that. Can I call a mm -hmm. second? I would, so the format I had proposed in my outline was a blanket with exemptions. Mm -hmm. And so the housing exemption I mentioned is one. I would exempt all nonprofits. Um, mm -hmm. because any 501c3 can't participate in this. And right. so I would go further. I think BCH is kind of the shining example, but I don't think the moratorium should apply to uh, any application coming in from a nonprofit. And I would agree with that. I would also like to address on housing that um, we make sure that whatever housing opportunities or that some of the housing opportunities um, preclude them being all rental and require some home ownership. And I think that's just, um, we got an email, I think today or yesterday, about how it's important for our young professionals to be able to um, buy. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you whenever I don't understand what you're talking about. Okay. So we're talking about ex <laughs> exemptions for the moratorium? No. Okay, so this is things you want to happen in the, uh, to incentivize in an to incentivize in the opportunity zone. Okay. Sorry, and um, I would just say, um, I, you know, I'm sorry there wasn't any process to get us, the whole community, to this opportunity zone. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I'm hoping is with this moratorium, we do have a robust um, public participation, and we get figured out what it is our priorities are. And um, I'll just, I think I'll leave it there. Um, Could I just call a quick on um, mm -hmm. one of the things that you said, you mentioned um, some office space would be okay. Mm -hmm. And I would um, say the same thing for medical and financial. So if mm -hmm. it's like a single, single one shop, one person mm -hmm. shop that's a financial planner, for instance, um, they shouldn't, they should, is this just for the moratorium? This is for the moratorium. So, so I, I would make a suggestion on that, which might be, we're gonna do a fair bit of that in the BC1, BC2 process, right? And that's a place where we will be able to talk about percentage of office, but I think we have to do that kind of within a zone district, perhaps, don't we? Well, and maybe maybe that's um, maybe that's direction for what we do it within the use table project and how we look at the use table. Mm -hmm. But so th the intersection I see there is if we're looking at certain zone districts and their use tables it, through that project and they happen to be in the opportunity zone because we've prioritized those first, that might be the appropriate place to do something. No, and I agree. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I do think t to a certain degree, hopefully this, like, this moratorium isn't around long if yeah, we adopt I, it so that rather than spending, all, uh, getting really detailed about all the different percentages in the moratorium. Let's get the moratorium done and put whatever vision we want in the regs, in the use table. Right, I want this moratorium to be as short as possible. And so I want staff to tell us how we can make it that way. So I have Mirabai and then Aaron. So uh, I'm mostly Mirabai gonna- Mirabai and gonna, then Aaron. Oh, sorry. sorry, I thought you, I apologize. Sorry. Yeah. See how it will so I'll just kind of add in my two cents here. Um, I would like to see the moratorium around for a very short amount of time as well, but I'd also like to see a robust um, community conversation about what we do and don't want, and uh, a lot of what John Taylor said about being creative and just working with our community to come up with some really inventive and fun ideas. I'll say that if we're gonna be doing a moratorium and we're committed to working on having this robust community conversation about what we do and don't want. I don't know about tonight at 1224 
coming up with a million exemptions right. to the moratorium, because that's the whole point of the moratorium is to pause, engage the community, and and then move forward, and so then hopefully releasing zones quickly. So I will just say that again, I I'm, I'm got kind of lost on Mary and Lisa in terms of what is part of the moratorium and what is not, but I'm saying, you know, I understand a few exemptions, I understand and I agree with Mary's idea of, what was that, the, an appeal. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but to continue a long conversation over exemptions is kind of defeating the purpose of the moratorium in my book. So um, I look forward to, you know, fixing this with the community and really engaging them and having a robust conversation. Can I ask a question to follow up? Would you support the nonprofit exemption and the housing exemption? I'm unsure at the moment. I mean, I, I love I love the concept. I don't want to affect either of those. I get concerned a little bit um, with some of the loopholes in terms of four acres and the fact that developers could split those acreage up into different parcels and thereby avoid the inclusionary housing on site. Um, I, so I'm a little on the fence at the moment. I, I'd like to, I guess I, I wanted to pause and understand more and, and see how many are coming in, what it's doing. It, it's too pinpointed right now. I'd like to see the 30,000 foot view of what we want for this general area. But again, I am open to it. Let me just say as a follow-up that housing, <laughs> as we heard over and over and over tonight, is so important that I would be willing to do some an exemption tonight that's set up a certain way and then have that be the first one that we take up in the public process so we could adjust if that's not right. Aaron. So, I mean, it, it sounds like there's a solid majority in favor of going forward with a moratorium, um, which I'm not in favor of. I won't make a big speech due to the lateness of the hour, but I just want to make a couple quick points while you, and then I'll let you all continue talking about this um, and do what you're going to do. But just the, in terms of the do no harm thing, that um, every, the harm involved here would be that every perfectly reasonable project that somebody was going to do anyway, that they're now not allowed to do for some period of time, is a harm to, to that person or that uh, group uh, whose plans are now um, delayed or postponed or canceled. And a lot of these things don't just happen to big investors, they happen to everyday people who have hopes and dreams and or trying to get something done um, for their small business or bigger business or what have you. So just keep in mind that this is not a an impactless thing to do. Um, I also worry because we do not have a great record recently of getting through moratoriums quickly. Uh, the height moratorium has been going on for four years and um, just recently got extended for a significant additional period. So, um, you know, you, you guys do what you're going to do, but please keep those things in mind. Can I ask you a question? Do you, what would be your preferred approach to make sure that we're ready for um, in investments in this opportunity zone and not getting a bunch more Class A office space? So um, I don't perceive this as an enormous emergency because we have no evidence that large sums of capital are coming to our town in a short period of time. So I feel like we have good projects on the work plan about the use tables, about the BC1, BC2. I'm really excited about the enabling more housing along 28th Street, which we have queued up for like a couple of years from now. More housing in industrial zones, which we have queued up for a little while from now. So I would get to work on the good planning projects that we already have on the to-do list, do them deliberately with good public engagement and get our best regs in place over time, taking the time that it needs, because I don't see an emergency here. Okay, Cindy. I am concerned with an infusion of money coming in, a big infusion of, of money coming in, and part of that is something that didn't even happen in this opportunity zone or close to it, and that was the Liquor Mart property being sold. It was bought three years ago for, was it $9 million, and just sold for 16 for student housing? I mean, that inflationary, this talk of displacement and gentrification is happening right under our noses. And people like Apple coming, all we need to do is look west and see someone in the audience talked about a refugee from the Bay Area. You know, there are many, many, many of them because of what has happened to the quality of life out there through this. 
So I think it is important to move on this now. And I, I however, think with Mirabai, I'm not thinking very clearly in terms of what it is we're going to be exempting and what it is we're going to be keeping and which things are included or not. I'd rather see us take that up quickly, but do it when we're uh, of a clearer mind. But I'm really very concerned about the concerns within the community about what is happening right here, right now. Okay. So I, I can count. So, the, so you can give your speech in a second unless you want to. Okay. I, uh, I, I, we're going to get, it sounds like there's there's momentum for an exemption. I'm sorry, for moratorium, um, but not a lot of appetite to talk a lot of detail. Sam start, has a pretty robust list. I say. We'll defer that. Yeah. Oh, well, we have to pass something tonight. No, no, no. What I, what I, I'm sorry, Zan. I meant this robust list. I would defer, but I would really still like to see something go some through in housing. Yeah, and in nonprofits. I'm Those handing you the uh, put something on the table here that you think is the key points, um, so we can. Oh well, I mean, I will propose a blanket moratorium um, in the opportunity zone with two major exemptions tonight: nonprofit, and then. Um, Housing below four acres is completely exempted. Housing above four acres that puts uh, its affordable housing on site is exempted. And then I think it's really important that we have uh, no demolition permits allowed on residential or mixed. Well, okay, we can say no, no demolition on anything. I would return to that later and say I think certain commercial um, demolitions would be okay provided that we're getting what we want in these exemptions so i'll just say it that way two exemptions um affordable uh, housing in the way i've described above and below four acres and nonprofits, which include the boulder community House. Caps. okay the appeal and the appeal process i think is critical as well that so, so the that appeal I, I just want you to no, the appeal process cannot be drafted tonight no uh, no no not at all okay. i would i would ask staff to propose an appeal process over the course of the next month or so so we can put something in place but we pass a moratorium can i just make a suggestion on just on it really i'll give my speech later isn't the appeal process simply this council modifying its own moratorium isn't that the way we would do it the, 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 some people the, come in here and say hey there's unintended consequences and we say oh gosh darn and we modify the moratorium isn't that the easiest thing that 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 approach would work mm -hmm. um, and I guess the one concern I would just like to express about an appeal process is that um, it appears that the planning department is their work program is going to be reprioritized and accelerated and then when you add a, an administrative appeal process then you you have to put additional resources to the appeal process. I, I, so I like your come, yeah. I, I like that. We're, we should be the ultimate appeal yeah. process on this anyway. We're creating this, so thank you, Bob. Okay. Can I ask if my colleagues would be willing to add one more exemption tonight? And I'm just going to go back, but there are there are going to be lots of properties by definition. So I'll just I'll take away my wish that people not using O funds would also be exempt. But just say properties by definition that can't. Like, so Ball, that's like an easy way of just exempting them right out of the gate. They've owned their building for a long time. If they made just a one unit improvement to it, it doesn't qualify for the amount of funds they would need to put in. So by definition, they just don't qualify for O funds. So they can go forward. B, 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 BCH would be very similar unless they were making an investment. nonprofit. Yes, okay, so that's that's a good point. Um, but others that we, you know, that, that we don't even know about would just, would be really similar. Um, the, it's just like, there are easy ones to, to see whether they they qualify by definition or not. So can we pause for a second? Is, do, is it as simple, a, is it obvious? No, it's not. It's not obvious, it's not simple. Oh. Um, I, I don't think that it's anything I could draft this evening. If you wanted to direct us to look at it and come back with something, we could probably do that. But um, that's that's not a simple um, drafting exercise. Okay, but uh, maybe let me ask it a different way. Do we think we know enough about opportunity zones so the definition of things, uh, 
projects which by definition wouldn't qualify. Is that a knowable thing? In that there's no monitoring or transparency? Because anyhow, I'm just trying to can, <clears throat> We can defer to the existing guidance that we've received and the definitions that are in the draft documents provided by the IRS. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I mean, we do I anticipate think this is one that from my perspective we could return to Jill and flesh out because I think there's there's some some points to that and mm -hmm. I just don't know how to do that right mm -hmm. now and ball is a good example like mm -hmm. how could we use that as a way to kind of figure out the bucket of of entities I mean it's not it's like probably the chamber can't take opportunities on money right for example I don't know there are 501 C <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I agree with the sentiment. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure we can get it done tonight. Okay, no problem. Well, uh, how about um, as things become clearer? I mean, that's yeah. that's something that can happen as things become clearer. Right now, I don't think we have enough information. I just have a question on, on the scope of your proposal, Sam. Are, um, the staff had uh, three or four physical carve-outs, Diagonal Plaza, TVAP one, you're not including T those. TVAP. I would include, so I, I, I just, completely just agree. Trying to help Thank clarification. You. Thank yeah. you. Okay, um, but no, I feel like Diagonal Plaza just needs to go through the BC one and two process, and it will come out the other side in February, ready to go. I don't think we're going to be delaying anything there. So, does it? People agree? Oh, we, it yeah. doesn't need to be exempted because it's under the pending. I just put it's under pending ordinance. Okay, and so. <laughs> Okay, so we're getting somewhere, we're close, so at, we're adding TVAP. As an exemption, yeah, I believe it's well planned and almost Phase done. one. Phase one, yeah. Phase one of TVAP. Was there anything else on their list? So I just, we're not going to do it in the moratorium tonight, but as part of the moratorium, I want to make sure we do address rental caps right. on the mobile home properties. So. It's not part of the moratorium. We're putting those under the moratorium, so I assume nothing can change at this point. Yep. But I do want to look at the rental caps on mobile home parks. Yep, and that's on the work plan. Right, and cars. I know, and it's coming to us in January or February, but I just am nervous about it, it our residents. And Lisa, protections. Yep. just to clarify really quick, under the moratorium, it would still allow mobile home replacements. People would still be able to replace or or right. Um, and and I have no problem with that. Homes. What I'm concerned about is a large investor coming in, like what just happened um, a year or two ago at Orchard Grove, and the uh, um, residents' income went or uh, rent went up significantly for them. Okay. Uh, does this include no demolitions? I didn't yes. quite. Yeah. Yeah. On, I, of anything? Well, of anything. So, so I would say for now, of anything, but I would say just like looking at reviewing the housing, I would also like to review, because I think for me, one of the important parts of the no demolition is for housing. Uh, and then we can look at other uses. There's others that I think should be allowed potentially for small businesses, right? Where they're trying to expand their space and they might do a demo. Right. But. By starting the moratorium with a complete ban on all demolition, then we can pull it back as we feel comfortable yep. and yep. the community has had an opportunity to discuss. I agree with that. <coughs> um, unless you already have your permit and all that, right? Yeah, if you, right. If you've got your permit in hand, uh, you're grandfathered, right, David? You That's correct. Or if you've applied, you can continue to process your application based on the regulations in effect at the time you apply. Okay, so we're gonna pass something tonight. We'll go, we'll go over this again. We're gonna be dealing with BC1, BC2 in January, finish in February. Are we proposing to revisit the nature of the moratorium again in January to fine tune it? I, I think it, we're gonna have a study session <laughs> January 8th, and then we're gonna have a retreat. And I would think both of those would be opportunities to bring up the subjects that we wanted to, like if there's certain exemptions that people want to socialize to the community. Jill's suggestion, for example, could be talked about at the two study session type meetings in January. 
I'm not saying we go into this length. I'm saying that that's an opportunity right. I, for I, us to digest it and have the holidays. But we won't be making any decisions then. So no, I would I would look to staff to come back during this moratorium and <clears throat> let us know what they think is a um, robust public process so that we do get the input um, like Jill is giving, um, that there may be exemptions that we very well want to have in this opportunity zone. But I want to hear from the community what those are. Okay, there's two parts to this. One is to fine tune the moratorium, and the other is there's another suite of things that we talked about, which is, hey, should we see if we can create a community fund. Hey, do we want to do a perspective for key areas about what we do want? Um, and with these things about, you know, do we want to increase the affordable housing requirement in the zone, mm -hmm. rental caps? That can, so there, there's the creative side to these two. So mm -hmm. just CAC is going to have to figure out when to schedule this to actually do the work on the positive side of it as, long, as well as fine-tune more terms. And we're going to forget all this because we're going to go on holiday for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, to the list of creative things, yep. I'm going to add just one more yep. thing. Um, and that was something that was also in that policy link list, which was to um, monitor um, outcomes. And, um, monitor just outcomes? Monitor and report outcomes. Oh. Um, yeah. And that was, that was like number four in that policy link under cities. Okay, do I need to repeat where I think we're at? Would that be helpful? Do you got it? So I think um, whenever you're ready to put a motion on the table, um, I would like to just run through language I've been trying to draft as you guys have been going along and I can share the language with you and that can be incorporated into your motion if that works. So just okay. one thing, Sam, if you can clarify, you spoke of a, a blanket moratorium. Can you be specific on what? What the moratorium is on is it net new square footage is it it's is it as as staff had put it out without the categories so it's um building permit site plan review what was the third one david that um use reviews use, use review that result in net new square footage so they i don't think had written it as net new but as oh well it new. should be new square footage that's right because david said it's not allowed to Demo and we're stopping demos anyway to demo a building and replace it with the same. Right. Square but it but it would be new, so this would not cover renovations, right? No, it doesn't cover renovations. Right. Those anything interior to the walls of the building isn't covered. Okay. So so I would think yeah. we really want to see David's language. Yeah. First. Can you put it up there? Yeah. Can we look at your language and go through yep. it? Because then we can just if we like it and modify it, we can move. <laughs> okay so just based on the what i just listened to um, the standard would be the creation or conversion of space from a different land use of any non-residential floor, I guess I can get rid of that conversion. You guys are not going to do, you guys don't want to do um, interior finishes and changes of use? I think we should do that later. Okay. If we're going to do the uses, we should do it, you know, with the input from the community. Yeah. Okay, and um, yeah, so it would be new non-residential floor area. Any demolition that rem that results in the removal of any, and it could be multifamily residential dwelling unit, or um, it could just be residential dwelling unit if you want it to apply to single family. I don't think there are single. Yeah, there are single family houses in this this zone. I don't want them bulldozed, um, and I would like to keep it to all demolitions at this point until we get some input from um, the community. So uh, the, any demolition. All right. 
I mean, it's one thing if people are doing a, a little thing on their building, a tiny thing, but a building demolition is what I'm talking about. Yep. So I will delete multifamily. Yeah. And, and then, or. Just. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, delete any demolition, residential. Any, any and, then it, and then, or any non-residential floor area. So basically, we would put a hold on demolition permits. Mm -hmm. Yes. No demolition That's permits so given. Um, So like if a homeowner is planning on building a new home, we're saying you can't because you're in an opportunity zone? That's the one thing I would do. It doesn't make any sense. I don't think Kings Ridge, for instance, is well, the King place that we want to do this. But Kings Ridge is, has a site review. Mm -hmm. So Kings Ridge isn't going to be covered by this based on other provisions. In but, but do we know every neighborhood and it's covered for sure? I mean, I mean, we know single family homes are not eligible for opportunity zone funds, right? Like we know that. Sure. That's right. a good point. I know there's a lot. I no, had no. That's a good yeah. point. That's a very good point. Okay. So put multifamily back in. Multifamily, residential, or commercial. Yep. I just have a non-residential. Okay. Yeah, that's Which is a, that covers everything in our use charts. Okay. Um, and then I will leave the um, or the creation of. Uh, new dwelling units in because there's a specific exemption under the specific exemption section. But why do we write it that way? It, it misleads people until they get to the part that says, oh, but it doesn't include it. <laughs> well, so that exemption section is going to grow and grow. Well, I yeah. know, but it says, it specifically says we're going to. It, it is a very safe regulatory I method. Know. Okay. It's just so Can misleading. we go look at that now, um, that exemption? Because there's, you did the more than four acres. Yeah, so in terms of exemptions. That is less than, okay, great. Yeah, I, I added four acres with the requirement for on-site, and then it exempts anything that is under four acres um, from the moratorium. Uh, so I struck the diagonal plaza provision. Um, because for reasons we've already stated. Yep. Yeah, okay. I don't think we... Uh, D was one that I drafted based on Sam's email previously, but I don't think we need it based on how the other section is drafted. I think the nonprofits is maybe where you put here. Yeah, or, yeah I'm getting to that one. Okay, great. Um, for the nonprofit one, um, D. I, I, yeah, is now the new D, and it's the construction of any building or conversion of floor area owned by a community serving Colorado nonprofit corporation. Is that? Yeah, that's okay. what I read. They have to own it, right? Um, and then I don't think you guys got to this one. Um, I, that was just me drafting, anticipating where you guys might go. So I'm going to delete that one. Okay. And that's it. So. Is TVAP out of there? Yeah. No, TVAP stays in. That's based on my I understanding meant it's of your exempted. It's exempted. exempted. Yeah. Exempted. yeah, yeah, it's exempted. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, diagonal plaza no longer will have an exemption. So I will move the ordinance as proposed by David. Second. Speak to it. Okay. Well, this is a very unfortunate situation. Uh, it it was a situation that came about with a rushed decision and has long consequences that we cannot reverse. I would invite staff to find out if some of the suggestions that we've heard from tonight are possible about getting out of this, um, because if we got out of it, we could just lift everything and be back to where we started. But if we cannot, we need to go forward with this. We heard plenty of concerns about uh, how we know that our use tables aren't exactly right right now because we're in a project to fix them up so that we're getting what we want. And we're looking at BC1 and BC2 because, you know, we haven't aligned the current use and zoning with what passed in the comp plan and with what the intention of the community is. This additional financial incentive for people to develop um, is something that we need to shape. And so that's why I'm proposing it. I do regret any disruption it causes, and we will make sure to hear people out who have trouble 
um, and we are going to be working pretty quickly to come up with additional exemptions to this and bring the BC1 and BC2 out. So thanks to everyone who came out and testified tonight, and we will make the best of the situation that we can. And then I know some people want to give speeches. I guess the other piece of this is to direct staff to come back to us about some public process around um, the opportunities that we would like to take advantage of that might present themselves with this opportunity zone process, like what do we want to see in Diagonal Plaza? So I guess help us shape what that could look like as well to go in parallel. Okay. Speeches. Yeah, I didn't write anything down, but it's going to be exactly the opposite of what Sam just said. Mm. Um, I actually would like to thank staff for taking this opportunity. This is simply a new funding mechanism, and there's a bunch of different funding mechanisms already out there, and now there's a new one in this zone. And you know, no one has to take it. Big corporations like Macy's and Ball don't intend to take it, but small ones like the Hopper are really going to benefit from it. I was on the phone last night with a friend of mine who runs a business in town who's looking for, for new equity, and they've kind of run out of equity investors locally, and I said, gosh, it would be so amazing if, you, if your office was in our opportunity zone, because then your business would qualify for an equity investment, and there's these new funds. And it, she was like, no way, really? That's, that's happening here? Yeah, and I, I think that's a great thing. Um, I thought the speaker, Mark, I, I think who's still here, um, really nailed it when he you know, compared it to LIHTC. We don't freak out that wealthy people get you know, tax credits um, that help with housing. This doesn't seem that different. Um, when you also start looking at this as an investor, no one, no one's moving quickly. Yes, funds are being set up, but you want to you want to have the underlying asset identified, and it has to be really ready to roll because they've got that thirty month time period to invest that cash. So to call this an emergency, I, as a member of the public, I I lose a little faith in in my city council today to to say that this is an emergency. Um, I, I I simply don't think that's true. So. Um, Thank you. I, I think it's unfortunate that we're we're doing this. You know, like like it has been read many times up on stage. Act with urgency is one of the things they say. That's act with urgency to put the projects forward that you want to have forward because there's there's a reason to get funding. Um, so I, I think it's an incredibly unfortunate thing, and I think it's 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 a terrible way to govern. Um, and uh, I really appreciate what you did, staff. Okay, here's my speech. Um, I think with this moratorium, we just turned an opportunity zone into an opportunity-free zone. Um, the unintended consequences are, are mind-boggling, I think. Um, there's so many unknown unknowns, I don't know what to start. But let's talk about some, some known ones. And this moratorium is, is just super indiscriminate, um, and even tonight, we're, we're, we're kind of randomly picking winners and losers. Um, the hospital's impacted, Ball Aerospace is impacted, 29th Street, our largest um, source of tax sales is impacted, small business is impacted, housing contributors to our, um, our uh, uh, inclusionary housing fund, Diagonal Plaza, the very thing that I think we're trying to, we're trying to support here. Um, so it's, it's troubling that, that we're, um, and I, I know I'm not faulting the process because you guys are trying to do this on the fly and, and that's just where we are, but, uh, and we're going to have to do a lot of fixing it sounds like. Um, like Jill, I really don't understand the emergency either. The Opportunity Zone was designated in March, and there may have been flaws in how that was created, um, but I don't understand why in December we have to do a quick moratorium on a few days' notice. Um, some say that Macy's um, would be, the Macy's application that was filed yesterday would be an, ex as an example of why we have to act, act quickly, but I would remind folks that even the Macy's application is a site review, and we still have authority. Um, and as Sam reminded us several times tonight, um, there's a comp plan out there that gives us a lot of um, uh, reasons to um, consider that uh, site review application. So the Opportunity Zone doesn't affect our ability to, to control land use. Um, in the ordinance itself, it recites um, some emergencies. Um, I think we're stretching a little bit. It says that uh, there's an emergency here because we need to preserve 
public, and this is quotes, public peace, health, and property, and we have an emergency to protect health, safety, and welfare of our residents. And I guess I just don't see that. Um, no one here is in danger, no one's gonna die. Um, I think the biggest risk is that um, an investment will be made that otherwise wouldn't be made. But as has already been observed, we already have um, several um, uh, investment attracting uh, tax credits like the uh, low income housing tax credit, which we all love, and the new market tax credit, which Lisa mentioned. So um, I certainly agree that we need to fix our use tables. I mean, I think that's, I think we all come together on that and recognize that we need to make some adjustments to our use tables so that we get the types of developments we want. But I, um, and I want to do that very, very quickly. Um, but I just don't s see how this moratorium is going to make that job any easier. Um, if anything, we're going to spend now a fair amount of time, I, th I think, over the next few weeks and few months correcting what we're doing on the fly tonight. So, I, again, I, I think I'm, a, I'm afraid that we um, have created an opportunity free zone, and then we're going to spend the next uh, 18 months undoing that. Aaron. Yeah, just a little bit more I said most of to say before, but just the, you know, the BC1, BC2 thing was brought up uh, as an emergency a few months ago. and. This is coming up in an emergency. In the meantime, we have all of these regulations that are in place that I think work for us fairly well, but we want to make them better, and we have a number of projects teed up to make them better, and those projects keep proceeding further towards the horizon. And I would just so much rather be up here doing the good work that we've had teed up in our work plan instead of finishing up at 1 o'clock on emergency things that I don't think are actually emergencies. Okay, anyone else? Okay, the only thing I will say that I am ho hopeful about is we do have a robust work plan around those items, Aaron, I agree. And um, we better rest over the holidays because we got a lot of work to do in 2019 so we can get on with that. Um, so, I guess we need to vote on this. It's a roll call vote. Council Member Grano? Nay. Jones? Aye. Morzell? Yes. Nagel? Yes. Weaver? Aye. Yates? No. Young? Yes. Rocket? No. Carlisle? Yes. The motion passes six to three. <clears throat> okay. Um, we have one more thing on our item. I'm on our agenda. Your last item is to appoint a council subcommittee to work on the library financial polling questions. Okay. We need two people to help on the poll. How about the two people at the end there? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody disagree with that? Oops. Okay. Um, any, anything on process before we <laughs> say happy holidays I, to I everybody? just want to say thank you to everyone for doing this in a calm tone and, and, you know, trying to work through it. So I know some people are disappointed, but I appreciate you sticking with it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And with that, happy holidays, everybody. We're adjourned. Holidays. Happy holidays. Are you here for Christmas? Yes, You're welcome. Thank you. Live from Paris on France 24. And later, they become victims of human trafficking in China.